Cantor Audio, a division of Recorded Books, presents Masquerading with the Billionaire by Alexia Adams Narrated by Lucy Rivers Chapter 1 The sliding doors at the arrivals area of London City Airport whooshed open, and Wolf automatically glanced up. Bloody hell! Even if Cat Smith didn't arrive tonight... His time hadn't been wasted. The woman who strode through the doors made every second of his 45-minute wait worth it. Her generous curves were outlined in a dark dress, the skirt of which came discreetly to her knees, her black gloves reflecting the elegance of a bygone era. She glided across the floor on four-inch stiletto heels, and his mind pictured her sauntering toward him wearing nothing but her footwear. He flashed his best smile at her. Maybe they could enjoy a drink at a nearby pub. He'd pay someone to stand here and wait for the cybersecurity expert he'd hired to arrive. They could call him when she showed up. And in the meantime, he could get to know this gorgeous woman. His smile was answered with one of her own. She wore little or no makeup, which only emphasized her dark eyes and high cheekbones. Her short, jet-black hair grazed a strong jawline, and he could already imagine trailing kisses along it till he reached her full lips. She stopped in front of him, while he gawked at her beauty. Good evening, Mr. Wolf. I'm Cat Smith. Sorry for the delay. I have one of those faces that always gets pulled over in customs. It wasn't her face that got her flagged for further scrutiny, and her voice was as sexy as the rest of her. She lifted her laptop case to her left hand and held out her right. He shook it while trying to restart his brain. You look nothing like your photo, he blurted out. An online search of Cat Smiths, who were from San Francisco and worked in the IT industry, had netted him one photo of a woman in her mid-forties with plain brown hair and bottle-bottom thick glasses, posing with six cats. Wolf had run into an old schoolmate, Simon Lamont, at Heathrow on Monday and confided his need for a discreet computer securities expert to uncover the person embedding malicious code in his company's systems. Within hours, his friend had come through. But aside from the name Cat Smith and an estimated time of arrival, Simon hadn't provided any additional details. Amusement gleamed in her eyes. Were they black, like her hair, or really dark brown? What would they look like glazed over with passion? Really? What photo? He showed her his phone while his eyes perused the up-close version of her. Not a single piece of jewelry adorned her, not even a watch on her slender wrist. She tucked her hair behind her ear, and he was drawn to the perfection of her lobes. He could imagine her draped in diamonds, no, sapphires, and nothing else. Well, maybe the stilettos could stay. The hair she'd pushed behind her ear flopped down to caress her jaw again as she shook her head in disgust. Where did you get this picture? Off the internet. My assistant found it for me. Sorry, obviously a mistake, but it was the only cat smith in San Francisco she could find. I'm going to kill David next time I see him. Who's David? David Wilson. His sister is married to your friend Simon. David is always playing jokes like this, putting up social media profiles of me using bad photos. I thought I caught them all in my last sweep. She handed back the phone and their hands touched. Would you like some proof of my identity? I could show you my passport, or better yet, hack into something for you. Her eyes widened, daring him to accept her challenge. He slipped his mobile into his jacket pocket, glad he'd removed his tie earlier, he needed his airway unrestricted. No need. I'll call Simon later and confirm your description. She leaned a little closer, and he caught a whiff of her perfume, subtle and exotic, with a hint of spice. I'd love to hear how you describe me to him. Not going to happen. You haven't asked me for identification. How did you know I'm Remington Wolf? You do look exactly like your photos. There's very little I don't know about you, Mr. Wolf. It was a long flight. The hairs on the back of his neck stood on end. You researched me for the whole ten hours. Of course. It was a fascinating read. Do people really just call you Wolf? Yes. 
kind of like some Brazilian football player. You only have one name? Although, if I were you, I'd use both your first and middle names together. Her laugh did wicked things to his blood pressure. Damn, she was good. He'd had his middle name stricken from every record except his birth certificate. Weren't those supposed to be confidential? She put a hand on his arm and heat shot into his brain, frying several neurons. Will you tell me the story behind it? I don't think so. His frosty tone did nothing to quell the smile in her eyes. We'll see. I'm sure I'll be able to get the information out of you somehow. Now, are we to stand here all night, or are you going to show me your equipment? Cat clutched her back tighter. Boje moi. The man was seriously hot. She kept his photo up on the corner of her screen while she investigated his background, hoping that by the time she met him in person, she'd be immune, or at least able to pretend she was. If she didn't get into his code soon, she'd be in deep trouble. Pretending to be American was damn hard, especially when sleep-deprived. Throw a young George Clooney look-alike into the mix, and her five years in this disguise would evaporate quicker than a drop of water on mercury. Wolf's gray eyes slid over her once more, setting off unnerving tingles all over. A lock of his dark brown hair fell over his forehead, and he pushed it back. The touch of silver at his temples and scattered through his end-of-day stubble made him look feral rather than mature. Wolf was an appropriate name for him. May I take your bag? His deep voice and sexy British accent slid over her like a caress. She moved her roller suitcase between them, but didn't release her laptop bag. No one touched her computer. I haven't booked into a hotel. Is there one near your office you can recommend? There's a Shangri-La hotel in my building. My flat is above, and my office is below. Convenient. It would make things quicker if she didn't need to commute. Pulling her suitcase behind him, he led her to the parking lot and opened the door to a sleek sports car. After putting her bag in the trunk, he settled next to her. Barely a foot separated them, and she had to suppress a shiver. Exhaustion. That had to be why she was so rattled. Leah Manning, for whom she often did freelance work, had called asking her to take this job at 3 a.m. San Francisco time, just as she was finishing up a project. As it was urgent and expense was no issue... She'd immediately hopped on his private jet and then spent the entire flight investigating the man beside her and his business. She couldn't remember the last time she'd slept. To keep her focus, she forced her mind to the task at hand and away from the movement of muscles in Wolf's thigh as he changed gears or the way his hand caressed the shifter. I understand discretion is of the utmost importance to you. I will need full access to your systems from the inside. Have you come up with a suitable position you want me to pretend to fill? No, I was waiting to discover what your talents are. He glanced at her again, and the back of her thighs tingled. I have all sorts of talents, Mr. Wolf, but those that may interest you are centered around computers. However, I can also plan events. Do you have a store opening or a special collection to launch in the near future? Neither. The only position I have available is in accounting. Since all the cock-ups began with unpaid invoices, I've insisted that everything be manually checked as well as entered into the computer. I need my systems up and running properly, as soon as possible. Can you tell me exactly what has been happening with your computer systems, and why you believe someone is embedding malicious code in your software programs? Up until two months ago, everything was running perfectly. Now invoices are being dropped from the payment schedule, on a completely random basis, and odd things are happening with my and my secretary's emails. Some messages show as read before we even open them. We've changed our passwords, and I've had the entire system checked for viruses, malware, and bots. But all the tests have come up clear. According to an industry expert I consulted, the most likely cause of the problem is that someone has rewritten or added to the code for the accounting program. I was told that you are a specialist in finding these types of things. I am. How many people know you've been sabotaged? Two. My assistant and my chief operating officer. Margaret Mary O'Shaughnessy and Harry Coates? Yes. He flashed for another look, his lips tight this time. And you trust them? They've been with me from day one. If they wanted to destroy my company, they would have done it before now. 
odd, how he hadn't said he trusted them. In her experience, it was those who were the closest who often stabbed you the hardest. And do they both know I'm coming to find the bad code? Only Margaret Mary. She's my right hand, and I trust her with my life. Well, at least that was something. As his assistant was fifty and had been married for twenty-five years, there probably wasn't a personal relationship there. So, accounting. Not my ideal position, but I guess it's doable. She took a deep breath. As I don't have a UK work visa, though, your HR department might figure out that something's up. The other option would be for me to pretend to be your girlfriend. She winced as his foot slid off the clutch mid-shift and the car protested his attempted gear change. What makes you think I don't already have a girlfriend? I don't double-dabble. She laughed, and he white-knuckled the gear shift. Bonus points for the computer term. Have you been studying? A little, but I realized I was out of my depth and had to call in an expert. The look he sent her this time implied he still doubted her credentials. He'd soon see that she knew her stuff. It probably wasn't fair that she knew so much about him when, as shown by the fake cat lady photo, he knew nothing about her. I'm an expert. For example, I know that unless you've switched to more discreet female companionship, your last intimate relationship ended five weeks ago. She claimed you were, and I quote, emotionally unavailable. But judging by the number of photos on Instagram of her kissing her dog, I assume you got tired of your girlfriend tasting like shih tzu. His laugh filled the car and drew an answering smile from her. You're not wrong. But how did you know I broke up with her? Maybe she shattered my heart. Because shortly after your name stopped appearing in her social media feeds, she was suddenly sporting an expensive-looking tennis bracelet. I doubt men who get their heart shattered give their exes breakup jewelry. He shrugged, but his face was still lit by a smile. I write it off as a marketing expense. I bet you have a whole line of relationship termination pieces. True. I call it the ejection collection. Makes me a fortune. Well, rest assured, I won't be demanding any rocks if we go the fake girlfriend routine. Smacks of payment for services rendered to me. That elicited a raised eyebrow. Will services be rendered? This is sounding like the better option. Only my cyber security services, for which you will receive an invoice. Payment will be expected promptly in U.S. dollars by wire transfer. Perhaps I should work in your accounting department. At least then I can guarantee you'll pony up. You'll be paid. Her stomach rumbled loud enough for him to hear. Can I get an advance? I didn't have a chance to get any British pounds, and I'm starving. Can we stop at one of those kebab shops you keep passing? Come to think of it, she couldn't remember the last time she ate, either. Sugar-free chewing gum only lasted so long. There's a five-star restaurant at the hotel, or you can get room service. Yeah, but I'd kill for a kebab. I haven't had one since the last time I was in London. He pulled over, grimacing as a double-decker bus whizzed by only inches from his car. When was that? Five years ago. When she'd managed to escape Russia with nothing but a hand-built laptop and a determination to turn her life around. She owed a lot of her success to Leah Manning, which is why she'd taken this job. All he'd had to say was, do me a favor, and she'd been in. Now she hoped it hadn't been a rash decision that would cost her everything she'd gained. The takeout restaurant wasn't busy on a Wednesday night. She glanced at the three other customers, all early twenties males wearing hoodies and their pants hanging halfway down their asses. She'd already done a threat assessment and decided she could probably outrun them in her four-inch Jimmy Choo's. You're a bit overdressed for a kebab shop at midnight, Wolf said as they waited for their diners. Nonsense. I'm sure the opera crowd are all over this place after the fat lady is finished. She took her paper-wrapped dinner from the man behind the counter and sat at the lone small round table in the corner before removing her gloves. I hear you don't like people eating in your car she said, noting Wolf's raised eyebrows. He sat across from her, his long legs extending past her chair. 
his body language broadcast loudly that she was with him. You shouldn't believe everything you read about me on the Internet. Oh, don't worry. I completely dismissed the story about you, the Cirque du Soleil performer, and the vat of vanilla pudding. He laughed again, and a puzzling tingle invaded her chest. She pulled in a deep breath to relieve the sensation. Next time she'd skip the hot sauce on her kebab. It was clearly playing havoc with her digestive system. It was chocolate mousse. The media never gets the details right. She devoured her dinner while Wolf ate his more sedately, his gaze rarely leaving her face, his expression unreadable. She wasn't sure where she stood with him. It would be way better to pretend to work in his accounts department. The girlfriend thing, while it gave her greater freedom, was likely to blow up in her face. As she wiped her mouth on the cheap paper napkin, he stood, tossing the remainder of his kebab away. You're right, he said. You won't blend in with my accounting team. Why, don't they eat dinners at midnight? She pulled her gloves back on and threw the paper wrapping from her dinner in the garbage. Not while looking like you do. She ignored that comment, more intrigued by the gleam in his eye. So, just like that, I'm your girlfriend? Aren't you going to try and romance me or something? If she had to fake being his girlfriend, she'd better get in some flirting practice. It had been a while since her last relationship, like I can't remember what an orgasm is long ago. He reached out and wiped a spot of sauce off her cheek with his thumb, then popped it in his mouth. She'd obviously gone beyond exhaustion and was now hallucinating, because she felt as though she'd just been kissed. She drew in a ragged breath. I think I'd better stick with accounting. Too late now, darling. He put his arm around her waist and led her out of the tiny shop. I guess if I'm pretending to be your girlfriend, my first job in the morning will be to visit a pet store and get a small dog. She said a few minutes later as he drove. Don't you dare. She laughed, and he missed another gear change. His mechanic must be on retainer. Relax, I'm a cat, remember? Dogs aren't my thing. His eyes caressed her once more. The heat in them when they reached her face made her shiver. What about wolves? Wolf sipped a whiskey and stared out the window at the London skyline. It was after 1 a.m., but he couldn't sleep. Cat was ten floors below, probably tucked up in bed. She looked exhausted and had started swaying by the time he'd checked her into the hotel. After seeing her safely to her room, he'd retreated with a promise to meet her at lunch tomorrow to start the charade. Cat pretending to be his girlfriend offered him a chance to observe her actions closely. She wouldn't have access to his systems unless he was with her. Ever since Paulina, he was extra wary about letting anyone too close to vital information. At least keeping Cat nearby would be no hardship. She was entertaining and undeniably beautiful. The next few days might be more pleasant than he first imagined. So why did his gut tell him this was one of the worst ideas he'd ever had? He usually made a decision and dealt with the consequences. Second thoughts were for losers. His phone rang, pulling him from his uncharacteristic unease. Simon Lamont. Good thing his former classmate was halfway around the world, or Wolf would have had him in a headlock for not warning him about his new cybersecurity expert. I take it from your message that Katz arrived? Simon began without greeting. You could have told me she was wood-inducing gorgeous, Wolf replied. Well, I didn't notice. I've only got eyes for Helen now. Bollocks, you're married, not dead. What's her story anyway? It irked the hell out of him that Kat seemed to know everything about him, while she was a complete mystery. Being in the dark was no fun, unless both parties were naked. Don't know. Why? What's the problem? She doesn't look like a computer whiz. Liam only hires the best, so I can guarantee that she's an expert. You of all people should know looks are deceiving. His hand fisted automatically. Didn't he know it? Perfect-looking families rarely were. Yeah, well, I'll be able to keep a close eye on her because she's going to pretend to be my girlfriend while working undercover. Simon whistled. Good luck with that, mate. 
She doesn't seem your usual type. That woman has a brain. How do you know my usual type? Simon and Wolf had been at boarding school together, but unlike Simon, Wolf hadn't carried on to university. Instead, he'd traveled the world and learned his trade from the ground up. Helen loves trashy celebrity mags, and you feature quite prominently in them, usually with a blonde on your arm. Well, this is only temporary. Cat thinks she can have the bad code cleared and the source tracked within a week. Again, Simon laughed. A week? Ha. Huh. Take it from me, a lot can happen in a short time. I went from a man intent on buying up a company to blissfully married for life. Speaking of which, it's five o'clock. Time to wrap up and get home to my wife. Five o'clock. You part-time now? Ha ha. I'll call you next week and see how your work schedule is holding up, Simon said. You do that. As Wolf ended the call, he glanced again at the skyline. But all he saw were Cat's eyes lit with laughter. Heat radiated throughout his body. He really should get to bed. He had several meetings tomorrow, and he still hadn't finalized a design for the competition to obtain the royal commission from Crown Prince Ajmani of the United Arab Emirates. He tried several prototypes, but none of them seemed special enough. The recently crowned prince wasn't interested in competing for the world's tallest building or most original architecture. He was moving the Arab royal rivalry to gemstones. One jewelry designer would have the opportunity to set his family's entire gem collection, which would then be put on display in a specially built center. The exhibition plans Wolf had seen would make the Tower of London's display of the UK crown jewels look like baubles in a high street jewelry store. In addition, after a year, a rotating selection of pieces would go on a global tour lasting five years with the designer's name prominently featured. When Wolf got the job to set the gemstones, no one would forget him ever again. As he put his now empty glass on the side table, his eyes landed on his sketchbook, buried under several volumes on gem mining. He'd been using a computer to design for so long, he'd missed the feel of pencils as he drew and shaded. Grabbing the pad and colors, he flopped onto the sofa and closed his eyes for a minute, imagining the jewels he'd put on Cat. The next thing he knew, it was 3 a.m., and he had four collections of earrings, necklaces, bracelets, and even a tiara, although he was pretty sure Cat would turn her nose up at the thought of wearing a crown. He could barely wait to get to the office tomorrow and select gems for the potential settings. Worse was the anticipation of his lunch date with Cat. He was going to need more than just Simon's luck to get him through the week. Chapter 2 Cat juggled her laptop, lunch for two in a plastic bag, and a cardboard tray with three coffees as she tried to press the elevator button to take her to the 21st floor. May I help you? A suave man wearing an exquisitely cut suit asked. She glanced up to see the chief operating officer of Wolf's company next to her. His blonde hair was swept back off his forehead, a dimple in his right cheek as he smiled. His blue eyes hadn't seemed that beady in the photos she'd seen of him. Or maybe it was because he was looking at her like he hadn't eaten in days, and she was a filet mignon. Can you press the button for the 21st floor, please? She pretended not to know who he was. What a coincidence. I'm headed there as well. Can I hope you're the new temp in our accounting department? His leer dropped a notch, but was still evident. I'm Harry Coates, the COO of Wolf PLC. Pleased to meet you. I'd shake your hand, but... Yeah, let me help you, he said, and tried to take her laptop bag. Not in this lifetime. It's okay. I've got it all balanced. If you take something, I'm likely to drop the whole lot. I'm Cat, and I'm not a temp. I'm here to see my boyfriend. He took a step back. Your boyfriend? She could almost see his brain running through the HR roster, trying to figure out which unattached male she could be on her way to see. She faked a girly giggle. Well, I'm not sure if I can call him that yet. 
We met a couple weeks back in Vancouver. I'm visiting London for a few days and thought I'd look him up. His name is Remington Wolf. Your Wolf's girlfriend? His eyes widened and he retreated another foot. Thank God she and Wolf had sorted out their backstory last night on their way from the kebab shop to the hotel. Oh, you know him? She upped the amps on her smile. Yes, for a long time. I'm surprised he hasn't mentioned you. Damn, was this the longest elevator ride ever, or what? Two more floors. As I said, we barely had twenty-four hours together in Vancouver. He'd probably forgotten all about me until I called him last night, asking if he'd like to meet for lunch. I doubt he forgot you. You're not a woman who's easy to forget. The irony of his statement startled the laugh out of her. She'd spent eight years ghosting in and out of people's lives, trying her best to be invisible. Finally, she could be herself, well, her reinvented self, and here she was playing a part again. Thanks, I think. The elevator door slid open, revealing plush navy blue carpet and a bright reception area. A few pieces of abstract art decorated the walls, and a display of white orchids graced the table between two robin's egg blue wingback chairs. Understated elegance, with a hint of old world money. Nice. Evelyn, this is Cat, a friend of Wolf's. Harry said to the receptionist, "I'm taking her through to his office." The receptionist nodded, then went back to doing something on her phone. Harry used his key card to go through three layers of secured doors. Wow, this place is like Fort Knox, Cat said as he finally opened a fourth door onto another small reception area. We like to be secure. Wolf's office is this way. Are you sure I can't help you with anything? The arm with the coffees was starting to lose feeling, but never admit a weakness had been drummed into her from infancy, so she forced a smile. No, I'm good. Just a bit excited to see Wolf. At the end of the corridor, they arrived at a large vestibule. The floor-to-ceiling windows had been tinted to let in the optimum amount of light. London's skyline was dramatic, with patches of angry black clouds beginning to obliterate the hazy blue sky. The woman sitting behind the large oak desk lifted her gaze and speared Cat through. Not much got by her, Cat presumed. Thankfully, Margaret Mary was in on the ruse, although from the downward curve of her lips, Cat should definitely have gone with her first instinct to bring the woman a bottle of whiskey and not a coffee. And who are you bringing back here to the inner sanctum of His Most Holiness, Harry? Her lilting Irish accent brought a smile to Cat's face. Wolf's new girlfriend, Harry announced, perhaps a little too loudly. As Cat then heard several chairs being flung back and a half dozen doors creak open. Hi, I'm Cat. I brought you a coffee. Well, isn't that sweet of you? How do you know what I like? Not the time to say she'd hacked into the woman's finances and discovered that every morning she made a purchase at the same cafe. All she'd had to do was ask the barista. I met Wolf at a coffee shop, and when he heard my order, he commented that his secretary has her coffee the same. I thought any man who remembers what his secretary likes to drink can't be all bad. Margaret Mary took the cup Cat offered with a smile. Shame you'd not met him in a bar. He's been more bare than wolf today. I could use a drink. I brought him a coffee as well, so maybe that'll brighten his mood. Won't be the coffee that'll make him smile. The secretary's eyes raked Cat again. Nice suit. Thanks. Cat smoothed a gloved hand down her charcoal skirt. The jacket had a feminine ruffle on one lapel, with a discreet camisole underneath. It looked like she wasn't wearing a top. The all-over impression was classic and sexy. At least that's what she'd been aiming for. All of Wolf's previous girlfriends had been old money heiress types. She'd tried to fit the mold. No one would believe he was interested in a street rat who'd never even finished high school. Harry had already knocked on Wolf's door, so when she turned around, her fake boyfriend lounged in the doorway, his shoulder against the frame. How could he look even larger than last night? His black suit, with a very subtle grayish blue pinstripe, emphasized his broad chest and long legs. The man exuded power.
It was hard to remember he was an artist underneath all that business attire. Then again, most people wouldn't peg her for a hacker, either. I thought we were going to meet at the restaurant downstairs, he said by way of greeting. Without asking, he relieved her of the cardboard coffee holder and the plastic bag with the sandwiches. At least he'd learned already not to try and take her computer from her. Yes, but I kept you awake late last night, and I thought if I brought lunch, then you wouldn't lose so much time away from your desk, and I might be able to persuade you to take me for dinner. By all means, then. Come in and begin persuading. Harry, can we move our meeting to two o'clock? Wolf moved to the side so she could enter his office, his citrusy cologne filling her nose as she walked past. Yeah, for sure, Harry replied. She didn't need to turn around to know he was staring at her ass. With the door in his hand, ready to close it, Wolf addressed his secretary. Hold my calls, Margaret Mary. In fact, if you want to take an extended lunch break, today would be a good day. Oh, I like this one already, his secretary said, just before the door shut. He leaned against the now-closed portal, her only avenue of escape. Why was she thinking of running? It was perfectly safe. She was here to do a job. Sure, it included a little play-acting, but now that they were alone, she could get down to business. Opening up her bag, she took her laptop out and put it on his desk. As she powered it up, she glanced at Wolf, still standing by the door holding the coffee and sandwiches. What's your password? Not so fast. First, I want to know all about you. Wolf narrowed his eyes as Cat peeled off her gloves, then disconnected the network cable from his computer. It took all of his self-control not to pull her into his arms and kiss her, undo the buttons of her jacket and discover what lay beneath, if anything. God, she was sexy. But he wasn't about to let her have unlimited access to his systems without a few answers. We don't have time for this. Didn't Simon confirm my identity last night? She plugged the cable into her own laptop, then sat on his chair and began to type. Ten minutes isn't going to make a difference. He strode over to the desk, put down the coffees, and shut the lid on her laptop. Her gaze scorched him. Touch my computer again, and it'll be the last thing you do. Ten questions. Answer them, and you're free to poke your gorgeous nose in all my programs. The blaze in her eyes could have boiled his coffee. I'm here to help. Getting to know me isn't part of the deal. It is if you're pretending to be my girlfriend. I should know at least a little about you. This was your idea, after all. She tilted her head to one side as though contemplating his words. Five questions, and if I don't like one, I don't have to answer, and you move on to the next. He stared at her for a moment. She was only the second woman he'd known who didn't want to talk about herself. The first, Paulina, had turned out to be a fledgling member of the Pink Panther Gang and had used her connection with him to learn about diamond shipment routes and security measures. He'd never make that mistake again. Kat's reticence increased his distrust. Where were you born? St. Petersburg. No hesitation. Either a practiced lie or the truth. Florida? It's the only one I know in America. Do you still have family there? She stared over his shoulder. When her gaze met his again, her eyes were hard. No, at least I don't think so. My father was an alcoholic, and I haven't seen him in years. I have no idea if he's still alive. My mother left us when I was fourteen. I haven't seen her or my little sister since then. Why didn't she take you as well? She blinked several times. Obviously, he'd hit a nerve. Next question time to backtrack. You live in San Francisco now? Yes, the tech opportunities are better there. When was your last serious relationship? Seemed the kind of thing a pretend boyfriend should know. The fact that it hadn't been on his initial list of ten, never mind the top five points of inquiry, didn't seem to matter at the moment. That depends on how you define serious. If you mean the last time I thought I was in love, probably six years ago. If you mean, have I ever lived with a man or contemplated marriage, then the answer is never. Don't you date? Damn, that one just slipped out. That's your fifth question? 
She smiled, and he dragged in a deep breath to relieve the tingle in his chest. The pain he'd inflicted by digging into her family history seemed to have receded. At least her lips were no longer a tight line. Fourth, that was only four questions. Nope, you asked where I was born, then confirmed it was in Florida, then asked about my family, my romantic relationships, and now my social life. She raised a finger as she enumerated each question, five in total. The Florida question doesn't count. She shrugged. To answer your fifth question, I date occasionally. I usually work from 6 p.m. to 3 a.m., so that tends to rule out conventional dating opportunities. Her gaze caught his and held it. Her voice dropped suggestively. However, I have been known to hook up with people while away at conventions or on layovers. She moved around the desk and slid a hand up his lapel into his hair. Men who I meet in coffee lines and then can't forget, so I fly halfway around the world for a chance to spend a little more time with them. As she finished her sentence, her lips were a hair's breadth from his, and his body was harder than his desk. Rather than complete the kiss, she stepped away, ran her hands down the sides of her tight skirt, and moved back to her computer. Her voice was only slightly husky when she spoke again. Your password? I can hack in, but it will take me longer, and provided your firewall is decent, flag your IT department that I'm in the system. My IT services are outsourced, and I told them to stand down for the next little while as I ran some simulations on my systems, so they're not monitoring them at the moment. Great. That will make my life easier. However, I still need your password. Simon had vouched for her, so he'd let her start. He gave her his password, then moved to stand behind her, intent on watching her work. Her fingers flew over the keyboard, and within seconds he was lost as the screen filled with computer code he couldn't understand. You put your designs on the network? She asked ten minutes later. He was leaning against the wall, just watching her work, no longer trying to make sense of what she was doing. Yes, I design and select the gems, but I leave it to my production team to assemble the pieces. Having the blueprints on the computer means they can work even if I'm away on business. For the next week or so, avoid uploading anything new. Why? He leaned in over her shoulder, but as he couldn't read what was on the screen, his gaze drifted down to the gap between her lapels. Was she wearing anything under the jacket? Was the fabric rubbing against her nipples, making them pebble? The design files have been accessed by more than the production department. I've only got terminal IDs, so I can't tell who. But they don't match with computers that have accessed them prior to the last four weeks. A chill replaced the heat that had infused him. Have they been emailed outside of the company? No, but all someone would have to do is take a photo of their screen with a cell phone, and there'd be no way to trace that. Shit. She stopped typing and looked up at him. Her face softened, and she put a hand on his arm, braced on the desk next to her. Don't worry. We'll get this sorted. I'm going to tag the files, and that will ping me whenever someone accesses them. If you're really paranoid, you can upload some dummy designs, and I'll put a tracer in them, so we'll be able to tell if they show up elsewhere. I've also put a double firewall around your and Margaret Mary's email accounts. Now I'll hunt for the malicious code. It all started in the accounting department, right? Yes, random invoices have been getting dropped from the payment schedule. Now suppliers are holding vital materials, and the financing I want to go in on a mining operation in Canada is in question. He took a swig of the coffee Cat had brought to wash down the taste of bile in his mouth. So far he'd managed to smooth over all the issues raised by the technical glitches, but it didn't cover the fact he was being betrayed from the inside. She sent him a gentle smile, acknowledging his frustration. There are a couple of sandwiches in the plastic bag. I wasn't sure what you liked, so there's a tandoori chicken and a tuna melt. You mean there's something you don't know about me? He was pretty sure she'd lied about some of the answers she'd given him. After all, trotting out their fake story about meeting on a layover in answer to one of his questions was highly suspect. Although the emotion she'd shown when discussing her family held a ring of truth. That her history resonated deep within him, causing some long dormant feelings to flicker to life for a moment, was not something he cared to contemplate right now. She was a fascinating woman, 
one who, under different circumstances, he'd take pleasure in getting to know further, a great deal of pleasure. Actually, that may be the answer. He'd discovered Paulina's treachery when she thought Wolf had fallen asleep after sex. His muscles tensed, remembering the whispered phone call he'd overheard her make, divulging the details about a diamond shipment he expected. Pillow talk had been his downfall once. It wouldn't be again. But he'd ferreted out more than one secret while between the sheets. Cat shrugged. Surprisingly enough, your sandwich preference wasn't listed in any of the documents I read. And there are millions of things I don't know. But if you take me to dinner tonight, perhaps we can narrow that down to a few hundred thousand. I thought that was just an act for our audience. Your previous romantic relationships have been all over the tabloids, so I thought we needed to be seen in public as well to cement the lie. But if you don't want to go, that's fine. She returned her attention to the screen, effectively dismissing him. He'd been told on more than one occasion that he shut people out when he was working, but this was the first time he'd been on the receiving end. As he couldn't figure out what she was doing, he pulled a sandwich from the bag and retreated to the sofa. Maybe it was a lucky guess that tuna melts were his favorite. Maybe she'd been lying again. Maybe it was time to get even in the information department. I'm going to step out for a minute. You okay here? Hmm? She didn't even look up, her fingers flying so fast on the keyboard they were a blur. He slipped out and, after ensuring that no one was around, called a private investigator he'd used before. Betting cat would be enjoyable but he sensed she was a lot more practiced at deceiving than Paulina had been. Cat was unlikely to slip up in the night. Still, it wouldn't hurt to see if he could discover what she was hiding with a few passionate kisses. It was time he got some straight answers, one way or another. There you are. Oh, you are a beauty. Cat took a moment to analyze the malicious code embedded in the accounting system. Most hackers had a signature, a way of coding or a preferred language or style that identified them as clearly as a mugshot, or they just straight out signed their work. Arrogant bastards. She was proficient at recognizing the top 20 corporate hackers and could usually at least figure out where the code originated geographically based on the language of choice. This she hadn't seen before. It was beautiful in a childlike way. Raw and unpretentious, it instructed the computer to eliminate any invoices containing the number 27 in any of the entered fields. Date, amount, quantity, address, whatever. It would have taken weeks to figure out the pattern manually. It was also completely anonymous. She took a screenshot of the malicious code to save for further analysis, then killed it. It would take a few hours to read through the rest of the program to ensure it was clean, but she could do that tonight. She closed all the back doors she'd opened, then created a ghost user account for herself so she wouldn't need to use Wolf's login in the future. Speaking of the man, where'd he go? She had a vague recollection of him saying he was popping out for a minute. It was nearly two o'clock, time for his meeting with Harry. She should get a move on, especially as she wanted to get to Covent Garden before the dancers arrived for tonight's performance. It had been a huge bonus to taking this assignment that the Bolshoi Ballet was in London. Would her sister be there? She wasn't listed as a ballerina anymore, but maybe she'd transitioned to another position. Kat shut down her laptop and returned it to her bag, then reconnected the network cable to Wolf's computer. She stretched her arms wide to ease the tense muscles in her back. Of course, that would be when his office door opened. Heat started in her lower belly, then moved upward as his gaze caressed her body. I, uh, I found the bad code in your accounting software. The good news is that it doesn't appear to be a root hack kit, something that infects your servers. It was an embedded command that affected this one program, and I've deleted it. I'll check the software again more thoroughly this evening. I thought we were going for dinner. He moved toward her. His gray eyes held her captive. A deer caught in the headlights. Snap out of it, cat. It's all part of the masquerade. If you like. But dinner's not going to take the whole evening, is it? All of it. And part of the night, too. She swallowed. 
That's a lot of eating. Oh, there'll be an attainment as well. He was next to her now. The scent of his cologne and the warmth of his body reached out and held her where she was. What kind of entertainment? Her gaze fastened on his mouth and wouldn't move. His hand slid from her shoulder to her elbow, then moved around her waist to her back, pulling her off balance and against his body. The kind that involves two people getting to know each other. His head descended, and he brushed his lips against hers. The almost kiss was like the first jolt of caffeine in the morning, awakening her senses. Automatically, her mouth opened, inviting his exploration. Instead, his lips skimmed over to her ear, the tip of his tongue tracing the outline of the lobe. Damn, had that moan come from her? You think I'm going to fall at your feet, don't you? The breathiness of her voice unnerved her. Her reaction to a man hadn't been this out of control in years, but it wasn't fear making her heart pound. I'd never let you fall, but by the end of the night... I'll know exactly what you have on underneath that jacket. Outside the office, she could hear Harry and Margaret Mary talking. If they really wanted to sell this fake relationship, they should be caught in the act. Why wait until tonight? This is for the job. That's why I'm doing this. Has nothing whatsoever to do with the fact that I've been wondering what his kisses are like since we first met. She slipped the concealed buttons from their holes and dropped the jacket on the floor. Her nipples hardened under Wolf's intent gaze. The silk of the camisole and the lace of her push-up bra felt as tight as the wrapping her mother used to make her wear around her breasts, and she longed to shed them as well. The heat that had infused her earlier now blazed like a glass furnace. Bloody hell, cat. How am I going to work this afternoon? She pulled his head down to hers as she heard his office door click open. Very quickly. Oh, sorry. I thought you'd gone already. Harry's over-posh accent barely registered as Wolf kissed her. His tongue invaded her mouth, caressing the inside of her lips before plundering, searching for something. He must have heard his friend's arrival as well, but didn't seem at all phased that they had an audience. By the time he released her lips, they were both breathing heavily. He held her body pressed against his, her breasts flat to his chest. At least Harry's view of her was blocked by Wolf. Give me two minutes, Wolf said over his shoulder. Harry backed out the door, and Wolf bent and retrieved her jacket, his eyes not venturing below her chin. Until tonight. Chapter 3 Cat lurked outside the performer's entrance to the Royal Opera House. The Bolshoi Ballet's three-week season had only a few days left before the company would return to Moscow and out of reach. For five years, her sister Natalia had been a principal ballerina, the culmination of all their mother's hopes and dreams. More like rabid ambition that had ripped the family apart, left Cat homeless and alone, and her beloved sister trapped in a career she hadn't really wanted. She'd seen that same ambition in Wolf's eyes. An obsession with fame had destroyed her life once. Never again. Until two years ago, Kat had been able to keep tabs on her sister through her ballet career. Natalia had been the darling of the Bolshoi, as talented as she was beautiful. Then suddenly, she'd been dropped from the performance billings and apparently disappeared off the face of the earth. Not even a cyber fingerprint remained of her sister. At first, Kat had assumed Natalia had taken a much-needed break, or perhaps a minor injury had dropped her from the roster. But as weeks had turned to months, she'd become more concerned. Her letters had been returned unopened. She'd even contemplated a visit to Moscow, as fraught with danger as that was, in the hope of finding her sister. This trip to London, coinciding with the Bolshoi's guest performances, had saved Kat the peril of returning to her homeland. The question now was how to discover what had happened to her sister without a. revealing they were related, and b. still keeping her American identity intact. Kat had made some powerful enemies in Russia, and if they knew Natalia was her sister, they wouldn't hesitate to use her to try and get at Kat. They hadn't made the connection yet. Or had they? 
Was she being drawn into a trap? Natalia's disappearance relentlessly tormented Kat. Fangirling to meet the dancers seemed the only option to get answers, and the best targets would be the male performers. So here she was, dressed in a short skirt, thigh-high boots, a crop top, and leather jacket, loitering on the streets of Covent Garden. Any second now, she'd be picked up for solicitation. But it was a better disguise than the business attire she'd worn to Wolf's office. Her body reheated as she recalled his embrace. Beau moi, he was tempting, and she'd been so good for so long. Wolf was the first man to give her goosebumps with just a look. Didn't she owe it to herself to fully explore this new development? Why not enjoy life for a few nights? It could never be more than that. A permanent relationship was out of the question for her. Any moment, her American identity could be blown, and she'd have to reinvent herself again. Wolf already made her long for all the things she couldn't have, a physical relationship with him would only intensify that. For her sanity's sake, she should keep him at arm's length. But her body didn't give a shit about mental health. It wanted Wolf. She was safe from frying her brain cells with further consideration about the evening's activities by the arrival of a half-dozen dancers. She singled out one of the men and leveled her most sensuous smile his way. On cue, he detached himself from the group and approached her. I just love ballet dancers, she gushed, using her best British accent. Can I get your autograph? She handed a piece of paper and pen to him. Are you sure you don't want me to sign somewhere more personal? His thick Russian accent grated against her nerves. She bit her tongue to stop from shutting him down in Russian. Instead, she giggled. Maybe tomorrow, when I come for the performance... Last time Natalia Smirnova autographed my book. Is she not dancing this year? He signed her book, looked over his shoulder, then passed it back to her. No, she no longer dances. So it wasn't just a temporary thing. Cat put a hand on his arm as he moved to rejoin his group entering the theater. Is she okay? He cleared his throat and said louder than necessary, I know nothing of this person. Then he lowered it again and whispered, It is better for you not to ask. With a fake smile, he returned to the group. Cat pocketed the paper and pen and walked off in the other direction, a chill in her bones that not even riding the underground on a summer's day could dispel. She was still thinking about her sister, three hours later, when she entered the Ting restaurant. To try and bolster her mood, she'd put on a red one-shoulder dress and her favorite Louboutin heels, black patent leather with a leopard print heel and the signature red sole. Her shoe collection was her greatest extravagance, closely followed by her lingerie addiction. Having had to hide being a girl for so many years, she was making up for it now. "'Miss Smith, Mr. Wolf is waiting for you at the table,' the mater d' said as she finally acknowledged her surroundings." The lighting was subdued, probably so the amazing view could be seen with minimal reflection. And given how far apart the tables were spaced, the restaurant catered to those whose need for privacy was matched by their bank account. Wolf stood as she neared, and she allowed her eyes to travel the length of him. He still wore the suit from this afternoon, but he changed the shirt and lost the tie. The kiss he placed on her cheek in greeting seemed anticlimactic, after their smoke and embrace in his office. Champagne, he asked, as the maitre d' hovered. Not for me. I'll have a vodka martini. Extra dirty, she said. Wolf's eyebrows nearly met his hairline, and he cleared his throat before saying, Same for me. The maitre d' hurried off to place their drink order. When she glanced at him, Wolf's eyes seemed focused on her ear, that was a fetish she hadn't come across before, but remembering the feel of his tongue as it traced the outline of her lobe, one she could deal with. She forced her gaze to the view, so he couldn't see the lingering passion in her eyes. You don't wear jewelry. His question came out of the blue, startling her attention back from the side of Tower Bridge lit up against the night sky. Occasionally... But with you being a jewelry designer, it seemed rude to wear someone else's pieces, 
kind of like putting on a negligee another man bought to tempt a current lover. So what do you do with past lovers' negligees? I buy my own lingerie, just like I buy my own jewellery. What about a gift, in appreciation of your company? She shrugged. My company comes without price. A waiter appeared and placed the drinks on the table. With only a discreet movement of his hand, Wolf waved him away. It will look odd if you're my girlfriend and not wearing any jewels. Just tell people I'm not like your other girlfriends. I don't conform to popular perceptions. She took a sip of her drink and waited for his reaction. This is why she didn't date. Everyone always wanted to put her in a convenient category. You are definitely nothing like my other women. Harry had as difficult a time concentrating at our meeting as I did. Tell me about him. She took another sip of her martini and watched the expressions chase themselves over Wolf's face. Although he had no right to feel possessive about her, that's the one that lingered the longest. Why? Just a strange vibe I got in the elevator on my way to your office. And yesterday, when I asked who you trusted, you only said Margaret Mary. It was his turn to stare at the view. I've known Harry since school, the same as Simon Lamont. But unlike Simon and me, Harry came from a big, loving family. His parents and siblings were always at each other's sports day and achievement award ceremony. He acted like he was a bit superior because he had people who cared. Unlike your parents? His laugh was short and bitter. My parents once forgot to pick me up for Easter break. I spent it with the caretaker and his wife as the school was closed for maintenance. She put her hand on his on the table, rubbing her thumb across his knuckles. I'm sorry. Something they shared. The pain of parental rejection. You know what that's like, don't you? He flipped his hand over and gripped hers before she could pull it away. The gesture of camaraderie set off a flutter in her belly and tightened her throat. She had to take a large swig of her drink before she could answer. What doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Or leaves you scarred for life. I'm not a victim, and neither are you. Besides, we were talking about Harry. Are you interested in him? Not in the slightest. He raised her hand and left a lingering kiss on the back. Damn, ears and hands. By the end of dinner, this man would have her a quivering mess. Good, he said, but didn't elaborate. He released her hand and drained his drink. By the time I set up Wolf PLC and started hawking my jewelry, Harry had completed his degree in business, and I needed someone who could handle the administrative side of things while I designed and sourced gem suppliers. Things have been working well until about a year ago. Then he started making some questionable decisions, and I've had to take back the reins on a few projects. Did something happen to him? Not sure. He hasn't said anything. He's not serious with anyone, as far as I know, and we've never been super chummy, so I don't ask about his family often. I went on a date with his sister once, but it was such a disaster. Wolf visibly shuddered. Harry hasn't taken a sick day or had any mysterious appointments that I know about, so I doubt he's ill. Want me to investigate him? They both knew what she meant. Maybe. Let's wait to see what else you uncover while you're playing with my equipment. The repressed laughter in his eyes had her finishing her drink before replying, I don't play. We'll see. What the hell did he mean by that? Wolf leaned back in his chair as the waiter removed his empty plate. When was the last time he'd enjoyed himself this much? For once, he hadn't had to pretend interest in a woman or her pets. Cat was entertaining, reciting stories of former clients, always anonymous, and the things she'd found in their systems, although any attempt to talk about her past or her personal life was quickly shut down. She was well-traveled, well-read, and had a brilliant sense of humor— but somehow he got the feeling that it was all an act. Who was the real Cat Smith? Although he was uneasy with the subterfuge of having her investigated, he needed answers to know if he could fully trust her. 
With the royal commission on the line, he couldn't afford any unknowns. The prince was ultra-conservative about who he worked with. Any association with the wrong people could destroy Wolf's chance of getting the job. No woman, no matter how interesting, was going to get in the way of his career. I should probably get back to work, Kat said, placing her napkin on the table. He glanced at his watch. It's 10.30, and you have bags under your eyes. You can take a night off. Excuse me, aren't you the guy who flew me out here on a private jet because you needed this job done urgently? He put a hand on hers where it rested on the table. Not at the expense of your health. You've fixed the issue with the invoices, and I've got manual systems in place to double-check everything. I'm not going to upload any crucial designs until you tell me that's safe as well. For the moment, we're in a holding pattern, so there's no need to rush. Her eyes searched his face. That seems to go against your mandate. I was told, get this sorted, pronto. Yes, but now I believe this will be more of a long-term project. You're mentioning my designs being accessed has me worried I not only want to fix the problem, but catch the bastard who's doing this to my company. That's going to take a couple of weeks. He paused, remembering Simon's words about going from a one-week affair to marriage. Cat, though, didn't come across as looking for a commitment. And no way was Wolf ever getting sucked into that hellhole. She hesitated so long he thought maybe she would refuse. All right. I was going to take a holiday next week, but I guess I can stay here and help you. Maybe you can do both. I have a business trip to make a week from Monday. Perhaps you could come with me. What the hell? He just invited her to Russia? He'd known the woman for 24 hours, 18 of those he'd spent in a near-constant state of arousal, and he was inviting her to the most important business meeting of his life? A bolt, a bolt. We'll see, she replied. I may have to take a quick trip then as well. The distant look was back in her eyes, the one she'd had when she first arrived at the restaurant. Something was troubling her. Before he could ask, she shook it off and said, Shall we strategize a plan of attack? Yes, but not here. Let's go up to my place where we can talk in private. She raised one eyebrow, questioning his motives. Really? Your place? Is this where the entertainment part of the evening begins? He laughed and stood. You'll just have to wait to find out. Patience is not one of my virtues. Then we can explore your vices. It took only minutes to get to his flat. One of the benefits of living in the tallest building in the UK, everything was handy in one place. He left the lights low so she could enjoy the view. But instead of moving over to the floor-to-ceiling windows or commenting on the decor, she pulled a device out of her handbag and began scanning the room. Um, what are you doing? She put a finger to her lips. Getting comfortable, babe. The sexy tone of her voice was at odds with her actions. After a sweep of the living room, she put the device back in her bag. You're clear of listening devices, at least in here. If we keep the lights low, we probably don't need to worry about cameras, unless they're infrared, and even then, they'll only know we're here together. Who was this woman? Is this standard operating procedure for you, to sweep a place for bugs? Pretty much. You're being targeted. I'm surprised you haven't done this before. He hadn't quite descended to that level of paranoia. She sank onto his sofa. So, how do you plan to catch your saboteur? He poured them both a whiskey and handed her a glass. To be honest, I have no idea. I doubt they'll mess with the accounting system again. There's a huge competition in ten days where an Arab royal family will choose a jeweler to set their fortune in loose gems. Six designers, including myself, have been invited to submit a set of designs and prototype jewellery. Perhaps if I upload some dummy designs, I'll be able to see if any of them appear in my competitors' pieces, and we can work backward from there. Sounds like a plan. I can put a tracker on the file so we'll know when it's accessed, and maybe a few discreet cameras around your offices so we can see if anyone is viewing the images through terminals they shouldn't. Brilliant. She took a sip of her whiskey. What about the real designs? He searched her face. 
I decided today I'm going with all new designs, and I'll make the pieces myself to minimize those who see them in advance. Which means you'll be very busy. I should go. She stood to leave, and his chest tightened. Before he could ask her to stay, her phone rang. Pulling it from her handbag, she glanced at the screen, then turned to him. I need to take this call, okay? Sure. Do you want privacy? No, it's Liam Manning. I sent him the code I pulled from your accounting program to see if he recognized the source. She answered the call and put the phone to her ear, wandering over to the window as she did so. As she spoke with the other cybersecurity guru, Wolf admired her profile. He grabbed his sketch pad and soon was lost in a world of shading and feathering. When something blocked his light, he looked up. You're having me investigated? The question was asked casually, but her knuckles were white where she gripped her phone. He tossed the sketch pad onto the coffee table and stood, but Cat didn't move. Knowledge is pa. I don't like being kept in the dark. She picked up his controller and flicked off all the lights, then put it back on the table. Her phone joined it on top of his sketchbook. How about now? With only ambient light from outside, the room was cloaked in darkness. She stood not a foot from him, and he could barely see her outline. Yet he sensed her presence, smelled her delicate fragrance, and the hint of whiskey as she exhaled, heard the rustle of fabric as she planted her feet farther apart, as though preparing for a fight. Cat, this is me, Wolf. I am the dark. I work at night. I spend as much of my time in the dark net as above. There is no light in me. My mother wanted me to be something I couldn't, and when she realized that, she left with my sister who could be the star she needed. My father chose a bottle over me, so I survived by becoming invisible. I put that life behind me five years ago and haven't looked back. That should be enough for you. If you can't accept that, then fine. I can recommend three others who will be equally competent at cleaning your systems and finding the saboteur. I deal in precious gems. I run a background check on everyone in my company. It was the truth, but the information he'd wanted on Cat was more personal, less potential felon. If you wanted a criminal record report, you could have asked Liam Manning. He has an up-to-date one he sends to prospective clients. Call off your investigator, Wolf. If he digs too deep into the darkness, I'll be sucked back in. I can't let that happen. Are you in danger? He reached out a hand and connected with her bare shoulder, her skin cool to his touch, as though she really was out in the cold night air. She hesitated, and he was torn between pulling her into his arms and taking a step back. The moon moved out from behind a cloud, and a shaft of light illuminated them. For a split second, he saw a hint of vulnerability in her eyes, before it was gone, behind her shield of self-sufficiency. No. He was tempted to turn the lights back on, so he could see her clearly, but was afraid of what his own face would reveal. He'd never felt such an attraction to a woman before, more than physical. It was almost magnetic. She pulled him to her. I want you. His voice was just above a whisper. Whether due to the darkness or the emotion she was drawing from him, he didn't care to analyze. If he hadn't been touching her, he never would have known she hauled in a deep breath before replying, To keep working for you? Yes. And in my bed. She lifted his hand from her shoulder, and after a brief hesitation, released it. I need to be able to walk away from you at the end of next week without looking back. I'm not sure I'll be able to do that if we become lovers. Bloody hell. Chapter 4 Cat opened one bleary eye and repressed the urge to punch the bedside clock. It had to be messing with her. It couldn't be 10.30 already. She'd overslept because she'd left her phone with its alarm at Wolf's last night when she'd fled his apartment before she could give in to her own desire to jump his bones. First order of the day was going to be an emergency visit to the makeup counter at Selfridges, because after another restless night, she was pretty sure the bags under her eyes would now be considered cargo. 
It wasn't the time difference from San Francisco. She'd never had trouble adjusting to those before, and she'd never been a deep sleeper anyway. She'd survived on power naps and three hours of shut-eye for weeks on end at certain times in her life. But last night, all she'd been able to hear was the passion in Wolf's voice when he'd said he wanted her. At least she'd managed to check two more of his computer software systems for a malicious code without finding anything. Usually her work soothed her, but she'd tossed and turned after crawling between the sheets until eventually she'd propped two large pillows behind her back and pretended Wolf was there with her. The whole thing was ridiculous. She'd slept alone since her mother took her sister away, so why did her bed seem so empty now? Damn the man! The quicker she got his system sorted out, the better for her equilibrium. She'd been quite content till she'd met him. There were just some things in life she was destined never to have. Independence was her greatest strength. It was almost one thirty by the time she strolled into Wolf's offices, trusting that the hour she'd spent doing her hair and makeup successfully hid the ravages of the night. She hadn't really planned on seeing him today, but she'd left her phone in his apartment last night and needed to retrieve it. Liam hadn't recognized the code and was going to further analyze it to see if he could work out where it had originated. The receptionist remembered her from yesterday and buzzed through to Margaret Mary that she'd arrived before Cat had even approached the desk. "'There you are, love,' Margaret Mary said as she came through the door. "'He's been foaming at the mouth all morning, waiting for you to collect your mobile phone. "'I thought he might be in a bad mood, so I brought you this.' Cat handed a paper bag to the secretary as they made their way through the plethora of security doors. Margaret Mary peeked inside. "'Thanks, but it will save my liver and my sanity if you just strip him naked, "'throw him on his back and ride him like a bucking bronco.' I'll guard his office door if you want to make sure you're not interrupted. Cat nearly tripped. Great advice, but I haven't had lunch yet, she replied, trying to hold back her laughter. Riding Wolf like a Bronco would definitely be a game changer. And if she thought of it only as a stress reliever, maybe she still would be able to walk away at the end of their time together. They rounded the final corner to where Wolf's office was located. A young woman sat on one of the chairs across from Margaret Mary's desk, cuddling a tiny baby. Cat's heart began to pound, and her palms tingled. Cat, this is Rebecca from our purchasing department. She's popped in today to show us her beautiful baby boy. Rebecca, this is Wolf's girlfriend, Cat. Pleased to meet you. Both Cat and Rebecca said at once. Cat moved toward the new mom, as though drawn by a gravitational force. Babies were her Achilles' heel. She couldn't resist them, even screaming ones. And it wasn't as if she'd ever imagined having a child of her own. Maybe it was their innocence, the potential they had to do anything, be anything, unshaped by the events that had forced her down a dark path. The baby smiled up at his mother, a rapturous look of love on his face. He's beautiful, Cat whispered. He just nursed, so he's milk drunk. Typical male. He loves the boob. Don't they all? Margaret Mary said with a deep laugh. Would you like to hold him? Rebecca asked. Then she glanced at Cat's black Donna Karen dress. Oh, maybe you'd better not. He may spit up, and I'd hate to ruin your outfit. It'll clean. I'd love to have a cuddle. Cat stripped off her gloves and dropped them with her handbag on the empty chair next to the new mom. Cat had spent so many years careful not to leave her fingerprints anywhere that she felt naked without her gloves. Rebecca carefully handed the child to Cat, who snuggled him under her chin so she could smell his hair and just breathe in the whole babiness of him. What's his name? William. The phone rang, and Margaret Mary went to answer it. If you're okay for a sec, do you mind if I run to the loo? Rebecca asked. No problem. As the mother hurried away, Cat cuddled the baby close. Well, William, you certainly are gorgeous. She shifted him so she could stare into his face. His bright blue eyes scanned her features as well. You are so precious. Your parents are very lucky. She raised her eyes to find Wolf, staring at her from the doorway to his office. His gray eyes were fixated on her, holding the baby. Was he confused at the appearance of an infant in his office, or that she would be holding one? 
Before she could ask, Rebecca returned and took William from Cat's arms. I'd better be going. I promised the girls in purchasing that I'd bring him back for one last cuddle before I leave. Congratulations, Rebecca. It's nice to see you again, Wolf said as the new mother gathered her diaper bag and sling. Thank you, Mr. Wolf. Rebecca smiled at Cat before turning back to her boss. And thank you for the generous donation to his education fund. My husband and I were blown away. You're welcome. I look forward to having you back at work when you're ready. But enjoy the time with your new son. As my girlfriend said, he's gorgeous. Was the way he said girlfriend some kind of reminder that his women would rather have their shoe collection stolen than be caught holding a baby? Well, she'd already told him she wouldn't be stereotyped. To prove her point, she placed an extra kiss on William's head. Rebecca's gaze bounced between the two fake lovers. Margaret Mary looked amused, and Wolf looked like he was about to devour Cat for lunch. Have you eaten, darling? he asked, still standing in the doorway to his office. Cat glanced around to make sure he was talking to her. No, but I only came to collect my phone. I'm sure you have work to do. Wolf nodded at Margaret Mary, who immediately picked up her phone once more. Please, come in. I'd like to show you something. He stood to the side and waited while Cat collected her bag and gloves. As she passed him, he turned back to Margaret Mary. Let me know when lunch arrives, and then, please, make sure we are not disturbed. Yes, sir. I won't let anyone through, even if I hear everything atop your desk crush to the floor. She replied with another of her exuberant laughs. Wolf closed the door on Margaret Mary's mirth. Your secretary has a vivid imagination. Or is this a common occurrence in your office? Surprisingly, you are the first of my girlfriends to visit my office, which probably accounts for all the curiosity about you. But before you distract me further, I have to ask. Babies? I'd never pegged you for a maternal person. Cat shrugged and moved to admire the view. He really did have a nice office. Old world decor with a modern vista of the towers of Docklands and the city beyond. Past and future. And piles of money. When a woman thrusts her newborn in your arms, it's bad manners to run away screaming. Do you want a family? Children? Hell yeah, was her initial reaction to his question. What I want and what I'm going to get are two wildly different things in my world. They don't have to be. He was standing right behind her now. She could feel the warmth of his body, smell the hints of lemon and sage in his cologne. The hairs on her nape stood on end, waiting for the caress of his lips on her neck, his arms to circle her waist and draw her against him. Is that why you asked me in here? To discuss my baby-making plans? Actually, I wanted to show you my new designs. I was up most of last night working on them, but if you want to talk about the mechanics of making babies, maybe even have a practice session, I'm game. From the way her body reacted, so was she. Wolf forced himself to move away from Cat. She intoxicated him, and he didn't have time for that. He had masses of work to do, and for once in his life, he lacked the drive to get it done. Now was not the moment for his ambition to slip. He had to be the best in his business, never forgotten. Remington Wolf would be a name spoken for generations as a preeminent jewelry designer. This competition was the way to launch his company into the stratosphere. For decades, jewelers had wanted to get their hands on the Ajmani loose gemstones, to be the one to set them, show their beauty to the masses, who would be a dream come true. Then he'd opened his office door and found the current object of his lust-filled fantasy holding a tiny baby and looking on it with such love that for the first time in his life he'd questioned his priorities, only for a second, but long enough to leave him winded. He picked up his sketchbook and flipped the pages past the drawing he made of Cat last night and stopped on the page for the signature piece in the Ajmani collection, a 15-carat natural bicolor sapphire. What do you think? It had been years since he'd sought an opinion on a design, 
but he wanted to know what Cap thought. Without telling her, she'd been the inspiration. He could imagine her wearing the gem, encased in delicate filigrees of silver, nestled between her breasts. Even better if that was all she wore. Once he had the prototype finished, he'd convince her to model it for him. It's amazing. It makes me think of a man's arms holding the woman he loves, protecting her, but still allowing her to stand on her own. Her voice had softened, and a warm blush suffused her skin as she handed the sketch pad back to him. His gaze bounced between the woman and the design, intrigued by the image she presented. His goal had been to show the beauty of the stone without actually mounting it. Cat's analogy was startlingly accurate, though. Had that been in his subconscious when he'd designed it, she was definitely a woman who could stand on her own. That she'd want a man to give her support now and again filled his chest with warmth. Too bad he couldn't be that man. Jules would always be his first love, and a woman like Cat was unlikely to settle for second place. The warmth turned to a burn. I'm glad you like it. She stared longingly at the design for another moment, the same way she looked at baby William, then took a deep breath and straightened her shoulders. The wistfulness was gone from her voice when she said, It's perfect. Now, if you'll give me my phone, I'll get out of your hair and you can get back to work. She picked up her handbag and began to pull on her gloves. If she looked this sexy with all those clothes on, how would she look with them off? He was already having to take cold showers with the image of her in a skirt and camisole burned into his retinas. As soon as he had the competition entries completed, he'd seduce Cat into his bed. If he could wait that long. Lunch is on its way, and as for being in my hair, you haven't even touched it yet. What will Margaret Mary think if you leave so soon? He took her bag from her hand and returned it to his desk, then drew her toward the sofa. Margaret Mary knows this girlfriend thing is a ruse. Is it? We had dinner last night, and you came back to my place, then conveniently left your phone, so you'd have an excuse to come by today. He caressed her cheek with the back of his finger, gratified at the shuddery, indrawn breath she took. I thought we decided that a physical relationship between us was a bad idea. We didn't decide anything. You put forward an argument, then walked out the door before I could refute it. Well, it is a bad idea. A very, very bad idea. His lips were on hers by the time she finished the sentence, but she didn't protest as his hand slid into her hair, the other around her waist. He sipped at her mouth, sampled and nibbled, until she moaned and molded her body closer to his. Very bad ideas are usually the best ones, he said, as he kissed his way along her jaw and then down her throat. God, she tasted fantastic, and from the rapid rise and fall of her chest, she was as affected as he was. He ran a hand under the hem of her dress, up her leg until he encountered the top of his stocking and suspenders. Bloody hell. The sharp rap on his door was so ill-timed he cursed. Come up for air. Lunch is here. Margaret Mary called out. Without waiting for his invitation, she opened the door, then pushed a wheeled table into the room, not seeming at all phased by the sight of her boss in a semi-reclined position on the sofa with his cybersecurity expert underneath him. Saved by the spaghetti, Cat said. She removed her bare hand from his hair and the gloved hand from his back and used both to push against his chest. Reluctantly, he helped her sit up. Glad to see your hair did work, Margaret Mary said, door in hand. You'll be remembering this during my next performance review. Not even the closed panel could mute her laughter. One day I'm going to fire that woman. Wolf grumbled as he went to retrieve their lunches from the cart, now parked in the middle of the room. And rehire her ten minutes later because you can't find anything. Probably. I hope you like seafood pasta. I noticed you ordered fish last night. I love seafood pasta. Thank you. She took the plate from him and then set it on the coffee table while she removed her one remaining glove. Margaret Mary's not wrong, though. 
We are meant to be working. I made a thorough sweep of the accounting and HR programs last night and didn't find anything amiss. I'll do the purchasing and document databases next. Did you have those fake designs sorted yet? I can put trackers on them as well. I can show you which ones this evening. Oh, actually, I can't tonight. I have a ticket to the ballet. There was an odd hesitation in her voice as she told him of her plans, but she was so intent on twirling the pasta on her fork, he couldn't see her face fully. I'll join you. She kept her head down. I think the performance is sold out. Tomorrow is the last night the Bolshoi is in town. I had to buy my ticket off a scalper, and it's not even a very good seat. They're performing at the Royal Opera House in Covent Garden, aren't they? I have a box. Of course you do. Her ruby-stained lips closed around a forkful of pasta. The opera and ballet set are my bread and butter. Lots of purchases from the ejection collection? He laughed at her reminder of the jewelry line for terminating relationships. No, they're more the multi-decade anniversary purchases, although some probably get a few pieces for their mistresses as well. You don't miss a trick, do you? I can't vet the relationship credentials of everyone who buys my jewelry. I guess not. She put another forkful of food in her mouth. He hadn't even taken a bite of his yet. Before her arrival, he'd been starving. I have one request for tonight. She cocked her head to the side. I don't remember saying you could come with me. By having a box, I also have an automatic invitation to meet the dancers backstage after the performance. Maybe that would tilt the table in his favor. She didn't even hesitate. Sold. What's your request? You wear a set of my jewels. Her right eyebrow quirked upward. You want me to be your walking mannequin? He wanted to spend his evening imagining her wearing nothing but his creations. Something like that. Besides, as I said, people will expect my girlfriend to wear my jewelry. All right, then. God, he'd never had to cajole a woman to wear his gems before. What will you be wearing? More importantly, what would she be sporting underneath, if anything? His fingers still itched to explore the top edge of her stockings. He shifted in his chair. Thank God his box seats allowed for more legroom, although it may not be his legs that needed additional space. I had planned to wear what I have on now, but if I'm going with you and wearing your jewels, I'd better up my game. I saw a nice navy dress in the window of a shop this morning. I'll pick it up after I'm done here. No need. I can have someone get it for you. He grabbed for his phone, but she stopped him. I buy my own clothes, and the jewels are on loan. You'll be getting them back as well. I will decide what happens to them. What's your problem with presents? They come with strings. No one ties me down. He shook his head. One day you'll tell me who taught you that lesson. Then I can beat the crap out of them. She smiled, and his chest tightened. Maybe one day. A mischievous glint shone in her eyes as she put her now empty plate on the coffee table. In the meantime, eat your lunch while I play with your equipment. If he wasn't careful, this woman would have him questioning his own name before the week was out. Chapter 5 Cat fidgeted in her seat beside him. She'd taken his breath away when she'd appeared in the lobby of the Shangri-La wearing her navy silk gown. The portrait collar neckline was the perfect frame for the sapphire and diamond necklace he'd chosen for her, and she'd slicked her hair back so the drop earring showed to full effect but nothing was as amazing as the woman herself. And based on the way her breasts were pushed up like they might spill from the top of her dress if she bent over, she wore a corset. Did she have old-fashioned stockings on as well? Damn the tightness of his bow tie. The chatter of the people in the dress circle below his box got louder as the orchestra began their tune-up cacophony. What was up with Cat? Her knees shook so much her tiny silver bag slid off her lap. He handed it back to her and laced his fingers through hers. What are you nervous about? You handled the paparazzi very well. As they'd exited the Rolls Royce he'd hired to bring them to the performance, two dozen photographers had been waiting. Cat had posed and smiled like a professional. 
Photogs had called out to him, asking the name of his companion, but he'd just grinned, put his arm around her waist, and escorted her into the building. I'm excited for the performance. It's the world-famous Bolshoi. Are we really going to meet the dancers afterward? Provided we're still here at the end of the performance and not elsewhere finishing what Margaret Mary interrupted this afternoon. If you want to. She shrugged, but still seemed oddly nervous. What can I say? I have a thing for men in tights. The lights in the theater dimmed, and he leaned over to whisper in her ear, I have a thing for women in stockings. Do you still have them on? A sexy rumble of laughter preceded her answer. Of course. And a corset. Yes. This time her voice was even huskier. Damn. The lights went out, and Kat turned her attention to the stage, her gaze never once moving from the performance. Wolf's eyes rarely left her. It was the second act when he realized she'd slipped off her shoes and her feet pointed and flexed along with the dancers on stage. Her arm farthest away from him also moved and swayed with the music. She'd once been a ballet dancer. He'd bet his weight in diamonds on it. As the lights came back on for intermission, Kat slumped in her seat as though exhausted. Yet her eyes glowed and a radiant energy shone in her smile. That was beautiful, don't you think? Incredible. Would you like a glass of champagne, or perhaps a martini, extra dirty? Actually, I'll have champagne tonight. I feel like celebrating. Hopefully her good mood would spill over to include an after-after party. Want to come with me to the bar, or should I bring it here for you? He should have pre-ordered their drinks to be delivered to them. Having Cat wear his jewels was marketing gold. But he was oddly reluctant to have every man in the room stare at her chest, because he knew damn well they wouldn't be admiring his necklace. I'll come. I need to stretch. She bent over to retrieve her shoes, but he was on his knees in front of her before she could locate them. Allow me. He found her footwear, Jimmy Choo Cinderella shoes covered in Swarovski crystals and costing 3,500 pounds. He knew, because a former girlfriend had tried to convince him to order a pair for her. As he slipped a shoe on her right foot, he glanced up at her. Fits perfectly. They should. They're my shoes. Touché. Footwear restored, he stood and helped her to her feet. He resisted the urge to kiss her, knowing he'd be unable to stop. The bar was crowded, so he took her hand as they wove through the throng, nodding at several couples he knew. He didn't stop. He wasn't about to share cat with anyone. Glasses of champagne in hand, he turned to give one to her, only to discover she'd disappeared. She'd been beside him two seconds ago. He scanned the area but couldn't spot her. Maybe she'd returned to their seats. She'd pulled her chair back into the corner, in the dark shadows. If it wasn't for the light of her phone, he might have missed her. Everything okay? He asked as he handed her the drink. Yes, uh, thank you. I, uh... I thought I heard the bell, that the intermission was over, and didn't want to miss anything. The intermission wouldn't be over for ten minutes. Why would she lie to him? He caught her gaze, and a hint of vulnerability flashed through her eyes, accompanied by sadness at odds with the smile. He called off his private investigator, so he'd have to discover her secrets himself. Starting now. He pulled his chair next to hers. You were a dancer once, weren't you? He stared into her eyes, daring her to lie again. Never professional. My mother put me in ballet as soon as I could walk. She'd been a ballerina, on the verge of becoming a prima, before I was born. But I was a big baby and a difficult birth, and she never regained her former position. She hoped I would achieve the greatness I'd cost her. Then I developed early, and try as she might, she couldn't stop my, um, figure from... She waved her hands in front, indicating her curves. By the time I was thirteen, I weighed more than any ballerina had a right to, so she turned her attention to my younger sister, who was more petite. The recitation of her past was delivered in a monotone, no hint of emotion. Yet it soured the champagne in his mouth. How could her own mother not have seen how incredible Cat was, dancing ability or not? Do you miss dancing? No. I only did it to try and please her. 
dancing wasn't my passion, but I enjoy watching others and can appreciate the sacrifice that goes into a performance such as this. And your sister? Did she become a professional dancer? Yes. With the Bolshoi, is she performing tonight? No. And that was the answer to which question? Before he could ask, the bell sounded to signal the start of the performance. Cat moved her chair back to watch the stage, but this time she kept her shoes on and her hands firmly glued to the chair arms. They stood and clapped as the performance came to an end. While the principal dancers received their accolades, Wolf glanced at Cat. Tears streamed down her face. He found himself more moved by her show of emotion than anything he'd seen on stage. He'd bought the box because it gave him access to an exclusive clientele, but only now did the expense seem worth it, and he hadn't been awarded a single commission. Do you still want to meet the dancers? He asked as the curtain came down for a final time. Yes. If you don't want to come, I can meet you back at the hotel. She dabbed the moisture from her eyes and once more seemed in complete control. I'll stay. No way was he letting her out of his sight. Cat forced her muscles to stop quivering, and her smile to remain fixed. Wolf stood next to her, trying not to look bored. But as his eyes strayed more and more often to her chest, she was sure he'd much rather be somewhere a hell of a lot more private. That he'd do this for her meant a lot. She pushed down the need to confide in him. She hadn't told anyone about her sister's disappearance, not even Liam, who had helped her escape from Russia. So why did she want to spill her soul to Wolf? She'd already told him more about her past life than anyone. With all the Russian being spoken in the room, she had to keep her brain focused on English. It would be all too easy to slip into her native tongue and blow five years of very hard work. Faking an American accent was not easy, but she also hoped to find some clue as to her sister's whereabouts, and she may not be able to do that in English. Maybe she could ask in very bad Russian. Speaking of Russians, she searched the room for the security goon she'd seen earlier in the bar area. She doubted he'd recognize her, but even a glimpse at the face of the man who had the power to make her disappear sent a chill through her. He'd hunted her crew for years, capturing a few, but as they only knew each other by code names, his department had never been able to round up the rest of them. Maybe this was a bad idea. But if she didn't find where her sister had moved soon, Natalia would be gone too long for anyone to remember her. Short memories were a necessity in Russia. Cat glanced again at Wolf. He was so sexy in his tuxedo. It was hard not to accept the invitation in his eyes and return to the shard, to either her hotel room or his flat. She knew eventually she'd give in to the incredible chemistry between them, and as Margaret Mary suggested, Strip him naked, fling him on his back, and ride him like a bucking bronco. In the meantime, she had to reinforce the firewall around her heart, so if, or more likely when, they did get physical, her emotions stayed well clear of the action. Here come your men in tights, although it looks like they've changed, Wolf said. She wasn't interested in the male dancers, or the women for that matter. She figured she'd get more info from the backstage staff, as their position didn't require that they spout the company line so much. Besides, her sister had been a real sweetheart. She'd have endeared herself to the people behind the performance. Actually, can you excuse me for a minute? I need to use the restroom. His smile was tight, but he released her. She skirted around the back of the room, avoiding the recently arrived dancers who were acknowledging another round of applause. Cat knew from the few letters she'd received from her sister that after a three-week tour and 21 performances, they'd be exhausted and only stay a few minutes. She had to be quick. Isvana tu pajalusta, she said in mispronounced Russian as she approached one of the set designers who packed up some scenery. The man in his late fifties smiled and directed her to the ladies' room with gestures. No, I want to talk to you, Kat continued careful to keep her Russian simple. This would go a hell of a lot quicker if she just blurted out what she wanted to know. She asked the man how long he'd been with the Bolshoi. He leaned against one of the fake Corinthian columns. Five years, he answered, 
and pleased be to God, I'll have a job for another five. Did you know Natalia Smirnova? Cat held her breath as the man straightened and glanced around. Duh. A wave of relief swept through her. At last, someone who acknowledged her sister's existence. Is she okay? Is she still alive? The words rushed out, and she forgot to disguise her proficiency with the language. The man's eyes narrowed, and he turned back to his packing. Cat put her hand on his arm. Please. We were once very close. She whispered through a huge lump in her throat. She lives, as far as I know. She left many people angry. It is better for me not to speak of her. Cat kissed the man on the cheek and quickly returned to the party room. Wolf was talking with two of the female dancers. One even had her hand on his arm as she hung on his every word. He was strikingly handsome, the best-looking man in the room. She wanted to claim him as hers, but had no right. Instead, she snagged a glass of champagne and stood across from him. Within seconds, his eyes connected with hers, and he excused himself from his companions. As he approached, she once again was mesmerized. How could a simple walk across the room hypnotize her? I was about to come look for you, he said. Using the restroom in this dress is nearly impossible. I'm ready to go now if you are. She hadn't even finished the sentence before he took the champagne flute out of her hand and placed it on a passing waiter's tray. Thank God. For a minute I thought I was going to have to throw you over my shoulder and carry you out. That would have raised a few eyebrows. His arm had once more anchored her to his side as they made their way through the crowd to the exit. Sometimes expediency is more important than propriety. If one more man leered at you, I was going to hit them. She expected his possessiveness to irritate her. It didn't. Really? The only man I've noticed checking me out has been you. He followed her into the back of the luxury car and pulled her onto his lap as soon as the vehicle pulled away from the curb. Well, I was making sure none of the jewels came loose and got lost in your cleavage. I'd hate for anything to discomfort all that soft flesh. His finger traced the line of the necklace then the top of her dress, lingering on the swell of her breasts. His caress sent shivers over her skin, and liquid heat pooled between her thighs. Nope, they're all present and accounted for. Although there were a couple of hard nipples about an inch south of where his finger rested. And you'll get them back safe and sound as soon as we reach my hotel room. I look forward to that. He retraced the neckline of her dress, but this time his finger dipped just below the fabric. How long is this car ride? She asked as his lips began exploring her collarbone. Not long enough. He released her, and she moved to the opposite seat. When he was near, all she could do was feel and imagine how good it would be. But as she said last night, she still had to be able to walk away when this job was done. She'd made too many mistakes, too many sacrifices, to put it all on the line now. Too bad she couldn't download some sort of anti-lust software. Once they reached the shard, they were joined in the elevator by two other couples. Wolf had a possessive hand at her waist and glowered at one of the other men when he dared to look at Cat. He was taking this boyfriend thing way too seriously. Finally, they arrived at her room. Her hand shook as she tried to slip the keycard into the slot. So Wolf opened the door, then waited for her to enter the room first. When the door closed behind him, he leaned against it, rather than follow her. You left the boxes for your jewelry at the front desk, she said. I have plenty more. She pulled off her gloves to remove the necklace when he stopped her. Wait, allow me. Turning her back to him, she steeled herself against the brush of his fingers on her neck, as he undid the delicate clasp. But it never came. Instead, his lips touched her shoulder, and his hands grasped her waist before pulling her against him. Is this a talent of yours? Undoing necklaces with your teeth? She had a hard time catching her breath, but that could be because her corset restricted her breathing. 
You tell me. His hands slid back up her torso and lingered for a long moment on her breasts. Unfortunately, not long enough. She stifled a groan of disappointment as he released her and moved to undo the necklace. Rather than the heavy gemstone slipping free, the zipper on her dress slid south. His lips returned to her shoulder, and she shivered, but not from cold. The man had serious skills. The silk dress fell to the floor, puddling around her ankles. Wolf released her and moved to stand in front. He stared at her so long she had to fight the urge to cover herself. Had he really never seen a woman in a corset and stockings before? Are you okay? He closed his eyes for a second, and when he opened them again, they blazed with passion. I've never seen anything more beautiful. You have to keep the jewels. No other woman will ever do them justice. Her heart squeezed tight. And what will you get in return? Nothing, except seeing you like this. I don't believe you. Men always want something. Then you've known the wrong men. I don't pay women to sleep with me, and I'm sure as hell not trying to tie you down. He stepped around her and moved to the door. With his hand on the doorknob, he turned. When you stop hiding behind your past, Cat, and are ready to embrace the moment, let me know. As the door clicked closed behind him, she flung herself on the bed. She was such a coward. No risk, no gain. If she hadn't fought for her future, she'd be dead or in prison now. Was it time for another gamble? Chapter 6 Wolf wiped his damp forehead with his sleeve. He'd been in the production room since six that morning. After another sleepless night, exhaustion bordered on delirium, but he was determined to finish this prototype. he just completed one of the delicate silver filigrees when his phone rang. He thought of ignoring it, but saw Kat's name on the collar display. The image of her in her sexy black corset, stockings, and his jewels would be forever etched in his brain. The necklace had been the first of his family's gems that he'd reset, and it had been collateral on the bank loan that had launched his company. His empire started with those sapphires and diamonds— and he'd offered them to her. As soon as the words had left his mouth, he'd known it was too much, too fast. What kind of spell had she put on him? He'd left before he did or said anything else stupid. Yes. He answered on the fifth ring, tone harsh. Silence greeted him. The pause on the other end was long. I need to see you, Cat finally said. He closed his eyes and wiped his brow again. I'm working. I found something. The elation he expected never even flicked to life. If she solved the puzzle of who sabotaged his company, she'd leave, and he'd never know what could have been. It would be better to get this over with and get back to what was really important, the Royal Commission. Where are you? Reception. He didn't ask how she gained access to his floor during non-office hours, another security issue he needed to address. I'll come and get you. She waited in the front office, wearing a black dress with a gold zipper that ran from between her breasts to the hem. How easy it would be to slide the fastener down and reveal her body. And they'd be right back to where they parted last night. Hi, she said. For the first time since he'd met her, her gaze skittered from his. Her dress was a little fancy for a Saturday. Are you going someplace? Just here? He led her through the series of locked doors to the production room. The silver he'd been working with earlier should be hard enough now to attempt the second strand. You didn't need to dress up. You could have worn jeans and a t-shirt. I'm not a jeans and t-shirt kind of girl. Understatement of the year. Why? She stopped walking. Are you complaining about what I'm wearing? No. I only want to know why. Is it another piece of your past invading your present? Her eyes narrowed and her chin lifted. She resumed walking, and he gave up expecting an answer. They entered the production room, and she looked around before perching on an empty workbench. 
all the precious stones and metals were locked away in clearly marked drawers, not that she made any attempt to open them. I was fourteen, when my mother left and my father got lost at the bottom of a bottle. She paused and cleared her throat before continuing. After Dad stopped paying the rent, I ended up on the street. I pretended to be a boy, which wasn't easy with a body like mine. I promised myself that as soon as I was safe, I would embrace my womanhood and never hide again in boys' clothes. She smoothed a hand down her thigh, and when her eyes met his, they were clouded, her usual cocky smile absent. His chest tightened, and the coffee he'd had earlier roiled in his stomach. He may not have had parental love, but at least he'd always had a roof over his head. Cat once again amazed him. The flicker of emotion he'd experienced when she'd spoken of her family before became a steady flame. He moved in front of her and put a hand on her cheek. She didn't soften or slide her arms around him. Her defensive walls were solidly built. If he attempted to scale them, would the reward be worth it? Or would she shoot him for his impertinence? From the glare she gave him, he needed to tread carefully. No matter what you wear, you'll always be a woman. I only wanted you to be comfortable. I am. The scent of her sensual perfume surrounded him, and he forced himself to step back. Despite his desire, he wouldn't be one of those men who exploited her. She jumped off the bench and moved over to where he'd been working. Is this real? She picked up the replica of the Crown Prince's bicolor sapphire. The tear-shaped gem was mauve at the bottom, then ranged through shades of blue until it was navy at the tip. It was an exquisite jewel, and the one he was most excited about setting. When you showed me the design drawing, I thought you'd exaggerated the color variation. This is a paste copy, but entirely accurate. The Ajmani royal family has the original. It's spectacular. Almost magical. She caressed the stone once more, before returning it to the black cloth. He'd had a similar response when he'd first seen it. The cat's reaction surprised him. She'd never shown any interest in gems before. He cleared his throat. You said you found something. He moved back to the filigree he'd made earlier and relit the burner to melt more silver. Work was his distraction, and God did he need it now. Cat's confession that she'd lived on the street shook him more than he cared to analyze. The need to wrap his arms around her and promise to keep her safe from now on nearly overwhelmed him. Yes, another piece of malicious code, this time in the payroll program. The thing is, I checked that software the other day, so whoever installed it did it yesterday or early this morning, and the code's different from the first, a different language, different style. I can't decide if it's the same program or trying something new, or someone else entirely. He stopped pouring the liquid metal before he burned himself. What did the malware do? Paid some people twice, and others not at all. It was random, like the accounting one. This one deleted payment from anyone with the letter P in their name or address. Who got double pay? Anyone with an H in their name. He ran both hands over his face. Any idea who uploaded it? No, but I've locked down all the systems so no one can access the network remotely. That's why I need a hardline connection. There's a terminal in here. He showed her to the computer access point. Great. She connected her laptop to the network, and within minutes, it was as though he didn't exist. The tap of her fingers on the keyboard was the only sound in the room. He pulled out a tray of fake rubies they used for prototypes. They both worked in silence for almost an hour. Until a tone sounded from his mobile. Shit. What's wrong? She had her bottom lip between her teeth and it took a moment for her eyes to focus on him. Someone's coming this way. My phone lets me know when the doors are accessed to this restricted area. We've got about 30 seconds. And if they see my computer connected to the network, the game's up. He nodded. Do you trust me? Did he? He nodded anyway. Pass me two of those rubies. She pointed at the paste gems. He handed her the stones, but looked at her laptop. Shouldn't you put that away? It's running something. I can't shut it down. Don't worry. Whoever is coming won't notice it. She pulled a scarf from her bag and handed it to him. What? Turn around. 
He did, reluctantly. Then cool silk slid over his eyes as she tied a blindfold around his head. The sound of a zipper filled the air. Cat's dress? Dear God, was she taking off her clothes? What now? Wolf whispered as the whir of the door unlocking sounded through the quiet room. Come on, blind miner. You've got two rubies left to find. Cat's raised voice, husky like they'd been making love for hours, set his heart pounding. He moved over to where he'd last seen her. His hands reached out and met warm, silky bare flesh. Bloody hell. Resisting the urge to pull off the blindfold, he slid his hands upward and encountered a band of lace. She was killing him. God. Her name was pulled from deep within him. Her rib cage expanded, and he slid his hands higher to cup her breasts, covered by a bit of lace in the middle, but at the sides it was smooth skin. A hard lump on either side, where Cat's nipples should be, prevented him from touching the real treasure. Through the pounding of his heartbeat in his ears, he heard the door slowly creak open. Cat's purr of arousal sent blood rushing to his groin. Well done. But remember, you have to remove the stones with your tongue. Is someone here? He whispered against her ear, deliberately aiming for her neck and not her chest. As much as this game riveted him, he wasn't about to perform for an audience. Her hand snaked into his hair and her lips pressed against his temple. The doors open a crack. Someone's watching, but they haven't come in. It took a second for her words to make sense to him, especially when her lips trailed across his cheek and rested against his own. Her tongue swept over his bottom lip, and the flood of passion broke through the levee of his restraint. He plundered her mouth while his fingers slid beneath the lace of her bra to extract the fake rubies that stopped him from caressing her nipples. He tossed them onto the table beside her and resumed his exploration. Cat wrenched her mouth from his with a low moan. You lose, she said, her voice breathy, sending even more heat to his groin. Damn it, jeans were worse than suit trousers. You forgot to use your tongue. My turn now. She pushed lightly against his chest, and he removed the blindfold. And blinked. It could be the sudden light, or the most erotic sight he'd ever seen, but his brain refused to believe what his eyes were seeing. Cat leaned back, her arms braced behind her on the workbench, her skin flushed with desire. She wore a black bra, with two small lace triangles over her areolas, and a lace band underneath. The whole thing was held together with small black strings. Matching panties and a suspender belt that held up sheer stockings completed the outfit. Except for the sexy shoes, black with the same gold zipper that had been on her dress. From the corner of his eye, he could see her clothes draped over her laptop. I didn't finish the game, he said. Too bad. You knew the rules. You can locate with your hands, but you have to remove the gems with your tongue. What kind of miner are you anyway? My turn. You hide three stones, and I'll wear the blindfold. The door pushed open, finally, and Harry entered, his eyes never leaving Cat, who was still perched on the bench. I seem to be interrupting something. Wolf quickly unbuttoned his shirt and handed it to Cat. They needed to keep Harry distracted from seeing Cat's laptop, but that didn't mean he could have a free peep show. What do you want, Harry? He didn't need to feign annoyance. Cat had pulled on his shirt, somehow managing to look even sexier. Harry had to clear his throat before he could speak. The network is down. I tried to access a marketing report from home, but couldn't, and email doesn't work either. I came to see if I could fix the problem. I saw from the security panel that someone was in here and thought I'd better check to make sure we weren't being robbed. The only thing Wolf was being robbed of at the moment was his sanity. Why don't you two check the computer equipment while I get dressed? Cat said. Not even in the same galaxy of what he wanted to do. No one except Wolf is allowed alone in the production room, Harry said. Cat's eyes widened slightly when he glanced at her. She obviously needed time to restart the servers before Harry got to them. I'll make an exception this time. 
Besides, I'll frisk her thoroughly to make sure she hasn't stolen anything, Wolf said. I bet you will, Harry replied under his breath. Wolf moved between his chief operating officer and his cybersecurity expert, forcing the other man's eyes off the semi-naked woman who had just blown half of Wolf's internal circuits. Come on, let's get the computers back online so we can both get back to work. As for marketing, last night I had a brilliant idea for a new advertising campaign. Women wearing sexy lingerie and our jewels. Isn't that a bit tacky? Our brand has always been upmarket. Harry replied. It won't be tacky if done right. Trust me. He pushed Harry out the door and turned back to Cat. I'll be back in ten minutes, darling, he said. She nodded, then pulled off his shirt and tossed it to him. You'll need this. What he needed was for Harry to disappear so he could finish what Cat had started. As soon as the men left... Cat pulled her dress back on and restarted the servers with her new monitoring software installed. The email server would take the longest to reboot. She just prayed Wolf could distract Harry for the ten minutes he'd said. As she watched the status bar go from red to orange to green, she tried to calm her racing heart. That makeout session with Wolf had been intense. If Harry hadn't been on the other side of the door, she'd be fulfilling Margaret Mary's request about now. But then if Harry hadn't been there, they wouldn't have started. Yeah, right. They were too explosive together to keep this bottled up much longer. Wolf had awakened a longing she'd not experienced before, and she wouldn't be satisfied until... Until what? Until he broke her heart? Because as intense as the physical attraction, she craved a deeper emotional connection. Boje moi! She'd even told him about living on the streets! No way would he want to do more than bang her now. That he'd only want a temporary fling should comfort her. At least she wouldn't have to lie about not wanting to get married or have kids. Anyway, she had her sister to find and possibly rescue, and a nest egg to build up, so she never had to worry about living rough again. And she had to be ready to ditch Cat Smith and become someone else if necessary. No way could she do that with a man attached to her, especially a man like Wolf, who was determined to be famous. The ache in her chest intensified. She took a moment to survey the room. Without Wolf in it, it seemed larger. Small drawers covered one wall marked with labels like sapphires, emeralds, diamonds, rubies, and size ranges. Five tables held Bunsen burners, mats, and a variety of tools, all set with precision on a small black cloth. Then she noticed the camera. Set above the door, it would have caught everything she'd done since she entered. Wolf's phone pinged with the same noise it had earlier, alerting her to his imminent return. In case he still had Harry with him, she put her laptop back in her bag and pretended to be reading something on her phone. Innocent. Only the dampness between her thighs evidence of their earlier activities. That and a recording somewhere. The door opened and Wolf's head appeared. All okay? He asked, striding into the room. Yeah, got it all up and running in time, but I think we may have a problem. She pointed to the camera. Shit, I forgot about that. Although it would finally make for some interesting viewing. I have it only in the event that gems go missing. There's a couple million dollars in inventory in there. He nodded toward the wall of many drawers. Really? She'd been so close to a fortune in precious stones. Not that she'd help herself. The toes of his shoes butted against hers. His gaze caressed her face, and the heat of his body heightened the smell of his cologne. He'd done up a few of the buttons on his white shirt, but hadn't tucked it in, probably because something else had been taking up all the room earlier. A smattering of dark hair poked out from his open collar. You've been alone for ten minutes with all these jewels. You could have secreted a fortune away since I've been gone. Well, maybe you'd better check your video then. She picked up her gloves from beside her on the desk, but Wolf's strong hand circled her wrist before she could pull them on. You started something. It was to distract Harry, just like the kiss in your office that first day. He took the gloves from her limp fingers, then threaded both his hands into her hair. She licked her lips, and his gaze fixated on the movement. You keep telling yourself that, darling. 
This may have started as a game, but it's become much more, and neither of us are going to sleep until we get this sorted. His lips caressed hers, but even though she opened her mouth, he didn't sweep inside. Instead, he kissed his way over to her ear, tugging gently on her lobe. His tongue traced the outside, and she couldn't hold back her moan. One of her hands buried in his hair, fingering the silky strands and holding him to her. The other had sneaked under his shirt to trace the contours of his back muscles. "'We're still on camera,' she said, as he nipped down her neck and across her collarbone. The zipper on her dress slid down to her navel. He nuzzled under her jaw, and the sigh he released sent hot air straight down her cleavage. "'And I have work to do. Meet me in my flat for dinner at seven. "'Is that an invite or a command?' She zipped her dress up as Wolf stepped back. Whatever it takes to get you there. Tilting her head to one side, she pulled on her gloves. Maybe if you got down on your knees. The only way she could describe his smile was wolfish. I guarantee you that at some point in the night, I'll be on my knees. But I won't be the one begging. A bead of sweat slid down her spine and a series of Russian expletives percolated through her brain. Wanting him was one thing. Falling in love with him? Out of the question. She may just have coded a program that could destroy her. Chapter 7 Kat swirled the red wine in her glass as she admired the view from Wolf's apartment. The sun was setting, lending a golden hue to the glass buildings of Docklands. The scene of seduction was well set, Candles fluttered as she walked by, the haunting lyrics of the Phantom of the Opera the perfect backdrop to the sound of sizzling steaks being grilled by Wolf. The meat-laden meal was just what she wanted. Being refined was tiring, requiring constant thought about what to say and do. With little left to hide from Wolf, she could just be herself. Well, as herself as she could possibly be and still maintain her disguise. After leaving his offices that afternoon... She'd searched the Russian Land Registry database again for any property owned or rented by her sister and come up blank. Where would her sister go? The St. Petersburg apartment had been depressing, so it was unlikely she'd return there. The only place that held any happy memories was the Dacha they'd visited as a family. It had belonged to a neighbor who had let them use it one summer when she'd been too ill to travel. The break from the city, the noise, and pollution had been like a trip to heaven for thirteen-year-old Cat, and her last fond memory of family life. Mother had decided by then that Cat would never be a dancer, so she'd stopped insisting that Cat wear the wrapping to try and stunt the growth of her breasts. Her father had stayed sober for the whole two weeks, and Natalia had been released from ten hours a day practices to join Cat in a little fishing, berry picking, and mushroom hunting. They'd been happy. That's where Cat would have gone. Did her sister remember? Nothing else could be done remotely. She had to travel to Russia next week. If she could piggyback on Wolf's trip, she could go as his companion. If she went alone, she was much more likely to be scrutinized, questioned about the purpose of her visit. If they discovered she was the infamous hacker Pantera, they'd never let her leave. Her skill set was something the Russian government, or even organized crime, loved to exploit. However... As the bimbo girlfriend of a notorious playboy billionaire, they probably wouldn't pay any attention to her. She prayed that her identity would withstand scrutiny when she applied for a visa, and she could maintain her American accent. She'd already flubbed when talking to the set dresser at the theater. Kat ran a damp palm down her dress. She thought of changing into something more casual to match the jeans and shirt Wolf wore, although on him, it was as sexy as his suit. She'd always admired a man in great tailoring, but Denham defined his assets better, especially when he bent over to get something out of the bottom drawer. Her plan to dress casual had changed, however, when she'd received a text from him this afternoon that he had unfinished business with what she'd had on earlier. She wandered back into the kitchen. Are you sure I can't help? No, I've got it. He plated two large steaks, a selection of mushrooms, and the biggest baked potatoes she'd ever seen. Wolf didn't rush the meal. They ate at his dining table, with London laid out before them. 
I didn't know you could cook. I don't often, and you're the first woman I've cooked for in years. So that's why none of my previous girlfriends have raved about my culinary skills on their social media accounts. Who taught you? Didn't that big house where you grew up have staff? It did. After I left school, I traveled a lot, and I had to fend for myself. I learned on the road. Visiting mining operations. That must have been a real eye-opener, seeing how the other 98% lived. I may have been born into a wealthy family, but that doesn't mean I was ignorant. It's not all whiskey and cigars at the top, you know. She took a sip of her wine. How far should she go? She already liked him. If she knew more about what made him tick, she could be in danger of falling for him. But had any woman ever taken the time to get to know the real Remington Wolf? She wanted at least to be different from all those who came before. And after. Tell me about it. About what? Growing up. You know my story. Well, bits of it anyway. You should reciprocate. Why? Besides, I thought you knew all about my past. He stabbed his steak with enough force to break a lesser-made plate. I know when you were born and where. I know you went to boarding school at the age of five, and that your parents died in an avalanche in Austria six days shy of your 17th birthday. You've been on your own since then. But none of that tells me about your hopes and dreams, fears and disappointments. How exactly will this information help you clear the bad code from my computers? She put her knife and fork down, ready to push away from the table. It won't. If you want me to be your cybersecurity expert, then that's fine. But if you want any other sort of relationship between us, I need to know more. A muscle flexed in his jaw, and he took so long to answer she took her napkin off her lap and placed it on the table next to her wine glass. Less than twenty-four hours after I was born, my mother thrust me into the arms of a Filipino nanny who had only been in the country for two days. Mother then went off to a spa for a month to recover. My father celebrated my birth by parting in the south of France for six weeks. My parents were shadows in my early life, returning home only occasionally between parties for photo ops with the air. I thought Louisa, the nanny, was my mother, until I turned five, and I was wrenched from her arms and sent off to boarding school. After that, I saw my parents even less. When they died, it didn't bother me in the slightest. They'd never been anything other than names on a document to me. She put her hand on his on the table, wanting to share the inner peace that only he made her feel. His family had been even colder than her own. At least she had a few happy memories. How did you get into jewelry design? He seemed to relax a bit now that the discussion had veered from his parents to his career. The wolves had been collecting gemstones for centuries. One ancestor owned several mines in Africa. They fascinated me. So I went to the sources. I visited various countries and learned about precious stones from the ground up. Then I began resetting the jewels of my family's pieces. I enjoyed it so much, I formed my own company, and the rest, as they say, is history. She drained her wine glass. And the future? Where is Remington Wolf in ten years? He is the best jewelry designer the world has seen in centuries. Royalty and the world's elite commission him to produce pieces that will be admired well after he's turned to dust. The reminder of his ambition was a slap to her heart. So much for keeping that organ out of the game. She pushed away from the table and stood. And personally? Does he have a wife and children to come home to after a long day dealing with people who have more money than many countries? No. No family. Wolf stood too. His hand grabbed her wrist before she could move away. But that doesn't mean he can't enjoy female companionship when the opportunity presents itself. I am not sure I want to be an opportunity. With his fingers caressing her arm, she couldn't exactly say at this moment what she wanted to be. His hand slid into her hair. The other rested on her waist as he moved closer to her. How about a delightful interlude? The words were whispered against her ear just before he traced the contours of her lobe with his tongue. Oh, je moi, the man was good. I've never been called delightful before. You are. 
and sexy, intelligent, and damn annoying. The hand at her waist slid upward until it connected with the zipper tab between her breasts. He eased one finger inside her bra and caressed her already hard nipple. There was no halting the passion flowing through her veins. Her voice was already breathless when she asked, What time is it, Mr. Wolf? Dessert time. Wolf pushed the zipper on her dress down until he encountered the lace to her panties. I have chocolate-dipped strawberries and champagne in the fridge, but first I'm going to sample your sweetness. And if I say no? Disappointment flooded through him until her fingers rubbed against his chest as she undid the buttons of his shirt. Then I step away. I never force a woman. But my death will be on your conscience. If I'm not inside you within the next half hour, I may not make it. The sigh she released went straight down his shirt. I won't be responsible for the death of the greatest jewelry designer the world has ever known. Take me to bed, Wolf. He slid the fabric from her shoulders and the dress fell to the floor. Gone was the sexy black lingerie she'd had on earlier, replaced by a burgundy set that was no less enticing. We're not going to make it to the bedroom until much, much later. They may not make it out of the dining room. Had it been foresight or desperation that it had him slipping a condom into his pocket earlier? Unless you want a steak knife in your back, I suggest that we at least move into the living room. She said, seconds before she spun on her heel and exited the room. God. He grabbed her arm and swung her against him. Her soft breasts were crushed to his chest as he kissed her. But rather than rush the moment, he let his senses savor the taste and feel of her. Her moan of arousal as he moved his lips across her jaw erased all other thoughts from his mind. Her right lobe was next on the menu. He'd never known a woman to have such sensuous ears. His tongue flicked out to trace it, and Cat shivered in his arms. She was so responsive. If his hands weren't investigating the curve of her arse, pulling her up and into his erection, he'd have clapped them in delight. You mentioned something about going down on your knees, she said. Greedy thing, aren't you? But I haven't finished with the top half yet. He released the hooks on her bra and moved back to let the scrap of silk and lace flutter to the floor. The breath he'd just drawn in left him in a whoosh. God, you're magnificent. His gaze held hers as his hands explored the bounty before him. The blaze of desire in her eyes strengthened his resolve to make this spectacular for her. You know, you've seen me in my underwear four times now and the best I've gotten is a brief glimpse of your chest. He glanced up from where his tongue was flicking her nipples. Much more pressure in his trousers, and he'd have the world's largest diamond in his pants. Whose fault is that? You think precious stones sit on the surface waiting to be discovered. You have to go find the treasure. Her husky laugh spiked his blood pressure. Don't I need to stake a claim first? but her hands were already on his belt. Standing was not going to be a viable option much longer. He picked her up, her thighs straddling his as she worked his belt free from his trousers. His shins connected with something hard. Who the hell thought to put a coffee table in front of the sofa? He managed not to drop her, and once she was safely seated, he sank to his knees between her legs. Anything you find is all yours. My turn first, though, so sit back. And let me rock your world. Well, you are the host. It would be rude of me to argue who gets to go first. She spread her arms along the back of the sofa, then lifted her hips so he could remove her panties and garter belt, leaving only her stockings and stilettos. Cat held nothing back, bearing herself to his gaze and touch. Her willingness to be vulnerable, open herself to him, triggered a need to protect as well as pleasure. Sex before had always been about physical desire and, occasionally, conquering. This was the first time he'd also wanted to cherish, give of himself, as well as take. He started at the sensitive skin under her ear 
and made his way down her body, nipping and licking, until she writhed beneath him. Having fun? he asked as he arrived at her core. Please? She ended on a moan as his tongue flicked her bud. Forget chocolate-covered strawberries. This was the real dessert. I did say they'd be begging. Want me to stop? Don't. You. Dare. Seconds later, she screamed his name as she climaxed. Remington. Not Wolf. The intimacy of using his first name gouged a channel into the armor protecting his heart. As the tremors lessened, he sat back on his heels. She raised her eyelids. A wicked smile created a dimple in her cheek. If the lick of her lips was anything to go by, he was in for a world of payback. Bring it. Is it my turn now? She asked. He stood, and she grabbed his trousers and briefs and pulled them down his thighs. His erection sprang free, like a prisoner finally released after a lifetime internment. What chance did he have of lasting more than two minutes? She stood before him in only her stockings and heels, her eyes fixated on his cock. Two minutes may be an exaggeration. Are you going to do more than look? She pushed on his chest with one finger, and he took her place on the sofa. A moan escaped him as she used the drop of pre-cum at the tip of his cock and with one finger circled the head. Her breasts dangled down in front of his face, but he knew if he touched them, he'd come, and he wanted to be inside her when that happened. Today is your lucky day, she said, in the understatement of the decade. Two of her fingers were now stroking either side of his rigid erection. Because I am greedy, and I want you inside me. There's a condom in my trouser pocket, he said. Her whole hand grasped him, now sliding up and down in a sensuous torture. She sank to her knees, not releasing him, and reached behind her to grab his jeans. She pulled out three connected condom packets and held them up. Presumptuous much? Boy Scout. The ripping of a foil packet had never sounded so welcome. Before she sheathed him, however, her tongue made a slow tour around his rigid erection. He groaned and clenched the sofa cushion to stop from rocking fully into her mouth. You said you wanted me inside you. As much as he'd love for her to continue, he wanted to sink into her tight pussy and lose his mind there. Hmm, I like this, too. But she took pity on him and rolled the condom on before straddling him. Rather than take him inside her, she circled his cock around her opening, pressing, then moving away. His sanity left, taking his restraint with it, I thought patience wasn't one of your virtues. Cat's smile only got bigger. It's been a while for me. I'm savoring. How long? He focused on her eyes, glazed with passion. Two years, at least. She circled him again at her entrance, rubbing him against her clit. They both moaned. I promise you, we will do this a half dozen more times tonight. You can save her later. He grabbed her breasts and sucked hard on one nipple, while his finger and thumb rolled the other. She sank down on him at last. Encased in her tight, hot core, he gave himself over to the sensation. Cat lifted herself up on her knees and plunged back down. Her hands were on his shoulders, her head thrown back, her breasts bouncing in front of his face as she lowered and raised herself on him. He attempted to control the tempo with his hands on her hips, but that, too, was a lost cause. He came with a snap of tension that winded him. Still, she rode him, adjusting the angle of her hips, so he rubbed against different parts of her. With a long shudder, she orgasmed again, tightening around him in waves. Astonishment and euphoria consumed him, as he climaxed for a second time. Bloody hell! She collapsed against him, her sweat-slicked skin sliding against his, her breasts crushed to his chest. 
He buried his face in her neck, breathing in her scent, heightened now by sex. His tongue sneaked out and licked some of the salt from her skin. Apocalyptic. That was the only word he could think of to describe what had happened between them. It was almost too good. When their heart rates had finally returned to semi-normal, Cat raised her flushed face, a huge smile crinkling her eyes. My God, I've just made love with Remington Steele. He closed his eyes. Her laughter caused her body to contract around him. Well, if a woman was going to laugh at you, this was the position to be in. I thought you'd forgotten about that. The armor around his heart took another hit. She kissed him, her teeth nibbling his lower lip until he opened his eyes again. Flushed from their lovemaking, her face alight with laughter. She was so beautiful. Nope, that's an epic name. Now will you tell me the story? If you promise never to use my middle name in public or when you have clothes on, he added as her breasts rubbed down his chest, rekindling the fire that had barely died down. Are you really in a position to negotiate? She lifted herself slightly, and he grabbed her hips to reseat her. He wasn't ready to leave the heaven of her body yet. Do you want to hear the story or not? Okay. I promise. Maybe he could distract her while he talked so she didn't remember. Moving his hands from her waist to her breasts, he rubbed his thumbs over her nipples. I told you that right after I was born, my mother dropped me off with the nanny and then left. She nodded and took a deep breath in, pushing her breasts more firmly into his hands. The nanny named you? Sort of. It was approaching the deadline to register me, and so my parents sent her a document authorizing her to do it on their behalf. They'd already chosen Remington, as it's an old family name. She added the steel to match her favorite TV show, and thus it became my name. He flicked her nipple with his tongue, hoping that would end the conversation. I love that show, too. He raised an eyebrow. She was way too young to remember it. It's on one of those golden oldie channels when I'm working through the night. Are you calling me old? Never. And for the record, you are way hotter than Pierce Brosnan, even in his prime. You have just redeemed yourself. He buried his face in her breasts again. Odds were he'd never get enough of them. At least not in the short time they had together. Does that mean I can have the strawberries and champagne now? She shifted on him again, and once more his cock flicked to life. Ever had a champagne shower? No. Sounds messy. Which is why we have to do it in the bathtub. You grab the wine and berries, and I'll meet you in the ensuite to my bedroom. She lifted off him, and he closed his eyes at the sensation of sliding out of her body. Thank God he'd finished the prototype necklace for the bicolor sapphire this afternoon. For the next thirty-six hours, he had nothing to do except cat. Time to get busy. Chapter 8 Cat pushed her hair out of her face and tried to see over Wolf's shoulder to catch the time on the bedside clock. The champagne shower with a Hunt the Strawberry mini-game had been followed by regular shower sex, then drying off sex, before they finally made it to the bedroom where Wolf spent an entire hour discovering every pleasure point she had. Despite her daily workouts, she ached in places she didn't know she had muscles, not to mention the stubble burn on her inner thighs. Next time she'd insist he shave before sex. Then his body shifted against hers, and she didn't care if his cheeks were smooth or not. She just wanted him. But as addictive as he was, she had to keep in mind that this was only temporary. Even if she didn't have her past and identity issues, Wolf was ambitious, and she'd always come in second place to his career. No way in hell she would settle for that. Easing away from his heat, she'd almost reached the edge of the bed when his hand grabbed her arm. Where are you going? At least that's what she thought, he said, 
his face was buried in a pillow. Back to my hotel room. Or she would if her body listened to her brain. He raised his head. His eyes were barely open, but they blazed as his gaze caressed her naked chest. Why? I don't do sleepovers. Or awkward mornings where she had to pretend indifference when her heart wanted commitment. Make an exception. I... Stay. Please, Cat. I want to hold you through the night and wake next to you in the morning. Damn. Why did he have to sound so sincere? I think it's already morning. It was a token protest. She snuggled back beside him, her head on his chest. Both his arms came around her, anchoring her body to his. A huge yawn contorted her face. A few more hours wouldn't hurt. Wind whipped rain against the windows. The storm that had been brewing last night had finally hit. She waited for the tension that normally seized her muscles to come. It didn't. Bad weather always reminded her of the first few weeks she'd lived on the streets, sheltering in doorways and under bridges, trying to find some protection from the elements. The sting of sleet as it pelted her skin and the cruel bite of cold, so deep it burned right to her bones. For the first time in over a decade, held against Wolf's broad chest, she felt safe, protected, cherished. The next time she woke, she was alone. Rain still pelted the glass, and not even the triple glazing could muffle the sound of the wind whistling past the building. She pulled the blanket higher on her shoulders and looked around the room. Wolf sat on a chair at the foot of the bed, his lips a tight line, his eyes narrowed. If he hadn't wanted her to stay, he should have let her go when she'd woken at five. Her eyes darted to the clock. 11 a.m. You're Russian, not American. His tone was flat, unemotional. Her stomach roiled. Could she bluff her way out? Why do you say that? She pushed her hair off her face and sat up, the blankets clutched to her chest. You talk in your sleep. Her sister had often complained about Cat keeping her awake with a running monologue. Evidently, she hadn't outgrown it. So I speak Russian. I also speak Spanish. I don't recall you ever asking about my linguistic abilities. She held her breath. I know what Russian sounds like when spoken by a native. He abandoned the chair and sat next to her on the bed. The mattress dipped, but she managed to stop from rolling into him. Why did you lie to me? She shrugged. I lie to everyone. Her eyes darted around the room. Her clothes were probably still in the living room where they'd first made love. I want a straight answer, Cat. Why did you lie about your nationality? She hugged the blankets closer to her. It's safer. Are you in danger? Not as long as everyone believes I'm an American named Cat Smith. Are you wanted in Russia? He ran a hand through his hair, and from the state of it, it wasn't the first time he'd done that this morning. Technically, but there's no warrant for my arrest or anything, so you don't have to worry about Interpol knocking on your door. So why pretend to be American? She pulled in a deep breath, trying to calm her racing heart. Was it pounding because she'd been discovered, or Wolf's nearness? Cat Smith is American. She has an American birth certificate, went to school in Florida, has a U.S. passport. Did you assume some other woman's identity? No. She's entirely fictional. Well, the Cat Smith that I created is. I'm sure there are some legitimate ones around. For Christ's sake, Cat. Just tell me your story. I won't divulge anything you say to anyone, ever. I've already told you more than I should. His hand slid into her hair, and his thumb ran over her cheek. I need to know. Why? We're temporary colleagues who are playing at a relationship. What difference does it make? We stopped playing the moment you kissed me in my office. That was part of the game. It may have started as a game, but our mutual response wiped all the cards off the table. All these mixed metaphors were too much to handle on a few hours' sleep, while she was naked in his bed. Even if we stopped playing, it's a temporary thing, a delightful interlude, remember? Remember?
Ten days from now, I'll be on a plane back to San Francisco. And you'll be heading to the UAE to collect all those amazing jewels the Crown Prince has been hoarding. Maybe reminding him of his ambition would divert his attention from her past. He was too smart for that. I was misled once before by a woman, and it almost destroyed my company. Either you come clean about your past, or this ends now. My past does not jeopardize your company. I'll be the judge of that. And if I choose to end this now? Except she couldn't, because she had to get to Russia to find her sister. Could she tell him just enough to appease him, and still keep some of her secrets? Then send me your invoice, and I'll find someone else to finish the job. He called her bluff. Okay. I'll tell you. But not here. Give me ten minutes to dress, and I'll meet you in the kitchen. Any chance you'll have coffee ready? He pulled a pink dress shirt out of his closet and tossed it on the bed. You can wear that. You've got five minutes, and I've made waffles to go with the coffee. Breakfast. And an interrogation. How nice. Wolf flipped the waffle maker lid up carefully extracted the fluffy golden circle, and added it to the pile. After the calories he'd burned last night, a full English breakfast would have been more appropriate. But the way his stomach churned, he didn't figure he'd be able to keep something that heavy down. Last night had been the greatest sexual experience of his life. Though he'd had many that were fantastic, Cat was not only incredibly sensual, she was able to laugh at herself, and him too. She was adventurous. And best of all, she didn't want to talk everything to death. Now he knew why. Because it was so much easier to keep track of the lies when you didn't say much. When he'd stopped her from leaving in the night, his plan had been to wake her with breakfast in bed and then spend most of the day there, with maybe an excursion to the shower. Her husky laugh had woken him at eight, and he'd been about to put his idea into action when her sleep-filled voice had stopped him. He hadn't understood anything she said. But he knew she'd been lying about where she'd come from. It had niggled him from the start. And although he'd called off his private investigator once Cat discovered he'd had her checked out, the initial report had come through. Yes, she had a Florida birth certificate and electronic school records. But when his P.I. had spoken to people she'd allegedly gone to school with or lived next to in her early teens, no one remembered her. It wasn't unheard of for someone to be forgotten, but he couldn't believe that no one remembered her. Now he knew why. It was all a sham. What else had she lied about? Was it going to impact his bid to win the Ajmani contract? The tightness in his chest was from the potential loss of the competition. Wasn't it? Or was the cause the anguish in Cat's eyes when he threatened to end their association? It was an empty threat. His heart rejected the idea entirely, and that had nothing on the argument his body put forward. He was pouring more batter into the waffle iron when the sound of Cat's bare feet on the wood floor alerted him to her arrival. Closing the lid, he glanced up. He'd made a colossal mistake. Wearing his shirt, and only his shirt, she was as sexy as he'd ever seen her, except when she'd worn the corset and jewels after the ballet, but she also looked tiny, vulnerable, lost, perfect. She perched on a bar stool on the other side of the counter, her hair was disheveled, her face free of makeup, and she bit her bottom lip provocatively. Stay on target, Wolf. What do you have in your coffee? Just black. He poured her a cup and then pointed at the stack of waffles. Making them kept his hands busy and off cat. No way would they get through the ten he'd made. Next to the pile was a bowl of whipped cream, more strawberries, some chocolate sauce, and maple syrup. He'd originally envisaged a much different breakfast setting, one that would have him throwing out his bedsheets. That was unlikely to happen now. His body protested the change in plans. She put a waffle on her plate, then added a few strawberries and a drizzle of maple syrup. But she played with the utensils rather than digging in. Aren't you eating? She asked after the first forkful. I've lost my appetite. For waffles. Would you, please, do up the damn buttons on that shirt? She'd only done up three, and when she leaned forward to grab a few more strawberries, he had a clear view of her naked breasts, her nipples pebbled. 
he sure as hell was sporting a massive heart on with her within arm's reach. She stood on the barstool's footrest, leaned forward so he got an eyeful, then slowly slid another button into its hole. At the bottom of the shirt. She didn't play fair. Then again, he told her they were no longer playing. I assume you were born in St. Petersburg, Russia. It was called Leningrad when I was born, but yes. And what you've told me about your father, being an alcoholic, and your mother taking your sister and leaving so she could become a great ballerina. All true. My sister used to dance with the Bolshoi. That's why I was so excited to see them. I'd hoped she'd still be part of the company, even if she wasn't a principal dancer any longer. When was the last time you saw your sister? Six years ago. She stared at her coffee, then finally took a sip. A tear escaped her right eye, but she brushed it away. He ached to comfort her, wrap her in his arms and promise her forever. But he couldn't. If he was to get any more information from her, he'd better steer clear of her family. For now. When did you move to America? Five years ago. That's when I became Cat Smith. What's your real name? She hesitated. Katya Grigorievna Smirnova. Her eyes met his, and for a second he saw her fear. The instinct to protect surged through him. He reached across and put a hand on hers. I will never tell anyone. Thank you, or should I say spasiba. Let's stick to English. He drained the last of his coffee, wishing he'd added a shot of whiskey. What are you wanted for in Russia? She took a long drink from her cup. Was she thinking up a good lie? I had this boyfriend who was head of a criminal gang. The authorities wanted to question me about his activities. This the guy who gave you presents with strings attached? The one you thought you loved? A vision of Cat gazing with adoration at some other man flickered across his mind, and his nausea returned. Yes. Her gaze shifted to the far wall. After about a year together, he wanted me to sleep with other men so I could get information from them. Busted. Her eyes flitted to his, but didn't linger. He pictured a young cat, desperate for love after her parents had abandoned her, latching on to this loser who probably promised her the world, then betrayed her in the worst way possible. If Wolf ever got his hands on that asshole... Cat finished the breakfast on her plate and looked longingly at the coffee maker. He poured her and himself another cup, but put a hand on her wrist before she could raise hers to her lips. So... That's it. You're only wanted in relation to your ex-boyfriend. You were never arrested. If she had a record, it would be a problem. No criminal connection was a main stipulation to even enter the prince's contest. Again, she paused. Something's burning. Smoke billowed from the waffle maker. He unplugged it and put the burned waffle into the compost bin under the sink. Answer the question. I was never arrested. Again, her gaze darted away. How did you get away from him? Get out of Russia? Leah Manning found me. The guy she worked for now? I don't understand. Liam keeps an eye out for new talent. The best cybersecurity experts are those who know all the back doors and ways to circumnavigate firewalls. I managed to crack one of his programs, and he tracked me down. He offered me two options. Come to America and work for him, or take my chances with the Russian government. So you went with him? It was either that or be pimped out by my so-called boyfriend. Liam got me out of the country. And I laid low here in London for a few months until he'd set me up with an American identity. I owe him my life. So far it all sounded plausible. It's a pretty thorough job he did. School records and everything. Adding records is easy. When you crack a system, they always check for missing information. Not many check to see if you've added stuff. He nodded, not quite sure what to do with the story she'd told him. Did her past really matter? Not to him, as long as she told the truth. But Crown Prince Admani would have a different opinion. Although by the time Wolf was awarded the Royal Commission, Cat would be back in America and out of his life. 
his chest tightened. So, where do we go from here? Cat asked. I don't know. He ran a hand through his hair. She put her coffee cup down, hopped off the stool, and moved toward the living room where her clothes were scattered on the floor. He didn't follow. Two minutes later, she reappeared, once again wearing the black dress with the tantalizing gold zipper between her breasts, high heels and her air of impenetrable self-reliance. Thank you for dinner. And breakfast. She said it as though that was all they'd shared. He wanted to pull her into his arms, tell her they'd work it out. What was there to work out? He'd hired her to check all his software programs and discover who was embedding malicious code and disrupting his systems. And she was doing that. It was his own damn fault he'd gotten personally involved with her. I'll see you tomorrow. He had to know this wasn't the end. Yet. Her eyes when they met his had an air of sadness about them. Then she blinked, and the moment was gone. Yes, I'll call Margaret Mary and set up a time to meet. I'll know by then where the latest hack was uploaded. Good. It wasn't. With one hand on the doorknob, she turned back to him. Can I still come to Russia when you go? Sure. The answer slipped out before he had time to analyze a correct response. Thanks. Then she was gone. What could be so important that she'd risk returning to Russia? A chill swept through him. It was no secret he'd been invited to submit designs in the prince's competition, which was being held in Moscow. There'd been a whole write-up in the Sunday Times two weeks ago. She'd have undoubtedly read it as part of her research on him. How much of the fake girlfriend ploy was to do with the malicious code in his systems? Or had her end game been a trip back to her homeland all along? Chapter 9 Cat squared her shoulders and opened the door to Wolf's office. You two need your heads knocked together, Margaret Mary muttered. Clearly, Wolf was not in the best of moods. Then again, neither was Cat. She'd spilled her life story to him, and he'd coolly watched her leave, like they hadn't shared something amazing the previous night. Wolf sat behind his desk, impeccable and sexy as ever, and about as warm as Moscow in January. Good morning, Cat. This is early for you? It was early, just after eight. She'd wanted to get this over with. Plus, she had hours to wait in line at the Russian embassy to try and get a visa. It would take every ounce of confidence she had to even set foot inside the territory of her former homeland. What if they figured out her true identity? Was she risking too much? I have a busy day. She sat on the chair opposite his desk and pulled out a crude hand-drawn plan and passed it to him. What's this? She leaned over the desk without worrying about giving him an eyeful. The weekend storm had left in its wake a cool, blustery day, necessitating a switch to a turtleneck and pencil skirt. I overlaid a map of your office with the terminal IDs. The ones marked with an X are where the bad codes were uploaded. I had Margaret Mary tell me where people sat. The accounting hack was done through this terminal, but when she checked her records, the person who sits there was on a holiday at the time. The HR hack was done on Rebecca's terminal, and although she was in the building on Friday with her new baby, I doubt she logged on and uploaded malicious code while nursing little William. Wolf ran a hand through his hair while he stared at the map. So basically, we're back at square one. Yes. We have to wait for the hacker to strike again. A muscle in his jaw pulsed. And in the meantime... I have to go to the Russian embassy and get a visa. I'll need a letter from you saying that I'm traveling as your... guest. She folded the map up, put it in her bag, and sat on the chair again. The distance between them was more than the five feet of space from his chair to hers. No way would they convince the Russian government they were lovers. I can do better than that. Wolf picked up his desk phone and dialed a number from memory. My exhibition is on Monday. Do you want to fly in then, or go early? Could we fly in on Friday afternoon and spend the weekend? That would give her two days to find her sister. Not much time, but she was already risking everything staying in the country that long. Wolf nodded. Boris, 
he said, when the phone was answered at the other end. I want to bring my girlfriend with me to Moscow. Can you get her a visa for arrival this Friday? We're going to have a week in Des Moines before the Crown Prince's party on Monday. The answer on the other end must have been affirmative, because Wolf continued. I'll have a passport couriered over to the embassy within the hour. I'm sure it doesn't make a difference, but just so you know, she's American. Whatever Boris said on the other end made Wolf smile. Of course she's gorgeous. I won't be letting her out of my sight, especially if you're around. But listen, as much as I appreciate your hospitality, we want to spend most of our time alone. I hope you understand. The call ended with a promise to meet for a drink on Monday, just before the jewelry event. Thank you, Kat said after he replaced the receiver. Are you sure your American identity will pass scrutiny? I guess we'll know on Friday. His gray eyes searched hers. I hate guessing games. How do you feel about acting? Do you think we'll be able to convince them we're in love? The telltale muscle in his jaw jumped again. Or at least, lust. That won't be a problem for me. My desire for you is as strong as before. She nodded and headed to the door but halted before she reached it. He was standing when she turned back. Had he been about to stop her? Or make sure she left the offices? I never set out to deceive you. She swallowed, trying to clear the lump in her throat. I am Cat Smith. I live in America and work in cybersecurity. That should have been enough for you. She took another step. Wait. He strode around his desk and up to her. Once again, his eyes studied hers. Was he trying to figure out if she'd lied again? She'd given him as much of the truth as she dared, if he knew it all. Remington! Her voice cracked. He must have sensed her inner turmoil as he put a hand on her cheek and ran his thumb over her bottom lip. The intensity of his gaze set off a swarm of butterflies in her belly. I apologize for my behavior yesterday morning. Knowing that someone inside my company is stabbing me in the back has left me angry and a bit paranoid. I'm not sorry I found out about your past, just the way I went about it. I want to know all about you. Why? His lips replaced his thumb, and it was several seconds before he replied, Because you fascinate me. Her chest flooded with warmth. Calm down, girl. This has to stay temporary. He's ambitious and you've got identity issues. He kissed his way over to her ear and tugged gently on her lobe with his teeth. And I want more than your body, although that is fabulous. I want to spend time with you, get to know what you like, don't like, what makes you laugh. Boche moi, he's intoxicating me with his words. That doesn't sound like the emotionally unavailable man I researched five days ago. He's not here at the moment. How about we start over? Let's have dinner tonight. Remington Steel Wolf and Katya Grigorievna Smirnova. Her attempt to remain coolly aloof melted. Can I borrow your kitchen and cook for us? I mean, now that I don't have to spend all day standing in line at the Russian embassy, I need something to do. He kissed her once more, then walked over to his desk and pulled his keys out of the top drawer. As he handed them to her, she asked, You trust me with your place? His lips quirked up in a smile. I trust you with more than that. She swallowed. I'll do my best not to poison you. His laughter stayed with her all the way to the elevator. She had five days before returning to her homeland. She had to believe that he'd have her back as well. In the meantime, she was going to have as much of him as possible. Wolf opened the door of his flat at 6 p.m. with his spare keys. Music thumped from the kitchen, and as he stepped inside, an amazing smell invaded his nose. Sweet and spicy at the same time. A home-cooked meal. His chest flooded with warmth. Had to be the reason his spirits lifted after what had turned into a shit-filled day 
following Cat's departure from his office. He halted in the kitchen doorway. Cat danced to some pop tune he didn't recognize, wearing a pair of yoga pants and a T-shirt. Listening to the lyrics, it took a couple seconds to realize they were in Russian. She caught sight of him, turned off the music, and then wiped her hands on a towel. Her gaze swung to his briefly before she turned back to the pot on the stove. Was she feeling guilty for enjoying herself? You didn't need to turn it off, he said, entering the room. His eyes darted around the kitchen. Every one of his pans, herbs, and spices littered the counter, and a dusting of white stuff he hoped to hell was flour mottled the floor. He searched for the source of the culinary explosion. But Cat looked amazing. It was the first time he'd ever seen her so relaxed. I haven't listened to Russian pop music in five years. It's easier to stay in my new identity if I stick with American things. The omission floored him. She'd sacrificed everything, even things she loved, to start over, to be safe. I'm happy you feel able to be your true self around me, he said. She stiffened when he'd mentioned being herself. Was she still holding something back, or worried she was losing touch with who she was supposed to be? Her eyes darted around the room. Sorry about the mess. I promised to clean it up. Don't bother. I pay a cleaner to come every day. I think she'd like to actually find something to do. Cat still looked uncertain, so he lifted the lid on a bubbling pot. What are you making? This smells great. Having seen the mess she'd made creating the meal, he hadn't held out much hope it would be edible. I've made Thai shrimp soup with lemongrass, summer rolls, and a noodle dish. I tried to make cookies, but I kind of burned the bottoms. I've got a plan for them, though. His stomach rumbled loudly in response. She'd gone to a lot of effort to cook this meal, and he was hungry, but at the moment all he could think about was devouring her. I'll change, then come back to help. Before he could move, she stood on tiptoe and kissed him lightly on the cheek. Welcome home, she said. Two words. They hit him like a wrecking ball. He couldn't recall ever hearing them said to him before. To stop himself blurting out something stupid like, Live with me forever, he went to change out of his suit. As he passed through his bedroom, he noted a head-shaped indent in his pillow, and the bedspread was mussed up. Goldilocks had availed herself of his bed. That fairy tale had bears. Which was the one with the wolf? When he returned to the kitchen, Justin Timberlake sang about bringing Sexy back. The kitchen had almost been returned to normal. Two play settings had been laid at the small table in the nook, and a bottle of white wine sat in a chiller next to a couple of glasses. Anything I can do to help? He asked after feasting his eyes on Cat's curves displayed in the tight pants and plain white T-shirt. Was there anything this woman couldn't wear the hell out of? She glanced at him and then bit her bottom lip. I thought we could eat family style. Can you get the noodles out of the oven and put them on the table? I'll grab the soup and the rolls are in the fridge. After the delicious meal, they both put the leftovers away. But before Cat could do the dishes... Wolf took her hand and pulled her into his arms. Leave them. Let's go into the sitting room and relax. Maybe take some clothes off. See where that leads. Can we watch Remington Steel? Her eyes were full of laughter, and the warmth in his chest increased. The Thai soup had been spicy. I don't think so. That would bring back too many old memories when he wanted to be making new ones. He'd been watching the show, sitting on the lap of his nanny when his mother had swept in, announced he was now going to boarding school, and the nanny could go back to the Philippines or find a new job. In one fell swoop, he'd been wrenched out of the arms of the only person who had loved him, the only other person who'd ever made a house feel like a home to him. To dispel the chill that invaded his body, he ran his hands up and down his arms. How about a compromise? Have you seen the Thomas Crown Affair? Piers Brosnan's in it. We could watch that. I've never even heard of it. Can we snuggle under a blanket on your sofa? Cat in his arms, watching a sexy movie. There was only one way this night was going to get better.
he let out an exaggerated sigh, but couldn't stop a grin from forming. If you want. She kissed him lightly on the lips. I want. She kissed him again, but before he could deepen the embrace, she pulled back. If we are going to watch a movie, I want to change into something more comfortable. I'll meet you in the living room in five minutes. More comfortable than yoga pants and a t-shirt? It was the longest five minutes of his life. If she came out of the bathroom wearing something sexy or nothing at all, his jeans were going to get very tight very fast. Should he change too? Bloody hell. When was the last time he'd worried about his wardrobe? He had a TV in his bedroom. They could start the movie in there and then make their own entertainment. But they were restarting their relationship after his botched job of an inquisition yesterday. He didn't want to push her too fast. He found the film, poured two liberal glasses of whiskey, and pulled a soft, fluffy blanket out of the linen cupboard. He'd just sat on the sofa when Kat padded in barefoot. She wore a pair of floral flannel pajama bottoms and an oversized pink shirt, which slid off one naked shoulder. His first mission would be to discover if she wore anything underneath. She perched herself in the corner of the sofa and spread out the blanket, holding one side up, inviting him in. Any remaining tension from his day evaporated as her body snuggled against his. He definitely should have put on different trousers. How was your day? You seemed a bit stressed when you came home. There it was again. That word. Home. His new kryptonite. It weakened him and made him not care that he was letting this woman into his life piece by piece. Harry and I had a rather intense meeting. I want to launch a new marketing campaign, but he doesn't think it's a good idea. He's also badgering me to show him the designs for the royal collection, and generally being a pain in the ass. He even said I'd lost focus since you'd been in town, and asked when you were leaving. When he found out you're coming to Russia with me, he went ballistic. I've never seen him this way. My offer still stands to check him out. I know he's your closest friend, and you've known him a long time. People change. He'd only known Cat for a week, and he'd checked his watch every fifteen minutes at work to see if it was time to leave yet. Simon's prophecy about adjusting his work schedule was already coming true. Out of sheer stubbornness, he'd stayed an extra half hour in the office. If he had left earlier, would he have caught Cat napping in his bed? He could have joined her. Let's leave it a few more days. If the hacker strikes again, we'll know who the culprit is. If there's still nothing, by the time we get back from Moscow, maybe you could do some general searches. God, if Harry were behind the malicious code, it would be the worst of betrayals. Cat opened her mouth as if to argue, then closed it again. He wrapped his arm around her and pulled her farther onto his chest so he could rub her back. No bra. Why the hell had he chosen a movie again? A TV show would have been done in half the time. Except this was one of his favorites, and he wanted to share it with her. Soon they were both caught up in the film. He paused it at the midpoint, right after the Caribbean scene, hoping Cat might suggest they relocate to the bedroom. Instead, she disappeared into the kitchen and returned a few minutes later with dessert, made from the cookie she'd baked. Most of the burned bits had been removed, and vanilla ice cream, sliced strawberries, and a drizzle of chocolate were sandwiched between biscuits. They were messy and delicious, and led to a lot of licking drips off the other. He was about to suggest they forget the film, when Kat snuggled back under the blanket. Liam has a place in Antigua. Do you have a house in the Caribbean? No. Hmm, maybe I'm hanging with the wrong billionaire, then. He slid his hand under her shirt, but kept it at her waist. For now. I may not have a house in the tropics, yet, but neither do I have a wife, nor steal paintings for fun. Good points. Guess I'll stay where I am. She placed her palm on his chest, and the warmth of her hand went straight through to his heart. Could she feel how fast it beat, despite the fact he was relaxed? I can't believe you haven't seen this film before. It must have come out while I was in Russia. It may shatter the peaceful mood, but he had to ask. 
Cat, why risk going back? If I stick with my original plan, I'll only be gone two days. She sat up. Her eyes searched his, her brow wrinkled. She opened her mouth a couple times before the words finally fell out. I have to find my sister. When she was a dancer, I used to send her fan mail and she'd answer back. But she disappeared from the Bolshoi's payroll two years ago, and I haven't been able to find a trace of her since. One of the set dressers at the production here in London said she was still alive, but it left a lot of people angry. If she's in trouble, I have to help her. Kat's concern for her sister tightened his chest. How come you haven't gone back to Russia sooner? First, to get a visa, I need an invitation to visit the country. I could have gone on an organized tour, but that would limit my opportunity to travel independently. Second, I was worried that even traveling as Cat Smith, the cybersecurity expert, would create too much interest in me. My skill set is highly sought after by both government and organized crime. People have disappeared in Russia for less reason. Third, if they did monitor me while I visited, I couldn't risk them linking Natalia to me. If they discover she's my sister, they can use her as leverage to get me to do what they want. I'm hoping that going in as your girlfriend, no one will take any notice of me. He nodded, although he wasn't sure of the logic of her assumption. Russia's a big country. Where are you going to start? Your visa is only for four days. I don't know, but I have to try. Maybe if I talk to some of her fellow dancers away from the theater, I can find out more. I could hire someone to find her. She snuggled back against him, rubbing her cheek against his chest. No, it has to be me. I don't trust anyone else. Just take my mind off my worries by playing the movie again. He knew a better way to take her mind off her missing sister, and it wouldn't involve pressing play. As the final credits rolled, a snuffly sound came from Cat. Was she crying? He shifted her slightly so he could see her face to find her eyes closed, her lips parted slightly. She slept. The burn in his chest intensified. He really needed to lay off the spicy food. The gentlemanly thing to do would be to find a pillow for her and leave her on the sofa to sleep. Instead, he picked her up in his arms and carried her to his bedroom. After all, she'd sleep much better in a proper bed. And so would he. Actually, the problem he now had was in sleeping without her next to him. Bloody hell. He was screwed. Chapter 10 Cat paced in the luxurious hotel room, waiting for the bellhop to leave after delivering their luggage. She'd been on edge since Wolf's private plane had left British airspace. But as she'd hoped, the Russian immigration officer had barely looked at Kat accompanying Wolf. And for the first time in years, she hadn't been pulled over in customs for a luggage search. Traveling with a billionaire had its perks. The bellhop left with a generous tip from Wolf. The door wasn't even fully closed before he wrapped his arms around her, his tongue tracing the line of her lips. She tilted her head back and let the passion take her, at least for a few minutes. Since she'd fallen asleep on Wolf's chest at the end of the film on Monday, she'd spent every night with him. She'd even given up her hotel room and essentially moved into his apartment. Only the continual reminder that this was temporary kept the panic at bay. He was becoming too important, too fast, for her to be comfortable with all the changes. What are you wearing under this dress? His hot breath slid down her cleavage. If her nipples hadn't already been hard, they would be now. She pulled out of his arms before they got carried away. Their mutual lust seemed insatiable, no matter how many times they made love, including twice on the plane in the three-and-a-half-hour flight from London. She changed after the last round into the skin-tight white dress with the thigh-high slit, which showed off the top of her stockings when she took a step. It fit with the billionaire's bimbo disguise she'd now assumed. Plus, she liked the way Wolf's eyes had barely left her body in twenty minutes. She shrugged, as though she wasn't still lost in the throes of passion, but her voice was husky when she answered. Some things in life are meant to remain a mystery. The existence of the Loch Ness Monster, the popularity of Kanye West, what really happened to Lord Lucan and Sugar, these are life's mysteries. 
lingerie should not be one of them. He tried to pull her back into his arms, but she dodged his hold and put the sofa between them. They say curiosity killed the cat, but I'm pretty sure it isn't all that safe for wolves, either. His wolfish smile returned. I'll take my chances. She tapped the watch he'd insisted she wear. It was from his eternity collection, and so beautiful it should be worn somewhere more prominent than the wrist. He nodded, understanding her sign that she was on the clock and had limited time to find her sister. There'd be time for lovemaking later. This is my first trip to Moscow, babe. She cringed at the harshness of her American accent. It was even harder to maintain her fake identity surrounded by everything that reminded her she was Russian. Add in Wolf's plummy British speech, and her brain had turned to linguistic soup. I want to see some of the city before you tie me to the bed. She'd also warned him that it was likely the hotel suite was bugged. The Russian government liked to keep tabs on what rich foreign nationals were doing in the country. And not wanting to appear anything other than a billionaire's accessory, she'd left her listening device detector in London. So she'd have to stay in character all the time. All right. We can have a quick sightseeing tour on our way to dinner. As it was already 9 p.m., it would be a late dinner indeed. But Kat had discovered where her mother was living, and although she was loath to see her... Irina was the person most likely to know where Natalia was now. They were back in the limo within minutes. This transport mode wouldn't work for more discreet investigations, but as her mother lived in a swanky apartment complex with a famous restaurant on the ground floor, it fit with where they were going. As the door pulled up to the building, Wolf took her hand and gave it a squeeze. She tried to force a smile, but he leaned in and whispered in her ear, Don't pretend with me, Katya. Her hands shook so much she was glad at least one was clamped in his larger one. The driver opened the door, and within seconds they stood in the lobby of her mother's building. Wolf had discreetly handed the doorman something, and he hadn't even questioned why they wanted in. What if her sister was dead? A shudder rippled through Kat. What if she were truly alone in the world now? What if her mother didn't even recognize her? Wolf's arms came around her shoulders and she leaned into him. Smart, independent people knew when they needed help. Kat smiled at a middle-aged couple as they, too, waited for the elevator. The man's eyes swept appreciatively up her body, and the woman, wearing a mink stole despite the fact it was late August and more humid than a sauna, jabbed him in the waist. The other couple got off first, and before the elevator doors had even closed, the woman was ripping into her husband for admiring the prostitute. Cat winced, but as long as the word hacker wasn't used about her, she wouldn't complain. Alone, Wolf wrapped both arms around her. You sure you want to do this? No, she admitted. But I have to know. The elevator door slid open, and Cat followed the corridor to the apartment where her mother lived. Maybe she wasn't home. Before she lost her courage, Cat rang the bell. Her knees shook, and she wobbled on her heels. Wolf's arm wrapped her in a comforting embrace again. Time was a bitch. Had to be. Because her mother looked no different than when she'd left Kat staring out the filthy window of their St. Petersburg apartment, tears streaming down her face, twelve years ago. Her blonde hair was swept up in a loose bun, her blue eyes sparkled, and her skin was a flawless mask of porcelain. Karma had clearly not caught up with her yet and based on the designer outfit she wore, her financial status had also not taken a hit with her sister leaving the Bolshoi. I believe you have the wrong... Irina Smirnova began, in Russian. Then her eyes narrowed and she raked Kat head to toe with her icy gaze. Wolf pulled Kat closer to him. Her mother's eyes rested for a long moment on the ten-carat diamond nestled in Kat's cleavage, another of Wolf's jewels he'd insisted she wear. Katya? Mother. Even saying the word made her throat ache. Who's this? Irina said, her eyes giving Wolf the same treatment, although with a bit more warmth in them this time. Kat ignored the question. She wasn't here for a mother-daughter catch-up. Where is Natalia? If her mother's face got any frostier, they could use it to air-condition the building. She's dead. 
Cat's knees gave way, and she would have fallen to the floor if Wolf hadn't held her up. Both his arms wrapped around her. His concerned eyes swept over her face. As her mother had spoken in Russian, he hadn't understood. She said my sister is dead, Cat repeated in English. Oh, your pimp is a foreigner. That is the word, isn't it? For a man who rents out women, Irina said in English. Tension filled Wolf's body, although his hold remained gentle. I am Remington Wolf, and Katya is my girlfriend. Another man will touch her over my dead body. Come, Cat. There's nothing to be gained by talking further with this woman. If her mother were smart, she wouldn't rile Wolf again. His eyes were hard, his lips set in a tight line, and a muscle in his jaw pulsed. Wait. Cat stopped Wolf before he could move. She turned back to her mother. How did Natalia die? Is she buried in Moscow? The searing pain in her chest was almost more than she could bear. If she visited the grave, at least she'd have some closure and be able to say her goodbyes to the tombstone. She is dead to me. I suppose she still lives somewhere for other people. When she threw away everything I'd worked so hard to achieve for some stupid baby, I disowned her. She had ten years left as a ballerina. She could have had children later. Her mother went to close the door, but Cat caught it. Baby? Nat has a baby? If you don't want a big scene and all your neighbors popping their heads out into the corridor, tell me where my sister is. Pain had morphed to anger, and if she had to rip her mother's door off, she was going to find out where Natalia had gone. I honestly have no idea. She left with that plumber and moved to the countryside. A name. Give me a name, mother. Cat's jaw was clenched so tight her teeth ached. His name was Alexis something. Really, Katya. He was so beneath her. A common laborer. He wasn't even the baby's father. Her mother's eyes lingered on Wolf. Pravda. Are you the Remington Wolf, the famous jewelry designer? I have visited your store in Paris with my friend and seen your photos in Hello magazine. You are even better looking in person. Irina ran a hand down the neckline of her dress. What? Her mother was flirting now with Wolf? She had no shame. Although Cat couldn't fault her taste. I am the Remington Wolf. "'Who is proud to be your daughter's man? "'Are we done here, Cat?' "'Yes.' "'They both turned and walked down the corridor, "'neither looking back. "'They were almost at the elevator "'before her mother's door shut. "'Once inside the limo, "'Wolf pulled Cat onto his lap. "'Why don't we go back to the hotel "'and get room service?' "'Yes.' "'It was all she could manage. "'My offer still stands.' I can hire someone to find your sister. And if the wrong people found out she was looking for Natalia, five years as a fake American or being the pretend girlfriend of a British billionaire wouldn't be enough to protect her. She swallowed down a lump in her throat and put a hand on Wolf's cheek. No, I have to do this myself. This is Russia. People won't talk to a stranger. It has to be me. I trust me. The words broke her. There was no one she could truly rely on. If she told Wolf everything about her past, he'd dump her faster than Usain Bolt ran a hundred meters. He held her, all the way back to the hotel and practically carried her up to their suite. She'd thought she'd put out all the anger and sadness behind her, but seeing her mother again had brought it all back. The pain of abandonment, the sense of failure, the gnawing emptiness— once in the room, Wolf handed her a glass of whiskey and sat beside her, his hand caressing her back. If you need to cry, I'll hold you. She slung back the whiskey and gazed into his gray eyes. Anyone who thought this man emotionless was a blind fool. No, I won't shed any tears for her. I'm saving them all for when we part. Wolf undid his seatbelt and glanced over at Cat. His jet had just landed in St. Petersburg. 
Cat was determined to find her sister, despite the dead end her jackal of a mother had proved to be. Bloody hell. He'd never been so tempted to harm a woman before. Irina Smirnova was a piece of work. She made his own mother look like a candidate for parent of the year. Cat may pretend it hadn't hurt for her mother to be so cruel, but he could see through the cracks in her facade. Her eyes were sad. The smile she gave him had only half the wattage, and she'd barely eaten. He'd held her through the night, as bad dreams disturbed her rest, and the tears she'd refused to shed when awake had wet his chest. Each salty drop of Cat's inner agony eroded his ability to keep his own feelings in control. If he could take her pain away, if he could find her sister, his emotions were all over the place. So that's why they continued this wild goose chase. They'd flown to St. Petersburg to visit her old neighbor, one who had been a surrogate grandmother when the Smirnova family lived there. Cat was sure her sister would have left some forwarding address with the woman. It took almost an hour to get to the northern suburb of St. Petersburg, where Cat had grown up. The area was depressing. The roads had more potholes than asphalt, and the general air of neglect was reflected on the faces of the people who walked the crumbling sidewalks. Men and women, each clutching plastic shopping bags, were queued up next to kiosks. If it weren't for the death grip Cat had on his arm, he'd have been tempted to turn their rental car around and return to their luxury suite in Moscow. He'd visited a lot of poor areas in his travels, but somehow, knowing this had been Cat's life, made it all too personal. Eventually they arrived at an original communist-era block of flats. So as not to stand out, they'd both dressed down in jeans and t-shirts with knock-off sunglasses and fake leather jackets. Wolf didn't even live here, and he was already depressed. He was also having serious doubts as to the success of their mission— if the woman had been old when Cat was a girl, what were the chances she was even still alive? Was Cat only setting herself up for more heartache? Are you sure you want to do this? That pulled a smile from her. You said the same thing last night. I don't think it can get any worse. At least I'm not likely to be called a prostitute here. They stood in the entranceway, although rather than take the lift, which he doubted would be able to hold his weight, Cat began to climb the stairs. Don't make eye contact, she told him earlier, and if anyone speaks to you, just grunt. She needn't have bothered with the warning, as it was risky to take his eyes off the crumbling cement steps. The UK's Health and Safety Commission would have a heart attack if they saw this place. At the fourth floor, Cat stopped. This was our apartment, she said, pointing at a faded blue door the paint completely chipped at the bottom. I wonder if my father ever paid the rent, and returned. But rather than tempt a reunion with another parent, she moved along two more doors. This one was still faded, but clean. A worn but presentable mat sat in front, and a vase of fresh flowers adorned one side, a little spot of joy in an otherwise dreary corridor. And this is where Valentina lives. With an indrawn breath, Cat rapped on the door. They waited, and she raised her hand to knock again, when a shuffle and plop sound came from within. Cat's hand tightened on his. Kuto eta? A frail voice called from within. Baba, eta Katya, Cat replied. Katya? My Aunt Katya? Da. Several locks unbolted. She remembers me. Asked if it was her, Katya. The door swung open to reveal an elderly woman, hunched over a walker. She couldn't be more than five feet tall, even upright. But the walker was pushed aside and Katya was enveloped in a fierce embrace. The normal three kisses of a Russian greeting turned into five. By the time the women separated... They both had tears running down their cheeks. Cat introduced him, at least that's what he figured she said, as the woman latched on to him next. Her gnarled hand shot up and pulled his head down for her kisses. For a small thing, she sure was strong. The smell of garlic rocked him back on his heels as they were ushered into the flat. Cat didn't seem to notice. Instead, she prattled on, pointing at photos on the wall. 
Nothing's changed, she said to him. They were shown into a small sitting room, furnished with one couch and what looked like the first television set ever made. The elderly lady pointed at him and said something. He turned to Cat for a translation. The laughter in her eyes should have warned him. She wants you to turn around slowly so she can see all of you. This woman meant a lot to Cat, so he'd comply. Once more, Cat translated when Valentina spoke again. Before he was halfway around, the old lady grabbed his arse and gave it a pinch. When he glanced at Cat again, she was doubled over in laughter. Valentina says you'll do. Cat patted the sofa next to her, and gratefully, he sat. Maybe Cat's pseudo-grandmother wanted to check his teeth next. He thought he was safe, until Valentina sat next to him, put a hand on his thigh, and squeezed. This was even worse than Cat's mother flirting with him last night. What was it with Russian women? There was only one Ruskaya he wanted to be catnip to. The two women talked fast, and within seconds he was lost. So much for the Learn Russian in 30 Minutes a Day book he downloaded after he learned Cat's true nationality. As they chatted, his gaze shifted around the room. Was there anything he could do for this elderly lady? Everything was neat and clean, but seemed original to the building. The carpet had worn through in several places, and anything heavier than a mouse would cause the chair in the corner to collapse. Cat's sudden indrawn breath brought his eyes back to her. She had a hand on her mouth and a tear coursed down her cheek. Oh, God, not bad news about her sister. Valentina got up and left the room. He put his arms around Cat and kissed the tear away. What is it? His own throat ached as he asked the question. She has a letter for me from Natalia and knows where she is. I knew Nat would come here. This was always our escape when things were bad at home. Is your sister nearby? The pressure on his chest eased. About a two-hour drive, back toward Moscow. She's living in Valentina's Dacha, a cottage by the lake. He glanced at his watch. We can be there by mid-afternoon, if we leave now. We have to stay for lunch, Cat said as Valentina returned and handed her an envelope. He couldn't eat the poor woman's food. But he didn't want to be rude, either. Maybe he should suggest they go to a nearby restaurant and he'd pay the bill and leave some cash discreetly before they left. We trust me. It will be okay, Cat said. Then she tore into the envelope. As Cat read the letter, Valentina's sharp eyes ran up and down him. Horosho, she said. Oshan Horosho. Very good. At least he learned that much. His chest swelled. An old lady, whom he'd met only ten minutes ago, thought he was all right. And her assessment of him touched him, more than he thought possible. Emotionally unavailable, my ass. Much longer with Cat, and he'd be a basket case. Chapter 11 Can't this car go any faster? Cat asked as Wolf barreled down the highway in their rental. She'd forgotten how bad Russian roads were. You said be discreet. His eyes left the road briefly to glance over at her, and he hit a massive pothole. I know. I'm just anxious to see my sister. Her reunion with Valentina had been bittersweet. It was probably the last time she'd see the woman. Her adopted Baba's heart was failing, and the doctor said she wouldn't last much longer. Cat had pleaded with her to get a second opinion, or at least try different therapies. Valentina refused saying she was too tired. It was time to let go. Let go. Cat had let go of so much she had little left to hold on to. Then Wolf reached over and squeezed her hand clenched on the seat cushion. Rather than lament what she no longer had, she'd do better to enjoy what she did have while she had it. Any hope she had of getting out of this relationship, heart intact, had ended this afternoon. How could she not fall for a man who ate two bowls of watery mushroom soup with a smile and then discreetly left enough money to pay for all of next year's groceries? Valentina likes you, she said, swallowing down the lump in her throat. A mischievous smile played about his lips. 
I know. She pinched my ass again as we left, and I'm pretty sure when you were in the bathroom, she said that if things didn't work out with you, she was available. You Russian women aren't backward about being forward, are you? We know what we want, and we go after it. She ran a hand up his thigh. So I see. But if you want to get to your sister safely and not have me crash this car, you'd better move your hand. Reluctantly, she returned to gripping the edge of the seat. Thanks for leaving the cash, but you didn't have to. I have money delivered to her every quarter. Then why does it look like she's living in poverty? Because the things she has are all sentimental. And if she bought new, someone would just break in and steal them. It's safer for her not to have too much. But she never goes hungry and has money for medicine. And she shares it with some of the other widows in the building. She didn't have children of her own. She had a nephew whose parents died when he was a teen and she took him in, but he was... Cat made a disgusted face. That's why I couldn't live with her after my family fell apart. Victor liked young girls too much. He was killed in a car accident a few years ago. I'm sorry for Valentina. She shrugged. Victor had been a disgusting pig, and the world was better off without him. Even his aunt had felt the same. He was a disappointment from a young age. Well, I'm glad she had you, and that you had her. Yes. She made me feel worthy of love. They rode in silence for a while, the word love sitting like a lead ball in her stomach. Finally, they neared the turnoff. As Wolf carefully navigated the gravel road, she stared at him. He had to be excited and nervous about the competition on Monday night, yet he'd taken his time to be with her, rather than schmoozing with the crown prince and his entourage. Why the hell did he have to be a good guy? Jerks were so much easier to leave. Her stomach lurched, and it had nothing to do with the rutted road. If I forget to say it later, thank you. He glanced again at her. For what? For coming with me. For holding my hand. For never saying this was a stupid idea. You're welcome. And apart from meeting your mother, it's been fun. I've seen a part of Russia most tourists never see. I have a new appreciation for how resilient your people are. Yeah, I'm going to need all that resilience for when we part. The first of the small cottages came into view, and Cat directed Wolf around to one at the far end of the lake. It had been so long since she'd been here, but the smell of the forest, the call of the ducks, and the excited shouts of children were as familiar to her as if she'd just visited yesterday. Unfamiliar was the blend of nerves and anticipation coursing through her veins. You sure you want to do this? Wolf asked as he stopped the car in front of the small wooden building. She leaned over and kissed his lips. I'm sure. A tall man, built like a massive oak tree, came around the cottage. There was a hammer in his hand, and his jeans were covered in wood chips. He peered into the car and tightened his grip on the wooden handle. Cut, wait. Let me deal with this. Wolf put his hand on her arm as she went to open the door. Trust me. It'll be okay, she said, echoing her words from earlier. Is it just me, or are our conversations on a loop? Seemed to be. She pushed her car door open, but stood behind it just in case this wasn't her new brother-in-law. What if this was a dead end? What if Natalia had moved on? It took two tries to get her voice to carry as far as the big man. Alexi? Wolf got out of the car and came to stand beside her, his arm around her shoulder. The Russian man's eyes narrowed, then a quizzical expression crossed his face. I am Alexei Petrovich. Who are you? he asked in Russian. Katya pulled in a shaky breath, and Wolf's arm tightened in support. I'm Katya Grigorievna Smirnova, Natalia's sister. Alexei dropped the hammer, and he stared as though he was sure she was lying. No, she was told you were dead. Kat tried to look around the man, but his huge form blocked all view of the cottage's porch. I was told the same of her. Is she here? Yes, but she is due to give birth soon. You'd better let me warn her. I don't want her to go into labor until the midwife arrives. Cat nodded, and while Alexei disappeared into the house, she explained to Wolf what was happening. Blood zinged through her veins, 
after long years of worry, was she really about to see her sister? Alexia appeared on the porch and gestured them in. He had a toddler on his hip, her long blonde hair pulled back into two pigtails on either side of her head. Cat had a niece, a gorgeous girl who looked so much like Natalia as a child, Cat's eyes flooded with moisture. How often had big sister Cat brushed little Natalia's hair and told her stories of fairy princesses? It was like yesterday and forever ago. Nothing could keep her tears from falling. Wolf wrapped his arm around her shoulder, and with an indulgent smile for her sappiness, they entered the tiny cottage. The Dacha had seemed so much bigger when she was a child. With Alexei and Wolf inside, it had shrunk in size, but it was neat and clean and had obvious recent repairs. Her sister, with a huge belly, stood in a bedroom doorway, wearing a flower print dress and bare feet. Her blue eyes were damp, and her blonde hair framed her angelic face. Cat raced across the room and enveloped Natalia in a hug so tight the unborn baby kicked in protest, which led to another burst of tears. When at last they parted, Alexei moved to stand next to Natalia and put a supportive arm around his wife. Wolf, who surprisingly hadn't backed away slowly from the emotional mess she'd become, offered her a tissue and a warm smile. With a wobbly voice, Cat performed the introductions, and her sister and husband greeted Wolf in English. Then Natalia unleashed a flurry of questions in Russian so fast that even Cat had trouble keeping up. Wolf just smiled and nodded. When eventually her sister took a breath, Alexei spoke before Cat could answer the first queries about how they got there and where they'd come from. Alexei is asking if you fish. Cat translated her brother in law's question, as it seemed the easiest to answer. Not in a long time. As in Valentina's poor apartment, Wolf seemed just as at home in the cottage. He was relaxed and as happy as she'd seen him in London, a man who could adapt to whatever circumstances he found himself in, and probably turn them to his advantage. Do you want to help him catch some supper? Cat next asked. Sure, unless you'd prefer me to stay. Wolf replied. I'm okay now but there's bound to be a few more tears which I'm sure you'd rather avoid. If they're happy tears, I don't mind so much. But I'll leave you two to catch up, and I'll go with Alexei and lure some fish to an early demise. He saw Cat's little niece, Ekaterina, staring at him, probably confused by the different language they spoke. Wolf made a funny fish face, and the little girl giggled. After the floods of tears from the sisters, the child's laugh was like the first beams of sunshine following a storm. Wolf wrapped his arms around Cat from the back, and she leaned against his broad chest, savoring the warmth and security. If I could bottle this moment... I'll translate that as yes, Cat said. Wolf kissed her lingeringly on the lips before following Alexei out of the cottage. With the men gone... Cat stared at Natalia, desperate to see evidence that her sister was truly content. She glowed with her pregnancy, and the look of love in her eyes as they flitted to her daughter was unmistakable. As though a huge weight had been lifted from her chest, Cat pulled in a lungful of air. All the risk, the stress, the worry about coming back to Russia had been worth it. Natalia was alive and happy. Cat could rest easy now. With Wolf out fishing with Alexei, she didn't have to translate their conversation, but could speak freely in Russian. I can't believe I finally found you. I've searched and searched. Natalia shook her head, as though making certain this was real as well. I can't believe it either. I have so much to tell you, so many questions to ask. Cat laughed, so I noticed. You're going to have to repeat them, because I lost count after the eighteenth one. Two minutes together and the years apart slid away. They were back to sisters, teasing each other. I'm still the same, Natalia replied, her smile contagious. I always want to know everything. I'll put Ekaterina down for her nap first, so she doesn't disturb us. Can you make some tea? Of course. Cat filled the kettle and put it on the old propane stove. While she waited for the water to boil, she tiptoed over to the bedroom she and Natalia had shared that one happy summer. The tiny space had been transformed into a room fit for a princess. Her sister sat on the bed, 
stroking Ekaterina's hair and singing a soft lullaby. A lump reformed in Kat's throat, and she moved away before the crying started again. This was a happy reunion. She'd shed enough tears in the past twelve years to fill an ocean. She didn't need to add any more. The tea was ready when Natalia returned to the room and sank into a wooden chair by the table. She rubbed her swollen belly, a look of pure bliss on her face. I'm so happy, Katya. I have everything I've ever wanted in life, and now to know you're alive and with a good man? At least I assume he's good. He certainly looks like he's in love with you. He's good, was all Kat managed to say. No point shattering her sister's illusions about Wolf's emotional connection to her. She poured the tea, then took Natalia's hand across the table. How did you go from being a principal dancer in one of the world's greatest ballet companies to living in a daha with a man who looks like he fells trees simply by leaning on them? Natalia heaved a sigh and took a sip of her tea. The Bolshoi wanted to bring a different dynamic to the performances, so they hired an edgy new choreographer. We worked long hours together, often alone, and after a few months, we ended up in bed. Then I discovered I was pregnant. I told him, and he got furious and insisted I get rid of the baby. The new performance had already been put on the playbill and booked on a 20-city, 10-month international tour. There was no way I would be able to perform while pregnant, and I'd been the only one able to master the steps of the principal female dancer. If I pulled out, the Bolshoi would lose hundreds of thousands, if not millions, in sales. But I didn't want to abort my baby. I talked to Mother, and she slapped me across the face for even thinking about going through with the pregnancy. Natalia, I'm so sorry. You must have been devastated. Kat clenched her hand in her lap, anger at her mother coursing through her veins once more. Irina had been willing to sacrifice her grandchild to her ambition. I was. I felt so alone. I didn't know what to do. Mother had control of my money until I turned twenty-five. It had been a while since I'd had a letter from you, and she told me you'd died of a drug overdose. Papa, too, had passed since our last correspondence, and I had no other family to take me in. Kat took a sip of her tea before she could speak. Even after the warm liquid, her voice was raw. How could she do that? Lie to you about me. Because she only thinks of herself. I was her ticket to a luxury lifestyle. If I gave up ballet, she'd have to get a job. Turns out she just got a rich, married lover instead. Kat shook her head. I wondered how she afforded that luxury apartment. She's some oligarch's mistress. And Irina had the nerve to call Kat a prostitute. So with no money and nowhere to go, how did you leave Moscow? I met Alexei, and he turned my world around. I pretended to have the abortion to buy us some time to make plans, but... It didn't take long before I couldn't hide my pregnancy. In the meantime, I helped one of the other dancers learn my steps. Then one day I sent a letter of resignation to the Bolshoi and another one to Mother, and Alexei and I left the city. We went first to St. Petersburg, just in case Mother had lied about your death. Your letters always came from different parts of Russia, and the return addresses were never the same, so I couldn't write to you. I had to leave the country so I had the letters to you smuggled in by various contacts, and then they'd forward your reply on to me. I couldn't risk the government connecting who I am now with the woman I'd left behind. Natalia nodded. I thought it was something like that. But I hoped you also kept in touch with Valentina. So I left a letter for you with her, in case she heard from you. I knew anything you wrote to me at the Bolshoi would just be destroyed. When I told her about the baby, Valentina lent the Dacha to Alexei and me. And you're really happy? Kat asked, as her sister finished both her recital and her tea. Completely. I love it here. The air is clean, and Ekaterina can play outside and eat good food and be anything she wants. Alexia is going to expand the cottage, so there will be enough room for all our babies. She rubbed her belly once more, and a stab of jealousy pierced Kat's heart. The first time she'd ever been envious of her sister... I'm glad it's worked out for you. But if there ever comes a time when you want more or need to leave, then I can help. I have a great job and make more money than I can spend. I can send you some. Her sister was already shaking her head. We won't need it. Alexei, he's amazing. 
He looks after me so good, Katya. I couldn't ask for a better man. You deserve him. Natalia's smile dimmed. I don't. I ruined your life. I don't know how you can even sit across from me and wish me well. Don't you hate me? Never. How could you think that? We're sisters. I'll always love you. But because of me, Mother ripped apart our family and you ended up on the street. It was Mother and her ambition, not you. I was sad to lose my sister. But I never blamed your talent. Kat reached across and stilled Natalia's hand where it plucked at the tablecloth. Do you know what happened to Papa? As much as Kat hated that he lost himself in drink, he'd been as much a victim of their mother's aspirations as anyone. He passed out drunk in a snowstorm and died of hypothermia. I made sure he had a proper burial, but Mother refused to allow any mention of him in the press. She didn't want our names sullied by what she considered his failure. Kat wiped a tear away before it could fall. At least he's at peace. Natalia's smile was watery, but she squeezed Kat's hand. Let's talk about happier things. Tell me about your life, your man. I feel like I've seen his face before. Where did you meet? She was saved from answering by the return of the men with two large fish, still wriggling in the net. Without missing a beat, Natalia took the fish from her husband and then turned to Kat. Why don't you show your husband around while Alexi and I get supper ready? Natalia spoke in English so Wolf could understand. Husband? Had Wolf's face just paled? When had she given her sister the impression that they were married? Cat had only provided Wolf's name and introduction, not quite sure how to define their relationship anymore. We were fake lovers, then became actual lovers while knowing it would never last. The reality was too harsh to say out loud in the cottage filled with love. Besides, it was already five o'clock. They should head back to either Moscow or St. Petersburg. Driving on these roads in the dark was a recipe for disaster. But she couldn't quite bring herself to say goodbye. Her chest burned at the thought of leaving her sister so soon after their reunion. There had to be a way for them to communicate, so that even if Kat had to change her identity in the future, they could still keep in touch. She opened her mouth to say they had to leave, when Wolf's arms wrapped around her from behind. His lips were against her neck when he said, I've accepted Alexi's invitation to stay the night. Seems we're going to have part of our honeymoon under the stars. Honeymoon? Valentina must have put hallucinogenic mushrooms in the soup. That was the only explanation for the look on Wolf's face. A fluttery sensation invaded her chest, and she couldn't hold back her own smile. Despite knowing this was madness... She was falling for a man whose ambition rivaled that of her mother's. Stay with him much longer, and she might as well hand him the power to destroy her. But her sister had been found. Now she had to discover who was sabotaging Wolf's company and get the hell out of his life before she lost herself completely. Boje moi. Was it already too late? If he had his sketch pad with him, He'd draw Cat at this very moment. Her face glowed with happiness. The firelight danced over her features, caressing her cheeks, her lips, the line of her jaw that he loved to trace with kisses. Her little niece was snuggled on her chest, fast asleep, while Cat stroked her hair. This was a woman meant to be a mother. The thought should scare the shit out of him. Why didn't it? God, she was incredible. One minute a fierce cybersecurity expert, then an intense lover, next a devoted aunt. It would take a lifetime to discover all her facets. Are you sure you'll be okay sleeping outside? Natalia asked for the tenth time. Her English was much better than her husband's. Wolf had enjoyed fishing with Alexei, and with their mix of English and Russian, they'd managed to communicate fine. Besides, what needed to be said... They were both fascinated by the Smirnova sisters. That gave them a common bond no words needed to express. We'll be fine, Wolf assured his hostess. The cottage only had two bedrooms, and there was no way he was going to turf a heavily pregnant woman or a small child out of their beds. So a hammock had been strung up between two trees, covered in blankets and a mosquito net. It was to be their love nest. 
He also hadn't felt the need to correct the assumption that he and Kat were married. If it made her sister happy to think Kat was settled in a relationship as well, he was all for it, especially when it meant he got to sleep with her under the stars. I hope you have a good night, Alexei said, as he took the sleeping Ekaterina from Kat's arms. After another round of hugs and kisses, the small family went into the cottage. Kat moved from her chair to sit on Wolf's lap. They shared the last of the vodka Alexei had found in the back of the cupboard and stared into the firelight. While they'd walked around the lake, Kat had told him Natalia's story. The Smirnova sisters were strong, but even diamonds had their breaking point. He'd already seen cracks in Kat's self-sufficiency. Let's try out this hammock, he said. How much do you want to wager that one or both of us ends up on the ground before morning? Kat's soft laugh warmed him. I'm not taking that bet. She stopped when she got to their bed. I'm pretty sure when you hired me to sort out your computers, you never imagined you'd be sleeping on some nylon netting in a bug-infested Russian forest. It's a dream come true, he replied. Truth was, this adventure with Kat was just what he needed. He'd become so cynical about love and relationships that it had begun to show in his work. Proof that love really did exist and could conquer mountains would help him design more romantic jewelry. More than that, though, was the glow on Kat's face. The restlessness he'd come to sense in her had disappeared, replaced with a quiet contentment. He would have slept on the ground rather than dragged her away from her sister. Kat pushed him onto the hammock, and he had to hang on or be flipped out the other side. When it swung back toward her, he grabbed her waist and pulled her on with him. Her laughter rang out over the still lake, and he kissed her so she didn't wake Katerina. He should get a medal for his consideration. His hand sneaked up under Kat's shirt, unfastening her bra. Caressing her breasts, hearing her sharply indrawn breath, was his reward. In deference to their unstable bed, their normally frenzied passion was replaced by slow, sensual caresses. That only lasted so long, however, before the need to be inside her overwhelmed him. The tick, tick, tick of knowing their time together had a fast-approaching limit had become louder in the past two days. He lay on the bottom while Kat straddled him, trying to keep the hammock from swinging wildly and dumping them out. As she rode him, the moon came out from behind some clouds, illuminating her body in an ethereal white light. Okay, Maybe this is how he'd draw her. If he didn't know better, he would think the look on her face was one of love. Where was the shrieking abort signal that usually clawed at his soul when relationships threatened to get serious? Instead, a stupid smile contorted his face into what he could only imagine was a picture worthy of a mushy greeting card. They climaxed within seconds of each other, and after their heart rates had returned to normal... He shifted Kat, so she lay next to him, staring up at the night sky. She pulled a soft cotton blanket up around them, and they snuggled together. Another cloud obscured the moon, letting the stars blaze in its absence. This is your dream, isn't it? Wolf whispered, not wanting to disturb the quiet of the night. An owl hooted in the distance as if to tell them to hush, what? Lying in a hammock at night, looking at the stars after making love with an amazing man? Pretty much. I meant what your sister has. A family. One baby on the hip, another in her belly. A pretty house, and a man at her side. He'd seen the longing in Kat's face as she'd watched Natalia and Alexei. Yes. He could hear the barely concealed emotion in her voice. But don't worry, Remy. I'm not about to get pregnant and try to trap you in marriage. You are free to pursue your ambition. I won't get in the way. Except, she already had. He hadn't thought once about the Royal Commission since arriving in Russia. Was he as vulnerable as his systems? To recoding? Chapter 12 Wolf shifted his weight from one foot to the other and glanced at the doorway again. Cat was an hour late. 
Another ten minutes and he'd go and find her, drag her to the ballroom if necessary. They'd argued this morning about her coming to the party. She tried to spin him some tale about not wanting to distract him while he was working, but he sensed there was some other reason for her reluctance to attend. His mind flashed back to her sudden disappearance at the ballet, when she lied about hearing the intermission bell. Instinct told him there was a piece of her past she hadn't revealed to him yet. Her change in attitude puzzled him. It had all been fine until this morning. They'd returned to Moscow mid-afternoon yesterday after a tearful farewell between the sisters. But once back in the city, Kat had rebounded and given him a tour of Moscow, Russian style. They'd walked hand in hand through Gorky Park, ate dinner at a little cafe known only to the locals, and ended the night in a jazz bar. Well, the public portion of the night. Back in the hotel, they'd enjoyed two epic rounds of sex before they'd fallen into an exhausted sleep, glad to be in a bed that didn't swing. Then today, as he'd reminded her about royal protocol when meeting the prince, she'd suddenly said she didn't want to attend. He'd finally convinced her to come tonight, saying it would cause more speculation if she didn't join him as everyone knew they'd traveled to Russia together. If he hadn't been expected at meetings with various government ministers and the crown prince's people, he'd have insisted on her telling him what was going on. It was now after seven, and the unveiling of the competitor's jewelry pieces was due to start in less than half an hour. And Cat was supposed to wear his premium piece, the bicolor sapphire entwined in silver filigrees. If she didn't show, he could kiss the whole thing goodbye. His stomach roiled. Two men behind him began to murmur about the party now getting interesting and how they'd like to take that one home. Wolf turned toward the door again and nearly dropped his drink. Cat had shown him the dress she intended to wear, and it had been very nice. The one she had on was spectacular. The dark blue satin fabric hugged her figure until it reached her knees, then flared out. The neckline stood slightly off her shoulders in layers of fabric, revealing her creamy, soft skin. It set off the bicolor sapphire perfectly as it nestled at the top of her cleavage. The mounds of her breasts hugged the jewel. Her eyes searched the room, and when she spotted him, a smile that could melt gold lit her face. His chest responded by tightening, while his dick performed a happy dance in his trousers. Whatever was bothering her, it wasn't about him. How was he going to let her go back to San Francisco when she'd found his saboteur? As she made her way over to him, every male eye in the room was on her. Finally, she reached his side and kissed him on the cheek before whispering, "'Sorry I'm late.' "'Everything okay?' he asked. His brain and cock were battling for blood supply. "'I hope so.' He searched her face at the nervousness in her voice. "'Cad. Remington Wolf, I have yet to meet your beautiful companion.' The crown prince's accented voice pulled Wolf back to the real reason they were there. Your Royal Highness, may I present Cat Smith. Cat, please greet His Royal Highness, Crown Prince Zayad al Hassin bin Ajmani. Cat dropped into a curtsy, giving the shorter Crown Prince a perfect view of the necklace, and probably a lot more. When she resumed her full height, the other man's eyes were still on her chest. Wolf forced his hands not to clench into fists. This is what he'd wanted, after all, for the prince to see his necklace in situ, nestled against the breasts of a beautiful woman, rather than displayed in a black velvet form with the rest of the collection. I see you are wearing my sapphire, Ajmani said. Eventually his gaze returned to Wolf's face. A shot of triumph flooded his veins at the look of adoration in the prince's eyes. Just a replica, your royal highness, Cat replied her voice once again as smooth and silky as her lingerie. I am sure you can imagine how beautiful the rest of your collection will look if set by Remington Wolf. Yes, yes. The prince nodded, and his gaze once more returned to Cat's chest, before his right-hand man approached and directed His Royal Highness to another dignitary across the room. Before Wolf could thank her for such a clever promotion of his skills, Boris, the Russian Minister of Culture, approached. His gaze yo-yoed between Kat's chest and her face. I can see why you did not want to leave her in London. Are you enjoying your visit to Russia, Miss Smith? Very much, 
It's a fascinating country. The people even more so. I'm just sorry our visit is so short. We'll have to come back for longer next time, won't we, Remington? Her American accent was a bit shaky, having spent the majority of the past two days speaking Russian. But Boris didn't seem to notice. Yes, of course, darling, Wolf replied. I think a two-week visit may be called for. Kat smiled at him, and he pulled her closer. Could he bring her back for longer to visit her sister? He thought that after she found the saboteur, they'd part. But there was no reason they couldn't stay in touch, and maybe have a holiday or two together. The thought made it slightly easier to breathe. They didn't have to say goodbye. Just see you later. Until Cat found a man able to give her the love she deserved, and the baby she craved. The steel band around his chest tightened again. Ladies and gentlemen, the prince's chief adviser tapped a spoon against his glass of sparkling rose water. His Royal Highness Crown Prince Zayed Al Hassan bin Admani, thanks you for coming this evening, and would like to invite you to now view the jewelry submitted by the contesting designers. This way, please. With a dramatic flare, two attendants flung open the double doors at the end of the ballroom. This was it. His big moment. Cat slid her hand into his and squeezed. Did you want me to stand by your collection so people can see the sapphire? No, I made a second one for display there. Besides, he wanted her by his side. Cat put her other hand on his arm, and they entered the room with the rest of the guests and jewelers. The collections were displayed in alphabetical order, which meant his were last. Hopefully, they'd also be the most memorable. The crowd split, and he led Cat to the first table, the French company's display. They were already the appointed jewelers to several European royal families, and in keeping with that pedigree, their submitted pieces were very traditional, beautiful, but conservative. Next up was the Russian designer's submission. They too had kept with their house's signature style, and rather than submit jewelry, they had created objets d'art incorporating the gemstones. It was a calculated risk, as the crown prince's five wives were rumored to be very competitive. Producing objects rather than jewelry would eliminate any fighting for particular items. Cat, however, seemed unimpressed. She actually made a face when she saw the items designed by the American house. They were very bold and innovative, and he could admire their cutting-edge design, but they didn't look elegant or even comfortable to wear. The Greek jewelers were over the top fussy. It was as if they tried to fit as many jewels as possible into each piece. The Italian house was probably his greatest competition. Their designs were beautiful, and they'd chosen to highlight different stones than wolf. So it was difficult to make an accurate comparison. None of the pieces bore any resemblance to the fake designs he'd uploaded onto his system. So it didn't seem that his competitors had a hand in the sabotage of his software. When they finally arrived at his display, Cat's indrawn breath was audible. He only hoped others had the same reaction. Wolf, they're gorgeous. When her eyes met his, though, there was an odd light in them, the same as when she'd said goodbye to Valentina. Then her gaze slid over his shoulder, and all the blood drained from her face. Her hand shook in his, and she tucked herself closer to him. Cat. He turned slightly to see what had frightened her while shielding her with his body. All he could see were people milling about, chatting about the various displays in their native tongues. When he glanced back at her, she was so pale he put an arm around her shoulders and searched the room for a chair where she could sit. He spotted one in the corner and was about to move toward it, when a big hand landed on his shoulder. Cat's gaze flew to his. I'm so sorry, she said. Wolf's muscles tensed, ready to battle the world for his woman. Her heart pounded so loud, the buzz of chatter in the room disappeared entirely. Her gaze darted, searching for an escape that wouldn't take her near Nikita. If she could just back out... Then her former boyfriend put a large hand on Wolf's shoulder, and the time to run was gone. She tried to get out of attending the party, worried this might happen... But Wolf had done so much for her, and he'd really wanted her at his side. She hadn't had the heart to refuse his request, especially when he asked her to wear his beautiful creation. 
So when she'd first arrived in the ballroom, she'd quickly checked for any of her old crew. This was exactly the type of event they'd work, full of rich foreigners distracted by shiny objects. But she hadn't seen anyone she recognized. Of course, it had been five years. They'd undoubtedly changed personnel in that time. Now everything they'd both worked for was about to blow up, unless she could stop Nikita from exposing her cover. Could she play on their past relationship and any lingering feelings he might have for her? Not that he'd ever truly loved her. He'd never made her feel like Wolf did. Beautiful, smart, important to him. In fact, after discovering her curvy body and enjoying it himself, he'd then tried to talk her into working both sides of the game, stealing the personal devices and stripping them of information. He'd wanted to pimp her out. That's when she knew she'd had to get away. Thank God Liam had found her before she'd had to take any other drastic action. I need to speak with your companion. Nikita addressed Wolf, but his eyes never left Kat's face. Wolf's free hand fisted, and Kat stepped between the two men before this went sideways. Nikita had never been slow to use violence. The Crown Prince was known to be a man who abhorred fighting. Any skirmish, no matter who started it, would destroy Wolf's chances of winning the Royal Commission. Nikita, what a surprise to see you here. She begged him with her eyes not to make a scene, or shout that she was an impostor and not the American girlfriend of the British designer. Katya, he said, his voice low. Remington, will you excuse us for a minute? She kissed him lightly on the cheek. I'll be right back she added, when he didn't release her hand. Slowly, Wolf's fingers uncurled from hers, but she could read the reluctance in his eyes. Boje moi! She prayed this would all work out. Nikita put his hand on her back and directed her into the first ballroom. It was being switched from reception area to dining, each table to hold eight guests. Would she be back for dinner? Or would Wolf be eating alone? By the time Nikita stopped, they were on the small balcony overlooking the river. In the distance, cars honked and people strolled along the promenade, unknowing and uncaring that her life was about to implode. What do you want, Nikita? Although she could move away from him, she stayed close so they couldn't be overheard. She also kept the conversation in English, so any staff who might be listening would either not understand or think it a clandestine meeting between two foreigners. How can you ask? Katya, I've never forgotten you. It kept me awake for months, wondering where you went. I searched for you. Cut the crap. You never loved me. You wanted me to seduce other men to steal their stuff. What kind of boyfriend asks the woman he allegedly loves to do that? It was business. Sometimes you have to separate business and pleasure. Well, I'm no longer any of your business. Or pleasure. You are my business. Are you working this party? Absolutely not. I'm Cat Smith, and I'm here as the guest of Remington Wolf, the British designer. His eyes narrowed. I don't believe you. As head of security for the hotel. Since when does the fox get put in charge of the hen house? Don't they know who you are? Nikita's mouth tightened into a firm line, but his shrug was nonchalant. Do you think you are the only one who can reinvent yourself? After you left, our team fell apart. No one could pull the info off the devices as quickly as you. So I made a new identity and took this job. And you're telling me you're legitimately head of security here? This isn't another con? Who better to secure a place than someone who knows all the tricks to infiltrate it? Nikita had always been supremely confident. She could picture him talking his way into a position he had no right to hold. She put a hand on his chest, hoping to reach anything that was left of his feelings for her. I'm legit, too. I'm a cybersecurity expert now. His eyes said he didn't believe her. You took a risk coming back here, Katya. If the Federal Security Bureau discovers that Pantera is back in the country... She went rigid forcing her muscles to absorb the shiver that ran down her spine. Show no weakness. Except it wasn't only herself in jeopardy. 
If it became known that Wolf had brought an elite hacker into an event filled with foreign dignitaries, it wouldn't go well for him either. She should have told him the whole truth when she had the chance, or at least stayed away from the party. What are you going to do? For now, keep an eye on you. Nikita's blue eyes ran up and down her body. You're even more beautiful than five years ago. Come back to me. I can keep you safe. Like you did before. Thanks. But I'll take my chances on my own. He tucked a strand of her hair behind her ear, and her hand automatically checked he hadn't lifted the sapphire earrings Wolf had asked her to wear. You've done well for yourself. Everything I'm wearing I bought with money I earned, not stole. Even these gems? Nikita went to touch her again, but she blocked his hand with her arm. This jewelry is a part of Wolf's entry to the competition, and will be returned to him after tonight. I gave you a ring once. And I gave it right back, when I discovered it was a tool to control me. He raised her hand in his, and kissed the finger bearing a sapphire and diamond ring. Who controls you now, Pantera? No one controls me. I'm with Wolf, because I want to be. He treats me well. He's a lucky man. Yes, I am. Wolf's deep voice was edged with anger. She removed her hand from Nikita and shifted to Wolf's side. If you'll excuse us, Nikita, we have a party to attend. Without waiting for his response, she returned to the display room with Wolf. He steered her over to a quiet corner, away from the jewels which people were still fawning over. Mostly his designs, she noticed. She couldn't ruin this for him, after all the effort he'd put in. What was that about? Wolf whispered into her ear, disguising the question in a loving embrace. Just someone I used to know. Surprised to see me here. Was it a surprise? Yes, and not a pleasant one. Wolf glanced over his shoulder, and his eyes narrowed, tension hardening his muscles. Is that your ex-boyfriend? The one who wanted to pimp you out? Her heart beat so hard she was surprised the jewelry at her breast didn't vibrate. It doesn't matter. He's history. I'm here with you. What was it he called you? Pantera. What does that mean? She glanced around. Had anyone heard him say that name? She should have listened to her instincts and stayed away from this party. Now her past was colliding with her present, about to obliterate her future. It's just a nickname, Panther. It means nothing. Please don't use it. It reminds me of him. His gaze swept the room once more before returning to her face. Do you want to leave? From the corner of her eyes, she saw Nikita return. He moved to the far wall, and she could feel his gaze on her more often than not. He wasn't convinced she'd gone straight. But if she left now, he'd be sure to follow, and she couldn't risk another run-in with him that someone might overhear. No, I won't let him intimidate me. I'm with the greatest jewelry designer the world has seen in centuries. I'm not going to hide. She grabbed a glass of champagne off a tray and set about charming anyone who came near. Within half an hour, she and Wolf were surrounded, and Nikita was nowhere in sight. But her nerves were stretched to the limit, and when someone dropped a glass on the wooden floor, she jumped. The call to dinner came as a welcome relief. At least she could sit, and no one would notice her knees knocking together. As Wolf helped push in her chair, he leaned down. Your ex-boyfriend hasn't taken his eyes off you all evening. Is this something I should know? She swallowed. No. He didn't look convinced. The server placed the first course before her, but her appetite was gone. She wanted to look around to see if Nikita still had her under surveillance, but didn't want him to think she was anxious. Did she even need to worry? Could he turn her in without implicating himself? All she was guilty of at the moment was entering the country under a false identity, and it would be his word against Wolf's. Would anyone really believe Nikita? But every fake identity had its weakness, and she wasn't ready to test hers to the scrutiny of a zealous government official. She pushed the salad around her plate, pretending to eat. 
The couple to her right were Russian, but didn't speak much English, and she didn't dare speak Russian with them. To Wolf's left were two men from France. Wolf was conversing with them in French, not one of her better languages. The couple at the opposite side of the table were German, but spoke excellent English. After discussing the competition and whether or not people had been to Moscow before, conversation waned. Wolf had a fake smile on his face, but she was probably the only one who noticed. Like she noticed his hand fisted under the table between courses, and the fact that for the first time since they became lovers, he made no attempt to touch her, even casually. When her napkin slipped off her lap, she had to retrieve it herself. He must have realized the precarious position she'd put him in. Toward the end of dinner, the speeches began, and several times Kat had to clutch the seat of the chair to keep from running away. She stretched to try and get some blood flow into her leg, and noticed Nikita staring at her. Another man came up to him and spoke in his ear. Her ex-boyfriend's smile got larger, but he never took his eyes from her. His interest in her was becoming too obvious. She had to get away before the inevitable fallout claimed Wolf. Remy. She deliberately used the name she called him during their intimate moments, hoping to remind him of their connection. I'm going to the ladies' room. Do you want me to come back or wait for you in our suite? She held her breath, waiting for his answer. I'll see you upstairs. His eyes were the cold gray of the Neva River, before it iced up in winter. Time to rebuild the firewall around her heart. Chapter 13 Wolf yanked off his tie the second the lift door shut. He closed his eyes and leaned his head back against the wall. His evening of triumph had turned into a waking nightmare. He'd asked and discovered that Kat's ex-boyfriend was actually the hotel's head of security. If he were really a criminal gang leader, would he be in charge of securing a hotel full of foreign dignitaries? Had anything Kat told him been the truth? Or was his paranoia acting up again? But worse than the circle of questions twisting his gut in knots was the constant replay of the scene he'd interrupted on the balcony of his woman with her hand on another man's chest while the bastard caressed her cheek. Now he didn't know what to believe. Could he still trust Cat? It wasn't his computer systems at risk, it was his heart. Because as casual as he'd meant to keep their relationship, it had gone way beyond that. The lift doors opened and he trudged his way to their suite. Would Kat even be there? Or had she packed up and left already? He shoved his hand in his pocket and ran his fingers over the hard, bicolored sapphire and matching earring set. Kat had slipped them off before leaving the dinner table. Was it her way of saying goodbye? He pushed the key card into the slot and braced himself for an empty room. Instead, Kat perched on the sofa, wearing a blue silk robe over her navy corset. But the seductive smile she normally greeted him with was replaced by cool detachment. She'd retreated into herself again, a defensive mode he recognized. "'Are you still feeling poorly?' he asked aloud, in case their room really was bugged. He'd explained her early departure by saying that she'd had lunch from a food cart in Gorky Park, and it hadn't agreed with her. "'A bit better.' I'm sorry I missed the dancing, though. Maybe we can have a private party now? He nodded, and she pressed play on a small stereo. Elvis Presley began to sing Can't Help Falling in Love. Had she chosen that song on purpose? She wrapped her arms around his waist and tucked her head under his chin, but her body was stiff and her movements stilted. Still, she felt so damn good. He'd forgive her almost anything to keep her there. They've been through our room while we were downstairs, she whispered as they swayed together. There wasn't much space for dancing, but as he didn't figure that was the point of the exercise, it didn't really matter. How do you know? He glanced over her shoulder and spun her around so he could see more of the suite. Nothing seemed out of place. Some of my things were moved. What do you think they were looking for? Probably some proof I'm not Cat Smith. 
Her breasts rubbed against his chest, and he forced his desire to the back burner. Did you know your ex-boyfriend is now head of security? That's what he told me. You said he was a criminal. He was when I knew him. So what did he want to talk to you about? Getting back together with him. His heart lurched, and he raised her face so he could see into her eyes. And? Not in this lifetime. I know what a real man is like now, thanks to you. No way will I go back to an imitation. Her eyes glowed with the same warmth he'd seen at her sister's cottage. As if a taut line snapped, she relaxed against him, her body molding itself to his. He pulled her closer and traced the line of her ear with his tongue. God, this woman intoxicated him. He knows your real name. Will it be a problem? Bloody hell. Now Elvis was singing Love Me Tender. It was killing him. Why couldn't they listen to Justin bringing Sexy back? I don't think so, but I'd like to leave right after your meeting with the Crown Prince tomorrow. A tremor passed through her body, and he tightened his arms around her. His heart told him to trust. His instinct said there was more to this story. But one thing he'd learned about Cat, when cornered, she put up walls until she all but disappeared. He shut off the stereo before Elvis could bring any more emotion to the scene. Tomorrow, all his dreams could come true. Or he could be left with nothing. His alarm woke him at seven. Cat rolled over and put the pillow over her head. He couldn't blame her. He'd kept her up until four. It was as though his body sensed the end of their affair and couldn't get enough of her. Even their lovemaking had been tinged with desperation, their bodies attempting to communicate what their mouths refused to say. He dragged himself to the shower and prayed the carafe of coffee he'd ordered would be strong enough to make him look alert and eager at his meeting with the crown prince in an hour. A notorious early riser, the prince was meeting with each of the designers to advise them of his decision. Wolf was the last scheduled at 8 a.m. About to leave, he gave one last glance at the bed to find Cat sitting up, pushing her hair out of her face, the sheet fallen to her waist. You off to see his highness? she asked. Yeah. He forced his eyes to stay above her neck. He couldn't be late. You're going to get the commission. Your designs were the best. She swung her legs over the side of the bed, then padded toward him. Thanks for the vote of confidence, but a lot more goes into this than just designs. There's also a personal relationship to consider. The prince doesn't work with people he doesn't like. She straightened his tie, then stood on tiptoe to kiss his lips lightly. Then you've definitely got this. You're adorable. That made him laugh. Feeling more light-hearted than when he got up, he tucked a strand of her hair behind her ear, letting his fingers linger on her jaw. I'll be back soon, but if Nikita comes near you, call me immediately. He took several deep breaths as the lift descended to the penthouse. The culmination of all his dreams lay beyond that door. Or were they back in the suite from which he'd come? He tried to picture the prince's collection of jewels, but all he saw were Cat's eyes lit with passion. His knock was answered immediately by the prince's right-hand man. Wolf was shown into a small sitting room. He froze when he saw Cat's old boyfriend sat on the sofa. We weren't properly introduced last night, the man said, standing. He was as tall as Wolf, with the build of someone who used their fists often. A gold rope chain dangled from his wrist when he held out his hand to Wolf. I am Nikita Ivanovich. Head of security for the hotel. And an acquaintance of Cat Smith. Reluctantly, Wolf shook the other man's hand. There was no need to introduce himself. Nikita obviously knew who he was. Yes, Cat Smith. She is an interesting woman, is she not? Fascinating. May I ask what you're doing here, Mr. Ivanovich? I had some information to pass to His Royal Highness. About Cat. Nikita's shrug somehow seemed to convey menace 
rather than nonchalance. You seem to be unaware that your girlfriend is the head of a criminal organization here in Russia. Ice invaded Wolf's veins, and the coffee he drunk threatened to resurface. She said the same about you. Nikita laughed, a harsh, unamused sound. Come, Mr. Wolf. Can you see the woman you call Kat Smith taking orders from anyone? She has a brilliant mind and is a pathological liar. You are not the first man she's conned, and you won't be the last. I don't believe you. Then you are a fool. What do you think she was doing yesterday while you were in meetings and having drinks with Russian government ministers? She was checking on her associates, making arrangements to continue her operations here while she lived safely in America. Did she not get into the country by pretending to be your girlfriend? I bet you haven't even known her a month. That's the way she works. Seduces men and gets them to do what she wants. Cat had been an hour late to the reception, and then she kept him so distracted he'd forgotten to ask why. Where is your proof? If what you say is true, why are the police not arresting her? Maybe they were. Maybe they were in his suite right this second, slapping handcuffs on her. He swallowed down the bile that rose in his throat and resisted the urge to run from the room to make sure Cat was safe. My job is to protect the hotel and its guests. As long as Miss Smith behaves herself here, I have no interest in what she does elsewhere. Nikita went to exit the room, but Wolf moved to block his path. Touch Cat or cause her any trouble and I'll destroy you, he said from between clenched teeth. A smug smile crossed the other man's face, and it took every ounce of self-control for Wolf not to wipe it off with his fist. Nikita's smile grew. I hope the rest of your stay in Russia is uneventful. Was that a threat? Or a warning? The security man stepped around Wolf and left the room, after making sure he was gone, Wolf turned to find the prince watching from the doorway. Remington Wolf, Prince Ajmani said. I trust you had a good night. Wolf forced his mind from Nikita's allegations against Kat to the matter at hand. Yes, your highness, very good. Come, we have much to discuss. The prince waved him into a second sitting room. If he were going to say, thanks, but I've awarded the commission to someone else, there wouldn't be much to discuss. Wolf faked a smile. He couldn't screw this up now. By the time one of the prince's attendants had poured them both a coffee and placed a glass of water a discreet distance from the prince's elbow, Wolf was ready to jump out of his skin. Your jewelry designs are exciting. They were admired by everyone with whom I spoke. Thank you. It was a great honor to be chosen to compete. Get on with it. I wish to award the commission to you. However, I understand we have a problem. A problem? He'd met all the criteria, used replica stones, provided criminal record checks on everyone who would be working on the gemstones, as well as financial data showing his company was in good standing. What exactly is your relationship with Miss Cat Smith? The blood drained from the upper half of Wolf's body. But he kept the polite smile on his face. He should have flattened Nikita when he had the chance. We are. What the hell were they? Lovers was the best description, but it seemed somehow lacking. Boyfriend and girlfriend sounded too juvenile. Soulmates, too deep. We are colleagues, working on a project together. The prince raised an eyebrow and waited, and enjoying an intimate relationship while our paths cross. Wolf finished. So you are not in love with this woman? He tried to deny it, but the word wouldn't form. Instead, he saw Cat as he left her, warm and soft from sleep, faith and love in her eyes. She made each day special, made coming home exciting, 
filled him with joy and peace and hope. God, she made him want to be a better man so he could see the pride reflected in her eyes. Still, in the back of his mind, Nikita's allegations niggled. Kat wasn't the type of woman to take orders meekly, but she'd also rejected her former boyfriend twice. He was clearly out for revenge. It's complicated, your highness. We met a couple weeks ago. Good thing this interview didn't include a polygraph. The only thing complicated was his refusal to admit he loved her. If the relationship is not established, then my condition on awarding you the contract will not be an issue. Wolf took a sip of his coffee, hoping the hot liquid would melt the iceberg currently crushing his chest. What is your condition? That you end your relationship with Miss Smith if you are to work with my gemstones. Royal protocol stated that he not stand until the prince did, or Wolf was invited to leave. Protocol be damned. He jumped to his feet, unable to sit any longer. You want a great designer to show your jewels to their best advantage? That's me. Last night proved it. Who I spend my personal time with has no bearing on my work. If anything, Miss Smith has inspired me to be even better. If it's security you're worried about, I can promise you that no unauthorized persons will come near your stones. They will be kept in a secure location within my offices. I have decided that I do not wish my property to leave the emirate. The chosen designer will complete the pieces at my home. I cannot knowingly allow a criminal in my country, much less my place of residence. That hadn't been part of the deal. But even if he could rearrange his life to work out of the UAE for several weeks, he still didn't see what this had to do with his relationship with Kat. With respect, Your Highness, Miss Smith has never been convicted of any criminal activity. She has not even been charged. I understand allegations have been made against her by Nikita Ivanovich. I believe his testimony to be tainted by her refusal of his advances. If you insist, she would not come to the UAE. But I will not terminate my association with her on the basis of a few weeks' work. Then that is where we differ in opinion. I believe a man who consorts with criminals is not to be trusted, and I will not work with a man I cannot trust. Furthermore, although the initial commission is to set the stones you were shown, as well as the ones I held in reserve, there is much more work at stake. My brothers and cousins also have gem collections that require the skills of a talented jeweler. We thought that if the same skilled artisan was to work with all our stones, it would provide harmony for the entire royal collection, and lessen the competition among our wives. In addition to the jewels which will be put on display, we also want a collection of items for the royal family to wear on special occasions. I have already purchased several large stones for this purpose. Wolf sank back into his chair. Not one but seven commissions. Not dozens, but hundreds of stones. Not six weeks of work, but months, if not years. His position as world-famous jewelry designer guaranteed, his name forever remembered. All he had to do was give up a woman he'd met less than two weeks ago. All he had to do was cut out his heart. Cat typed furiously on her keyboard, trying to keep one step ahead of the hackers, blocking their moves and closing firewalls as she went, taking servers offline before they could be infected, installing a patch, then reinitializing them before the client even knew there was a problem. It was the type of work that thrilled her the most, anticipating a hacker's next move, attempting to get there first. It was rare to walk in on a hack in progress, but Liam had alerted her to the breach moments after Wolf had left for his meeting with the prince. Bam! Gotcha! She shouted, pointing her fingers in the shape of a gun at her computer screen. The hackers had retreated, without the client's financial information. She sent a record of what she'd done and how they'd gotten in to Liam for the rest of his team to mop up and inform the client. At least the job had taken her mind off Wolf and his meeting. Are you playing a game? Wolf asked. Her smile of welcome wasn't returned, and a cold chill swept up her spine. She tried to read his body language. He lounged against the doorway to the bedroom, but made no move to enter. 
not even when she let her robe slip off her shoulder to show she was still naked. Something like that. How'd it go with the prince? He's offered me the commission, plus several others. She'd seen him more excited over a plate of prawns. This was everything he'd dreamed of, wasn't it? You don't look happy. It comes with conditions I was unaware of. I'll have to give it some consideration. What kind of conditions? She shut her laptop down and placed it on the bedside table. Relocation to the UAE for a year or so, and some other stuff. She searched his face. He was holding something back. Does that other stuff involve me? In a way. I don't want to talk about it until I've given it more thought. I expected you to be dressed and packed by the time I got back. How soon will you be ready to leave? Half an hour or so? Good. I'll call the pilot and tell him to prep the plane. Before she could say anything, he had a phone at his ear, his back turned to her. She stared at him a moment more, not sure what to do. Had Nikita gotten to him? Told him a pack of lies? She trudged off to the shower, part of her hoping, expecting him to join her. He didn't. The three-and-a-half-hour flight back to London was going to be a bitch. She dressed much more conservatively than when they arrived. Black pants, white button-down top, and ankle boots. She threw the last few things in her bag, grabbed her laptop, and was ready in the stated half-hour. When she walked back into the sitting-room, Wolf stared out the window. A boatload of tourists cruised the Moskva River, snapping photos of the impressive buildings that lined its banks. Moscow had once been home to her. The streets and alleys, the metro and trams were all familiar. She had favorite restaurants and parks, but none of it compared to being held in Wolf's arms. Now it seemed she was to be exiled from there as well. I'm ready, she said softly. Her hand hovered in the air for a second, about to touch his back, but she dropped it instead. He turned, his gaze lingering on her face. His eyes were already saying, Goodbye. Chapter 14 We're clear of Russian airspace now, sir. The pilot's voice in the speaker system pulled Kat's attention from the window. On the way out of the Moscow hotel, she'd seen Nikita skulking in a corner. Her first instinct was to stride over to him and knee him in the nuts. He was behind Wolf's sudden shift in demeanor. She knew it with the surety of Putin winning the next election. But she'd held back, because just then the Crown Prince's chief advisor sauntered through the hotel lobby. She couldn't make things worse for Wolf. Miraculously, she again hadn't been pulled aside for an additional security check traveling with Wolf. Maybe she could hire him as a traveling companion for future flights. Kind of like people who will ride in your vehicle so you can take the carpool lane on the highway. Wolf leaned over and shut her laptop, his mouth a tight line, his eyes icy. I got you in and out of the country. Now I want answers. Interrogation without waffles this time. Well, she was ready for it. She crossed her arms over her chest. What kind of answers? What exactly was the nature of your professional relationship with Nikita Ivanovich? Her heart stalled, then followed her stomach to the floor. What lies has he told you? I'm asking the questions. She hauled in a deep breath, past the pain in her chest. Nikita headed up an operation to steal personal information from wealthy individuals, mostly foreign men, but some high-up Russian government ministers. Members of our group would attend parties, much like the one we were at last night, disguised as either waitstaff or easily available women. They'd lift the phones or other electronic devices off the targets and pass them to me. I'd access any valuable data, copy it, and then they'd return the equipment. If possible, the women would get into the men's hotel rooms after the mark had gone to sleep. They'd get the laptops. Pantera was my hacker name. I'm not proud of what I did, but it was my only means of survival. And you were never caught? No. We had a close call once when the guy woke up and discovered his computer missing. That's when Nikita suggested that I sleep with the men and steal the information, saying it would be quicker. Wolf took a long drink of his water. Was he disgusted by her story? 
Nikita said you were the head of the gang, and that you're still active in criminal activities. You believed him? A searing pain went straight through her heart. He scrubbed both hands over his face. You've lied to me from the moment I met you. I withheld information. It's not the same. You get on your computer and I have no idea what you're doing. And you were an hour late to the reception last night with no excuse. I was late because I wanted a better dress to show off your jewels. The real issue here is that you still don't trust me, even after all we've shared. I've been betrayed before. Hell, someone is sabotaging my company as we speak. And I'm trying to help with that. I'm on your side. If you'd have come clean and told me everything, I wouldn't have been blindsided going into the most important meeting of my life. And there it was. Her past impacting his ambition. The real reason he was upset. Not because of anything she'd done or how it altered their relationship, but how it affected his future, his need to be the greatest. She crossed her arms over her chest. You're scared to admit that you feel something for me, and it's screwing with your ambition. This is about the truth, who you really are. She'd given him an opening to admit he felt something, and he hadn't taken it. Her years of experience holding in her pain came in handy now. She could pretend to be as cold and unfeeling as he was. Tell me, Mr. Wolf, why would I spill my heart and soul to you when all I am is a delightful interlude? I've survived by reinventing myself and staying hidden in the shadows. I'm not about to tell every guy I sleep with my deep, dark secrets. A flicker of pain showed in his eyes. He cleared his throat before he replied. We had more than that. No, we didn't. Because if we did, you would have believed in me, and not some bastard you only met for a couple of minutes. Katya. Katya stayed in Russia, with people who love her. I'm back to being Cat Smith. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have work to do. She opened her laptop and stared at a blank screen, willing herself not to cry for the remainder of this seemingly endless flight. Wolf stole a glance at Cat. She pretended to work, but her hands hadn't once touched the keyboard in twenty minutes. Instead, she stared at her computer screen, her eyes glassy, unseeing. He knew the look. Hell, he'd perfected it. The cat needed to wall him off stung, but what choice did she have? She'd been a pawn all her life. First to her mother's ruthless ambition for a star, then her ex-boyfriend's machinations. And now Wolf had treated her as nothing more than a passing fancy. A pleasant way to spend time while he accomplished his true goal. World jewelry domination. It was ridiculous, even to his own mind. Cat deserved to be treated like a queen, the most powerful piece on the chessboard. For the first time in his life, he had no idea what to do. Beg Cat to forgive him and give their relationship another chance? Or bow to the prince's demands, say goodbye to Cat and fulfill his life's desires? Except at the word desire, his gaze automatically swung back to the woman who sat opposite him. It was a hellish flight when the turbulence was inside him and not buffeting the plane. When they eventually landed, Margaret Mary had a car waiting, and within minutes they were on their way to the shard. Tonight he'd open himself up to Cat, tell her about the condition to him taking up the royal commission, and see what she said, see if there was any hope for them. Before he could ask her to dinner, her phone began to buzz insistently. She glanced at the screen. You won't believe this, but someone's accessed one of your data servers. How soon can we be at your office? His pulse quickened. Ten minutes. Uh, can you stall them? I can try. It's difficult without a hardline connection. I don't want to use cellular service, as it's not secure. Hold on a sec. She pressed a few keys on her phone. I instructed the server to run a backup. That should slow things down. They won't be able to confirm any new code is installed until that's done. Wolf's hands fisted on the seat beside her. Tension pulsed out of his pores with each beat of his heart. Do you know who it is? He asked through clenched teeth. No. I can't access the video feed from here. We'll find out soon enough. He nodded. 
the car had barely come to a complete stop before he flung open the door and exited. But rather than rush into the building, he held out his hand to assist her. He wouldn't forget her, ignore her as his parents had him. With just her laptop and phone, she followed him into the building. In the lift on the way to his floor, he asked, What department? Human Resources. Margaret Mary sends me the list of who's away each day, so I flag their terminals for activity. The HR director called in sick this morning, but someone is using her computer with her password. Right. Do you want to call the police? I'll wait to see who it is before I get the cops involved. His hands flexed at his sides. A good punch-up would do wonders for the anger, anguish, and anxiety that surged through his veins. He pulled out his security card and went straight to the HR department. The door to the director's office was closed, and Wolf put his finger to his lips when the other two women in the room looked about to ask if they could help. With a nod at Cat, Wolf flung open the door. Harry sat behind the desk, drumming his fingers on the blotter. His face drained of all color when he saw them standing there. What the hell? Harry! Wolf's shocked voice reverberated throughout the room. I... I, I noticed something strange was going on, so I came to investigate, Harry said. But a piece of paper with detailed instructions on how to enter the system and bypass security, plus an incriminating thumb drive on top, sealed his fate. I'll take that, Kat said, picking up the flash drive. She motioned for Harry to stand, and then sat and started typing. Her gaze intent on the screen, she bit her bottom lip. We're good here she said, eventually raising her eyes from the monitor. Cat pointed at the open door. The two staff members didn't even pretend to be working. Maybe we should move this discussion someplace where we can't be overheard? Wolf's gaze reluctantly left Cat and returned to Harry, who cowered in the corner. Betrayal welled up inside Wolf until bitterness thickened his tongue, choking him. Is this how Cat had felt when he'd assumed the worst of her? His heart ripped open, flooding his chest with pain. Only by concentrating on the pinched face of his former friend did he stop himself from falling to his knees and begging Cat's forgiveness. I can explain, Harry began. My office, Wolf said. He took Harry's elbow and dragged him from the HR department and then down the corridor. Margaret Mary stood as they neared. No, not him, she said, her eyes wide, her mouth open a hint of anger in the set of her lips. Want me to call the police? Rage returned. It wasn't only Wolf who had been deceived. I need to hear what he has to say before I call the authorities. Margaret Mary, you will act as witness and make a recording of this meeting. His voice was tinged with cold fury, his grip on Harry's arm strong enough to make the other man wince. Do you want me to wait here? Cat asked. She leaned on Margaret Mary's desk appearing to be completely indifferent to the turmoil swirling through him. He searched her eyes, but she'd screened off her emotions too well for him to be able to read them. Did she even care any more? She'd done her job. Would she leave before he had time to talk to her? Come in. You deserve to listen as well. What has your girlfriend got to do with this? Harry said. Cat is a cybersecurity expert who has been tracking your every move. Wolf replied. What? Harry's gaze ran up and down Cat's body as though he were being pranked. Huh! Wolf fisted his hands, ready to punch Harry's lights out if he looked at Cat a second longer. Yep, me. She set her laptop on Wolf's desk and sat on his chair. Harry sank onto the couch, and Margaret Mary perched on the visitor's seat, her phone in record mode. Wolf paced in front of the door. Why, Harry! The anger that had overwhelmed him at seeing Harry hacking his systems fizzled, replaced by a yawning chasm, lined with shattered illusions ready to rip him to shreds should he fall further. Cat inserted the thumb drive into her laptop and scanned the information on her screen. Harry's pathetic voice pulled Wolf's attention away from his girlfriend, a former girlfriend. I had several financial reversals, so I borrowed some money from the firm. I was going to pay it back, but then it was taking longer than I expected, and you were talking about an audit. 
So I disrupted the accounting systems, hoping to divert your attention so you didn't discover the money was missing until I had time to get the funds together. Wolf shook his head. All this for money? Why didn't you ask me for a loan? Because you're so high and mighty in your ivory tower. You never make a mistake. Wolf's gaze shot briefly to Cat, trying to convey to her how sorry he was for not believing in her earlier. She glanced up briefly, and her eyes clouded before she returned her attention to her screen. You know that's not true. For God's sake. I hired you to help me because you had the business degree and I didn't. Yes, but then you got your MBA and began to question my decisions. You were going to fire me eventually, and I wanted a nest egg for when that happened. You would never sell me shares or make me a partner. I had to have something. If you'd have married my sister, then we would have been family, and none of this would have happened. Jennifer, there was never anything between us. We only went out once. And the whole time she'd come on to him like a desperate woman, stroking his thigh, leaning over so she could see down her top. Once was all they took, or didn't you know? You're the father of her son. Cat's fingers stilled, and her gaze met Wolf's. Was she holding her breath, waiting for his response? Did she still feel something for him? He hurried to reassure her, not Harry. I never had sex with your sister. That's not what she said. I'm not lying. I'll take a paternity test if you want, but whoever your nephew's father is, it's not me. Harry crumbled into the sofa, his chin meeting his chest. How much did you take, Harry? A million. I've paid back a quarter, but it'll take a little more time to get the rest. Wolf turned to Margaret Mary. You got all that? Yes. Type it up. Except the last bit about Jennifer claiming I'm a son's father. Harry, you're going to sign at the bottom, verifying it's a true statement. Margaret Mary hurried from the room. Wolf tried to analyze his options, but all he could see was the pain in Cat's eyes, as he'd accused her of being the leader of her gang and still a criminal. Harry ran a shaking hand through his hair. So, what happens now? I haven't decided. If I call the police, this will go public and damage my company's reputation. But I'm sure you realize I can't have you work for me. I'll never be able to trust you again. I swear, Wolf, I thought you were Ned's father. So it's okay to steal from pseudo-family. That's not what I meant. A blaze of anger cauterized his sympathy. No, what you meant was that you were going to try and blackmail me if I found out about the embezzlement before you could pay it back. Harry hung his head. All your systems are clear, Wolf, and I know who wrote the code. Cat's soft voice drew his eyes back to her. I did, Harry said. He leaped to his feet and made an attempt to take the thumb drive, but Wolf grabbed his arm and flung him back on the sofa. Stay away from Cat. Harry ran a shaking hand through his hair. I wrote it. I did some classes. Who are you going to believe, Wolf? Me? or the woman who's been leading you around by your cock for the past week. Wolf took a step toward Harry. God, he wanted so badly to beat the crap out of his former friend for insulting Cat and what they'd shared. I hired Cat to do a job. Find the saboteur. She's done that. Why would she lie? Besides, I trust her implicitly. His gaze shot to her, but she continued to stare at her laptop. He turned back to his former friend. You, on the other hand, have just admitted to stealing one million pounds of my money and then infecting my computer systems to hide your tracks. Who wrote the code? Harry. He slumped back onto the sofa. My nephew. But he's got issues. He can't go to jail. He'd never survive. Whatever you do, Wolf, don't have him arrested. Wolf glanced at Cat, and she nodded. I'll let Cat and her team deal with him. Harry turned pleading eyes on her, but made no move to get near her again. What are you going to do? Keep an eye on him. For now. Cat's features showed only professional detachment. I'm done, Wolf. 
I've locked Harry out of all your systems and deleted his security card. I'll wait for you in your apartment. Yeah. He couldn't look at her as she left his office or he'd never be able to let her go. Now that she'd done the job he'd hired her for, she'd leave. Unless he gave up all his hopes and dreams and asked her to stay. Wolf scrubbed his hands over his face. Security had just escorted Harry out of the building after he'd signed the confession. Whether it would hold up in court at the moment, Wolf didn't care. He never wanted to see his former COO's face again. It wasn't even the money that bothered him. It was the abject betrayal. Sooner or later, everyone stabbed you in the back. His office door opened again, and he looked up. His microsecond silent prayer that it was Cat wearing one of her super sexy dresses went unanswered. Margaret Mary stood at the door, holding a bottle of whiskey and two glasses. He glanced at his watch as she set the drinks on his desk. It was almost six o'clock. That had to be wrong. By his reckoning, it was nearer midnight. Then again, he'd never had a day of such highs and lows before. Margaret Mary poured a generous amount of Jameson in a glass and pushed it toward him before helping herself to an equal measure. Two new beginnings, she said. That's an optimistic toast. What's done is done. Now we start again. What are you going to do about the prince's condition to awarding you the commission? He'd spoken to Margaret Mary on the phone while Cat showered. Keeping his focus on work was the only thing that had stopped him from taking Cat in his arms and sinking into her glorious heat. If he did that, he'd never be able to let her go. I don't know. This is the opportunity of the century. How can I throw that away on a woman I've only known two weeks? Well, have you thought the cat may be the love of your life? How can you let her go for a job that will take you six months? Maybe she'll wait. As he said it, he knew it was wrong. Excuse me, darling, do you mind taking second place to my career for a while? Even he knew that wasn't a question any wise man would ask, especially of a woman who'd been treated as second best all her life. Margaret Mary snorted. Unlikely. What about Harry? He can wait. And the COO position? If you're going to be in Dubai most of the time, we need someone to run the place. Want me to contact the headhunters in the morning? I was thinking you could take the job. I mean, if I'm going to be away, you'll be bored with nothing to do. Margaret Mary put her glass down on the desk. Don't you be messing with me, Wolf. I'm serious. You know this business as well as I do. You practically run the place now. Talk to your husband and let me know by the end of the week. So you've decided to take the Royal Commission? If she was no longer his assistant, he'd probably better get used to that look of you're an eejit from her. Had he decided... It had been his dream for so long it seemed impossible not to take it. Even if I don't, I'll still need someone to look after things while I travel. Are you talk to Rory. Now, there's an amazing woman waiting for you upstairs. I lock up here. He slung back the last of his whiskey and headed up to his apartment. As the numbers increased on the floor number display, his heart rate quickened. He'd been such a fool, believing for even a minute the lies Nikita had told. Yes, Cat had the brilliant mind to lead a team of thieves, but she had a heart of pure gold, as evidenced by her care of Valentina and her search for her sister, even at the risk of her own freedom. Her past was just that. Past. The woman she'd become was loyal, trustworthy, and true, and everything he could ever want or need. The warmth in his chest he'd felt every day for the past week returned as he put his key in the lock. Except when he opened the door, there was no music playing or cat singing badly, no steaks grilling or exotic spices filling the air. It was silent, cold, empty. Their suitcases sat by the door where the concierge must have left them. At least Katz was still there. She hadn't left. He found her in the sitting room, staring out the window as the first drops of rain hit the glass. She changed out of the trousers and shirt she'd worn on the plane and was back in a fitted business dress and heels. He could see her gloved hands at her waist as she hugged herself. She must have seen his reflection, because she turned before he got within five feet of her. The chill in her eyes sent a shiver down his spine. The warm, sensual woman he'd gotten to know was gone. Cut. It's me, or the Royal Commission. 
isn't it? Yes. Well, don't worry. I'll save you the trouble of asking me to leave. I'll double-check your systems from the States and send you my bill. She went to move past him, but he grabbed her arm. His chest burned so intensely he wouldn't be surprised to see scorch marks on his shirt any second. Is that all this was to you? A job. Her eyes narrowed slightly. Of course. I told you I was very good at what I do. But us. Just an unexpected perk. Like free coffee. She didn't bat an eyelash. It was more to me. The words were wrung from him. I'm sure once you get your hands on the prince's gemstones, you'll forget I exist. He had to make her stay. At least for a few more hours. He needed time to work her out of his system, or convince her to wait. There are no flights to the States at this hour. Actually, Liam is in Frankfurt. I'm taking a plane there, then hitching a ride back to California with him. I like this, traveling with billionaires. She pulled her arm free of his grasp and strode into the hallway. His heart pounded like it was going to burst. Cat, wait! She stilled for a moment, but didn't turn. What do you want, Wolf? Wolf. Not Remington, or even better, Remy. He'd secretly been thrilled that she'd called him by his given name, like it was her code way of saying she was interested in him, and not his life of wealth and privilege. He put all of his heart into the words. I believe you. Good to know. Do me one favor, okay? Anything. Pay my bill on time. The door clicked shut. Chapter 15 Discreet sprayers misted the air with water. It didn't help. Despite the palm trees and bubbling fountains and shaded terraces, it was still hotter in early October than any place on earth had a right to be. He was being quintessentially English, complaining about the weather, but it kept him from dwelling on the real cause of his discomfort. Six weeks. Without cat. The pain and longing hadn't lessened with time. It had only gotten more acute, terminal even. He'd been in Dubai for three days now, staying at the Prince's Royal Palace. A production room had been set up to Wolf's exacting standards, and the gemstones were beyond his wildest imaginings. The prince had only shown the competitors a fraction of his treasure. There was at least six solid months of work, with just these stones. Wolf had also met with the prince's brothers and two of his cousins, who claimed to have similar collections. The man who set these jewels would be remembered forever. It was everything he'd always dreamed of, and nothing of what he wanted. The black hole that now resided in his soul had sucked in his need to be famous. His mobile rang, pulling him from his dark thoughts. Have you called her yet? Margaret Mary's question had become her standard greeting. Every single bloody day. How could a man forget and move on when he was constantly being reminded of what he'd lost? No, not lost. Allowed to walk away. Because if he'd been brave enough and smart enough to tell Cat he loved her, he was certain she wouldn't have left. No. Age it. He couldn't even argue with her assessment. I preferred it when you were my assistant and showed me some respect. You deserved it then. Now you're just being a pig-headed fool. He bit back a sigh. He didn't need to sound pathetic as well and add more fuel to Margaret Mary's fire. Is there a reason, aside from disparaging me, for this call? Yes. The marketing shots are finally come to you for that advertising campaign you wanted with the women in the corsets. Shall I send them to you? No woman would ever compare to Cat in her lingerie wearing his jewels. I trust your taste. You approve them. His new chief operating officer's laugh hit a raw spot. He rubbed his sternum with the heel of his hand as if that could relieve the pain. Reminds you too much of her, doesn't it? He ignored that remark. Anything else? They discussed business for a few more minutes. Margaret Mary had done a brilliant job of covering most of Harry's duties, and Wolf had given more responsibility to a few of his other managers, so she didn't feel too overwhelmed. It was working. If only her constant reminders about Cat would stop. Call her, Margaret Mary said in farewell, then promptly hung up. 
He flung his phone onto the lounger and went back into his room. Dinner wasn't for a couple hours yet, an elaborate affair with eight courses and entertainment. He'd have to sit and smile and ignore the emptiness inside him no food or drink could fill. In the distance, he heard the crown prince's favorite wife giggle. He knew what came after that. For God's sake, couldn't the man move his amorous activities inside? It rubbed salt on the open wound of Wolf's heart. Work. He'd bury himself in his work and forget all about the gaping hole in his life. Until Margaret Mary's next call. He made his way down to the production room and opened the drawer with the rubies. But he couldn't work with those. They reminded him too much of Cat's made-up game of blind minor. The sapphires were also a no-go stone at the moment. He considered them her jewel. Diamonds? She'd worn his diamonds when they'd gone to meet her mother. A horrid woman who had put her own ambition before the needs of her family. Cat had only ever come in last in the one place she should have felt the most loved and secure. Had he done any different? Hadn't he put his career, his ambition, before her, too? He was no better than her mother. And what had his ambition been about? Proving himself the best at what? Putting rocks in metal. No matter how good he was or how famous he became, his parents were gone. They weren't going to remember to pick him up at school. He'd sold his chance at future happiness trying to fix a problem from his past. The real bicolor sapphire called to him, and he held it up. A myriad of colors refracted from the stone, luring him into a multi-hued world of light. A world of love. He'd thought hundreds of times of resetting it from the prototype he'd presented at the competition. Then Kat's comments about a man, holding his woman in a loving embrace while still allowing her to stand on her own, would fill his mind. And he'd put the stone down and move on to another piece. Only one woman should wear this jewel, his cat, his queen. Wolf locked up the gemstones and went in search of his royal highness. Cat snuggled baby Marco under her chin. Liam and his wife, Lorelai, had invited her up to their house in Russian River for the weekend, claiming Cat needed to get away from the city and relax. What she needed was to forget about Wolf and move on. But that wasn't going to happen any time this century. So a weekend away snuggling a baby was the next best thing. A long, long distant next best. Are you sure you're all right with him? Lorelai asked. We're fine, aren't we, sweetheart? She rubbed her cheek against Marco's downy soft hair and breathed in his baby powder scent. Did her new nephew smell the same? According to a very brief email she'd received on the highly encrypted message board she'd set up, Natalia had given birth to a healthy boy five days after Kat had left Russia. She called him Grigori, after their father. Hopefully he'd have a happier life than their dad. Would Kat ever see little Grigori? Get to cuddle him and spoil him, as only an auntie should. Without the security of traveling with Wolf, a return to Russia seemed impossible. Cat dropped a kiss on baby Marco's head. Cherish what you have. It was her new motto. Liam stepped out onto the terrace with four bottles of wine and a slew of glasses on a tray. Cat raised one eyebrow. That was a lot of wine for the two of them, as Lorelai wasn't drinking while nursing. The rest of the gang should be here any moment, Liam said. Awesome. Three more loving couples to show her exactly what she was missing. Liam's personal chef Jason and Mandy, his wife, were expecting their first child. Wolf's friend Simon and his wife Helen spent so much time apart with their careers that when they were together you couldn't get a piece of paper between them. Even Liam's best friend and cat's nemesis David had Alina and was sickeningly in love with the wife he'd met online. Alina also spoke Russian, but as Kat was desperate to maintain her American identity, she hadn't dared speak their shared native language with her. It would be nice if she could just be herself for a while, like she'd been with Wolf. She pulled in a deep breath. At least with the baby sleeping on her chest, it masked the heaviness she'd gotten used to since she'd walked out Wolf's door. All she'd wanted was for him to choose her. He hadn't. Her invoice had been paid, promptly, with a bonus and a note from Margaret Mary, the new chief operating officer, that it had been a pleasure to work with her. Pleasure. 
That, too, had taken on a new meaning with Wolf. Boje moi! It would be great if for ten minutes she could stop thinking about him. The sound of car doors being shut announced the arrival of the others. Soon the terrace was full of people, talking softly so as not to disturb the baby. It was an unusually warm day for late October, so they were making the most of the outside. The leaves on the grapevine surrounding Liam's house were vibrant shades of red and gold. In the morning, a low-lying mist had hung over the valley, making it appear magical. Would it conjure up wolf? Stop it, cat. I knew it could never last. Why do I let myself believe in the impossible? She rubbed the baby's back as he wiggled in his sleep. One of his tiny hands slipped inside her top and rested over her heart. Healing would come. It was just going to take time. Jason, the chef, produced a plate of tasty bites, and Liam poured the wine. Simon sat next to her. If he asked about her time in London, she'd have to leave. Liam and David had already tried and had to be satisfied with. It was fine. But as Simon was Wolf's friend, maybe he'd already been told the outcome of their not-so-fake relationship. Part of her wanted to ask if he'd heard from Wolf. How was he getting on in Dubai? Was it everything he'd dreamed of? But she wasn't yet at the point where she could feign indifference when his name was mentioned. Every couple of minutes, Simon checked his phone. Expecting a message? She asked him. I'm hoping to broker a deal this afternoon. I'm waiting for one of the parties to arrive to start negotiations. Simon replied. Odd, seeing it was a Saturday, but business never really stopped. She worked every weekend. Hell, she'd worked every single day in the eight weeks since she'd been back in the States, which was why Liam had insisted she join them this weekend. Kat sat back and let the buzz of happy people sharing their lives wash over her. She nuzzled the top of baby Marco's head, and Lorelai sent her an indulgent smile. Simon's phone buzzed, and he quickly snatched it up, nodding at Liam as he did so. Excuse me, Simon said before leaving the group. Liam stood as well. I need to check on something, too. I'll take Marco and put him in bed, Lorelai said. Kat wanted to protest, but couldn't deny a mother her own child. Lorelai, can I see what you've done to the nursery? Helen, Simon's wife, asked. Her hostess nodded. I'd better get a start on dinner, Jason said. I'll help you, Mandy added, joining her husband before he'd even gotten as far as the house. Alina, let's have a pre-dinner nap. David kissed the back of his wife's hand. They left. Before Kat could even move, she was the only one left on the terrace. The hairs on the back of her neck stood on end, and she glanced toward the house where everyone had disappeared. Wolf stood in the doorway. She blinked, expecting it was her tired brain playing tricks. Nope, he was still there. Her heart beat an unsteady rhythm. You really know how to clear a room, she said, standing. She plopped right back down. Her knees were too shaky to hold her. Oh, Jemoy, if this were her mind playing tricks on her, she'd scream. I wanted privacy. Wolf's deep voice, his sexy British accent, slid over her skin like a healing lotion, at once soothing and invigorating. He advanced on her. Not a word from him in eight weeks. And he thought he could just waltz back into her life? Well, two could play the indifference game. She took a long sip of her wine before asking, as casually as she could make her voice, How are things in Dubai? Well, I wouldn't know. I quit. He stopped a foot from her and sank to his knees. Her heart rate went into overdrive. A few more silver hairs salted his temples, and the lines around his eyes were more pronounced. How was it possible that he was even more gorgeous? She wanted to touch him so badly. She sat on her hands. Not until she knew for sure why he was here. No way could she be just another delightful interlude while he was in California on business. Why? Weren't the stones as impressive as you'd been led to believe? They were everything I dreamed about and more. So, they're just rocks. They can't begin to compare with you. He tucked a strand of her hair behind her ear, his fingertips lingering in the caress. She longed her rubber cheek against his hand. The lump in her throat made talking difficult. 
Had he given up his dream to be with her? I made the biggest mistake of my life when I let you walk out of my flat in London. I've come to ask for another chance. Her heart fluttered. A chance at what? The chance to prove to you that I'm the man who can make you happy. The chance to put you first in my life and never take you for granted. The chance to tell you every day how much I love you and need you. The chance to see you wear this. He pulled from his breast pocket the bicolor sapphire in the silver filigrees. She stared at the jewel as it caught the autumn light. It was even more amazing than she remembered. I thought you had to destroy the prototypes. This is the real stone. I convinced the prince to sell it, as I said no other woman would ever wear it as well as you. Pure love shone from Wolf's eyes, rivaling the sapphire for brilliance. And he agreed? She fingered the beautiful stone as he fastened the necklace around her throat. She should protest, but her brain was still trying to grasp the reality of him being here. He has five wives. I think he was trying to avoid a fight. She fondled the precious gem, and Wolf's fingers joined hers on the jewel. You know I don't like presents. If you don't take this necklace, Katya, then I'm going to put it in a vault, and its beauty will be lost to the world. There are no strings. If you can't accept my apology for not putting you first when I had the chance, if you won't let me love you, then I'll leave. But the gemstone is yours. A ray of happiness broke through the defenses she'd put around her heart. Her chest filled with joy, unlike anything she'd ever experienced. What if one of the filigrees breaks? It's quality workmanship, but if it breaks, I'll fix it. Well, maybe I should keep you around, just in case. His lips quirked up in a knowing smile and his gray eyes lit with desire. You want to keep me around to fix your necklace? She attempted a nonchalant shrug. Yes, and while you're on standby, you might as well do other things. His fingers slid into her hair, pulling her closer. What kind of other things? Kiss me. Hold me. Love me as long as we're together. He stopped his lips inches from hers and leaned back to search her eyes. What do you mean, as long as we're together? I want a permanent relationship with you. I'm not letting you go again. She closed her eyes on the pain of having what she desperately wanted offered to her, while not being able to take it. I can't promise you forever, Remy. If the Russians find out that Cat Smith is the hacker Pantera, I'll have to change identities again. I couldn't ask that of you. He kissed her before replying. Let me deal with that. If it came to it, I'd change my name. Give up everything to stay with you. I love you so much, Katya Smirnova. I was an empty wasteland without you. I refuse to live like that again. Her soul flooded with happiness. She'd do everything in her power to make sure it never happened. He'd already given up so much. I love you, Remington Steel Wolf. Are you sure you don't mind about not finishing the Royal Commission? I couldn't have done those stones justice without my muse. You inspire me. You nourish my creative soul and make my life meaningful. Well, when you put it that way... She leaned forward and pressed her lips to his. Her heart was too full, and her brain too muddled to think any longer in English. There were better ways to communicate than with words. By the time Wolf stopped kissing her, they had an audience. Simon raised his glass of wine and said, Yes, another successful merger negotiated. Damn, I'm good. Everyone laughed. Cat didn't care who took credit. She was just glad that, once again, she was in Wolf's loving embrace and could be her true self. Epilogue 
Cat sensed the excitement in Wolf as soon as he stepped through the door. He had the same look in his eyes as when he'd spotted her latest lingerie purchases. How could he know about her surprise? What's got you so amped up? she asked after he kissed her hello. I had a call this afternoon from Crown Prince Admani. Evidently, the chief designer of the house they got to replace me was caught trying to seduce one of the prince's wives. He's been deported. They've asked if I'll come back and finish the project. The flicker of fear didn't have a chance to grow. Wolf stared at her with the same love in his eyes as always. In fact, it had grown so quickly that he now badgered her daily to make their relationship permanent and marry him. If she weren't enjoying his persuasion so much, she'd have said yes weeks ago. And he knew it. What did you tell him? That we're a package team. There is no me without you. And I'd have to speak to you first to see if you were even willing to move to the UAE. He didn't object to a criminal and a person who consorts with criminals living in his country? Seems he's had a change of heart. First, Nikita has had a rather spectacular fall from grace, so the prince now considers his report about you as the ramblings of a rejected man. Second, the prince himself commented that you'd be a far better deterrent to keeping me away from his wives than fear of expulsion. I believe his exact words were, if you disrespect your woman, then you are not worthy of her. Did you have anything to do with Nikita's downfall? Wolf smiled. I didn't want him harassing you when we returned to visit Natalia and her family. I should also tell you about the very unfortunate death of a hacker known as Pantera. She died of a drug overdose recently. What? A woman about your age and description was recently found dead of an overdose. She can't be identified and a rumor is circulating that she was the notorious hacker. You're safe and I will keep you that way. Cat wrapped her arms around Wolf. She wanted to sing with the relief of having her past wiped clean. So, we're moving to Dubai. Only if that's what you want. All I want is to be with you. So if you're there, that's where I'll be too. He put his hand on her face and she rubbed her cheek against his palm. There is one small condition, however, that the prince insists on. Oh? And what's that? He picked up her left hand and kissed her bare ring finger. We have to be married. Really? She raised an eyebrow, but inside she was dancing. Really? Want me to get him on the phone so he can tell you himself? She laughed. You want Crown Prince Ajmani to propose to me on your behalf? Well, you don't seem to take me seriously when I ask. Maybe that's because you haven't been doing it right. How can I not be doing it right? I've gotten down on one knee, both knees. I've been dressed in a tux and holding a dozen roses. I've been naked. I've asked first thing in the morning and last thing at night. Hell, I even asked when I was buried so deep inside you, I didn't know where I ended and you began. What more do you want from me? I don't want anything from you. I just want all of you. Darling... You have all of me, always, forever. Then we have a deal. What? Wait here. She rushed into the bedroom, quickly changed, and then returned to the sitting room. While browsing online, she'd come across her dream wedding dress and lingerie. The gown was still to come, but the underclothes and veil had arrived this afternoon. Wolf turned around as he heard her return and nearly dropped his drink. If that's what you're going to wear on our special day, we're going to have the shortest ceremony and reception in the history of weddings. Don't be silly. I'm going to wear a dress as well, but I'm all for the simple ceremony, and we don't even need a reception. As neither of us have family, at least not one's able to come, we could just have a registry office wedding. He crossed over to her, his hand caressed her cheek before lifting her face up for his kiss. No way. We're going to do this right. When our children ask, we're going to bring out photos and bore them to tears with the details. We're going to have children? Her heart couldn't get any happier. When you're ready. In time. 
I want you all to myself for a while. He swung her into his arms and headed toward the bedroom. In the name of efficiency, though, we should keep practicing. I'm all for efficiency. The rest of what she was going to say was lost in his kiss. Playing with his equipment never got dull. I'm getting married to Remington Steele. Then he swept her into a vortex of pleasure so intense she couldn't remember her own name. Didn't matter. It was soon about to change again. This time, for good. This concludes Masquerading with the Billionaire by Alexia Adams, narrated by Lucy Rivers. Copyright 2017 by Alexia Adams. This unabridged audiobook is published by arrangement with Entangled Publishing, LLC, and was produced in the year 2022 by Tantor Media Incorporated, a division of recorded books which holds the copyright there too. Please visit Tantor.com for more information on our growing library of unabridged audiobooks. 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 Audiobooks.